The world's best high-performance sailors are competing at the 49er, 49er FX, and NACRA 17 World Championships here in Nova Scotia, Canada. 280 sailors are battling it out over six days to reach the 10-boat medal race final, where the top three will fill the podium. The men's 49er and women's 49er FX are two of the most athletically and aerobically challenging skiffs in the sailing world. And the NACRA 17, sailed with a mixed female and male team, is a high-performance catamaran capable of hydrofoiling at speeds over 55 kilometers per hour. The championship for these three Olympic classes is hosted by a group of super enthusiastic volunteers at Hubbard's Community Sailing Association in a beautiful seaside town of less than a thousand people. This is the most important regard of the season for these athletes as they work towards Olympic glory at the Paris 2024 Games less than two years from now. Keep watching and enjoy all the action from Nova Scotia, Canada. Day five of the World Championships, which means we've only got one day, that's tomorrow, when the medal races will take place and we'll see who will be the new world champions for 2022. Hi, my name's Andy Rice and with Chris Musler and with Lisa Ross, we are going to be bringing you today's action. Lisa, uh, we are getting further into autumn. It gets a little bit chillier every morning. What does that mean for the weather? Uh, well, I, I think we're going to see a little bit of Groundhog Day as we did yesterday. Um, you can see from behind me there's a little bit of cloud cover, and uh, but it's it's generally a clear skies, and the forecast looks like we're going to have another sea breeze. Um, we'll probably see in that you know kind of eight to ten range, filling into up to 14. Um, we, we're not going to see the big pumping bay days that we have earlier in the season, um, but it'll be a nice nice sailing. You know, it's going to be a speed game today um, with little shifts. That's uh, that's my prediction. And uh, but we may have to wait for it a little bit again, just like we did yesterday. Right. So if it's going to be another stable sea breeze kind of day uh, in the 49er FX, Chris, that means um, it's probably going to be quite good news for the two leaders who are really stretching away from the rest of the pack. They've almost got that 20 point gap that means that when you go into a medal race, you've already got a medal to secure. Yeah, absolutely. And what we talked about today is, you know, if if you don't give yourself a lot of room today going into tomorrow, you only have one race to make it up to get into the medal race. But I, I think, you know, that what we've seen here is, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, I just want to shout out to the Brazilians right now. Over the last couple events, I mean, in 12th place, uh, Martina and Kahena, you know, that seems like we wouldn't be talking about anyone else in 12th place, but that is a bubble spot for getting into the top 10. If you look at the points, um, really the top two, Odile, the Spanish, um, they have a really... Uh, and the Swedish. And the, and the Swedish, sorry, um, have a really uh, big point spread. But, um, but, you know, a third place yesterday for the Brazilians, followed by a 20th, that's not a march. But uh, really pay attention to teams like that. And uh, just a little uh, note about the Spanish who are lying in third, in third or fourth. Yeah, fourth, I think. In fourth overall. Um, just they talked about the pressure building up leading into this. And one thing that Tamara said is, you know, when that pressure loads up on them, she said, Paula, you have like one minute to get it all out of your system. And then we have to keep looking forward. So all the teams are starting to feel that pressure today. Yeah, I, I had that conversation with Tamara and, and Paula as well, and it was that they were a bit cross about uh, their performance yesterday. It wasn't as consistent they wanted. Uh, and Paula, I've never seen anything but a smile on her face, but apparently she was pretty grumpy. But she was given 60 seconds to get the grump out of her and to get the smile back on. It happens to the best of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so there we have a match race build, building up between uh, the Dutch and the Swedes. The Swedes look really fast once they get out in front, but in back in the pack, they can't always make that speed work so we'll we'll see how things work out and if any of the other interlopers maybe britain spain or poland who are in third fourth and fifth um can they get can they close the gap can they get back in towards that because at the moment it looks like britain spain and poland are in a fight for the bronze medal in the uh, nacra 17 uh, we didn't actually see them yesterday, Lisa, but I'm sure you've seen the scoreline. Um, they've done 12 races, and with a discard, that means that Tita and Banty are on a perfect 11 points from 11 races. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty incredible, um, you know, especially yesterday, that the conditions really... Uh, 
were ideal for them. Um, they were able to, to show their stuff. And uh, I'm sure a lot of the teams and a lot of the coaches are trying to get as close as possible to what the Italians are doing and how they can learn from them moving forward towards the games. Because the Italians have, um, you know, our drone, drone driver said it perfectly, some special sauce. And the, all the teams are really looking for, like, how do we put that together and, and how, do we, how do we close that gap? Because it's, it's pretty huge as soon as they, we, we see a full foiling race. And I hear rumours that uh, money might be changing hands for that drone footage. Uh, but he's he's actually getting, um, he's being asked just to focus solely on ITA 26 because that's all the other teams want to see. They want to try and work out um, how on earth that boat or how on water that boat is flying so much faster than anyone else. So on a day like today, another stable day, I said I'd eat my hat yesterday if anyone took a race off them. I didn't have to eat my hat. Will I have to eat my hat today? Uh, I think your hat might be pretty safe. I mean, you know, we've, uh, they're going to be second start, so the breeze should be well established by then as well. Um, you know, for the, for the 49ers who are starting first on that course, um, it may be a little bit less stable and it might be a little lighter. If that was the NACRAs, they may have a little bit of a problem, as we saw, you know, a few days ago when it wasn't full foiling conditions. But by the time they get out there, I think they're going to have champagne sailing and the, and the Italians are going uh, to be pretty comfortable going into tomorrow. And it's another set of Italians who are in second, Ugolini and Jubilee. They are almost as comfortable in second place at the moment. And the best of the rest are the Finnish team of Kurt Bay and Keskinen. So that things could still change, but it's, it's looking increasingly like an Italian one too. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the real excitement in the NACRA is going down into the top 10 and who are the players that are going to be able to make that jump. You know, we kind of call today moving day. Um, we've got one race tomorrow, but that's kind of a, a, a last hope to get into that medal race. But today, there's, there's a lot of points on the table for those teams to try and get into the top 10. And so it's, uh, you know, the pressure is really going to be on for that, that middle group um, and, and the group that's just outside the top 10 to try to make that jump in. We are going to get into 49ers first, then it's going to be NACRAs later on. So we, we're about to talk about 49ers. I, I want to get your take on what you think is going to happen, because the Dutch are not really putting a foot wrong, are they? Lambrex and van der Verken, um, they're looking quite comfortable with a, I think it's a 13-point gap on the Fantellas in second. Right, but there was a lot of movement behind them, just like what we were talking, what Lisa was talking about with the NACRA 17. And you, what did you call it? The commentator's blessing? There's a commentator's curse, but yesterday, you know, I I mentioned the the Spanish. I thought they were kind of unassailable, pushing for first. But you mentioned the Fantella brothers, who both independently have uh, Olympic campaigns under their belts, and together um, they rocketed right up to second. Uh, Lepfrog, the New Zealanders, Dunning, Beck, and Gunn, and uh, man, they they feel relaxed. They have a lot of confidence. So it's it's not unassailable. They get the first, but there's been a lot of movement behind them. And the other thing we've talked about in this fleet is definitely going down through the top ten. I mean, there were more than 20 boats sitting on the bubble to get into the gold fleet and we have a two-time uh, Olympic bronze medalist sitting in 40th or somewhere back there in the silver fleet so um, we had a great talk with uh, Bildstein and Husel from Austria this is their 10th world championships in a row I think that's unmatched and they just turned 30 this year they did three junior worlds before that so um, e if you can't underestimate how tight this fleet is and how what's just small margins of error in a very established 20-something, you know, 22-year-old class, um, how tight it is in this fleet. So I, I think below the top two or top three even, you know, below first, really, it's, um, it's a lot of movement that's going to happen today. Yeah, well, let's see if there is a lot of movement. It's going to be about the details like it was yesterday, if, if that sea breeze proves to be correct. Um, it's going to be a lot of fun to watch it. So we'll see you very shortly for all the action. Well, there's the view. St. Margaret's Bay. Lisa, this is uh, looking pretty healthy, isn't it? You're a local sea breeze expert. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, we saw the indicators a little bit earlier this morning uh, for a nice sea breeze um, than we did yesterday. Um, so it looks like we are going to start on time. Um, the, the sea breeze is still establishing, um, so we may see it be a little bit more, um, more uh, variable than it was kind of midway and, and through, through the racing of the FXs yesterday. Um, and uh, so we'll see if, if, uh, if the sailors are going to get some extra shifts and extra, extra uh, pressure variability to make this race interesting. Um, but I think, you know, by the second race here, we're going to see a little bit of a drag race for these guys. 
Let's remind ourselves uh, who we're watching and let's have a look at the leaderboard in the men's 49er gold fleet. Uh, so leading with a pretty healthy 13 points is Lambria. <laughs> Lambrie X and Van der Verken, the defending world champions from the Netherlands. Van Teller's had an amazing day yesterday in what we expect to be similar sea breeze conditions today. Very consistent with a 1-1-5 from the Croatian brothers. Botin and Trittle, fairly new pairing, but both very experienced Olympians from Tokyo 2020 last year, um, holding third place. They've displaced uh, Logan Dunning-Beck and Oscar Gunn from uh, New Zealand, who are down to fourth, but still very much um, in in with the shout of making it to the podium. Just behind them, the other Kiwis, McHardy and McKenzie. Um, Buksak and Wiesbitski, the best of a very po strong Polish squad in six. Bildstein and Hussel, um, 30 years old, both of them now competing in their 10th consecutive world championship. The Austrians holding seventh. Uh, and then two French teams in eighth and ninth, and the Italians Crivelli Visconti in tenth. Uh, Lisa, tell us about what you make of the points situation there. Yeah, well, we were talking earlier about how tight the points are in that middle group, and you can't see it, but below this is, you know, a dogfight to get into the into that top ten. Um, we've got a point spread between, here we go, we've got a point spread between 6th um, and 15th of only 22 points. So we're talking about four more Gold Fleet races. When the racing is this tight and these guys are so close together, um, you know, it's, it's really possible for, uh, for the boats like the Danish to be really trying to push hard and, uh, and still get in this medal race. So just to remind people of the format, we, we started out the week uh, with 65 teams in the men's 49er. Um, the, in the qualifying in the first three days, it was all about making it into the top 25. That's what we're looking at now, the best 25 in the gold fleet. We're going to be watching three gold fleet races this afternoon. And then tomorrow morning, there is going to be one final gold fleet race before we find out who make the final 10 to go into a single medal race. That is a non-discardable. That means you've got to count the points from the medal race, and it's also a double counter. It's it's double points, so there's two points for winning a medal race. So um, the idea of the medal race, Lisa, is that it, it keeps things a little bit tighter and we don't see runaway winners. But, of course, if Bart Lambriex and Floris van der Verken have a great day today, they could pretty much do enough to uh, to wrap up the gold medal as, as neutrals. I guess we're hoping that's not the case. <laughs> I, I guess we're hoping that others are going to make up the ground on the Dutch today. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the medal races really made the uh, made the end of um, end of racing quite interesting. Um, you know, it's it's a fairly new development as far as the the length of history of Olympic class sailing. Um, but uh, but yeah, we still get those runaway runaway gold medals sometimes with the uh, you know with. Um, solid performances like the Dutch here and the Italians in the NACRA. And, uh, you know, if people are performing and nobody can touch them, there's not much you can do about that. So we've got just under 12 minutes to the start of the race. You can see that bottom right of your screen. And it's looking pretty healthy for a start. How much breeze and from which direction? Yeah, so we've got um, in and around, you know, kind of 9 to 12 knots going on here right now. You can see that there's some darker pressure intermixed with some lighter pressure. So classic sea breeze where you get waves of, uh, waves of, of increased pressure followed by some, some lulls. And those will come with little clicks. So we call them clicks, but they're, you know, little movements of, of the breeze. Now, as the sea breeze fills in, it will have a tendency to fill into a, to a certain direction. Sometimes, um, depending on the gradient, um, that fill-in might be a little bit left of where it st first started, um, or sometimes it's right. Um, we're seeing that it's a little bit less stable than it was yesterday as it's filling in, so it'll be interesting to see. We've seen quite a few clicks to the, to the left from where it was about 20 minutes ago, so um, we may have a little bit of course change as we start to get ready for this race. You know, the race committee is going to try and, and square up the course as best they can, um, but uh, we'll see how, uh, how, this, uh, how this breeze um, settles in. But it does look like a very classic, you know, middle-level sea breeze day for, for St. Margaret's Bay. You can see we're panning all the way over to, um, 
to the rest of St. Margaret's Bay, and then down there on the uh, clo much closer to the shore, that's Queensland Beach. Um, it's a very popular beach for a lot of people who live uh, in the South Shore and in, in uh, Halifax. And the FX racing is going to be right down there. It's beautiful sailing down there. Lots of, lots of breeze, maybe a little bit more chop than you see up here on this race course, a little bit shallower water. And so those girls will have, uh, have their race right in front of that beach. And it's beautiful spectating uh, for, for everybody who is able to make their way down there today. Uh, so we've got other racing uh, taking place today. We saw quite a lot of the 49er FX racing yesterday. That's the, the fleet that we won't be seeing today. But later on this afternoon, you can look forward mm -hmm. to seeing the NACRA 17 foiling catamarans. And uh, we, the last time we saw them a couple of days ago, it was very diff different conditions, wasn't it, Lisa? And so far, it was the only time that we've seen anybody other than Tita and Banti from Italy win a race. And it was Sarah Newbury and David Liebenberg from USA that sailed a really, really smart uh, race in terms of how they moded the boat through those really variable conditions. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, once we get those NACRAs out on this race course, it'll be interesting to see what time we are. Um, they're racing in the 49er yesterday, later on in this race course. As the sun comes down, you know, um, a sea breeze or a thermal breeze is driven by the sun and the heat of the sun. And uh, as the sun starts to go down, the heating starts to shut off. Things do get a little bit more tricky. Um, holes on the race course start to, to start to come up. The guys saw that. And the sea breeze tends to follow the sun as well. So generally later, in, earlier in the day, the left tends to pay a little bit more in the sea breeze. Later in the day, the right tends to, to pay more. So it may get a little bit more up and down, especially by the last race of the NACRAs. So we'll have to see kind of what time frame we're in um, as far as the day. But uh, maybe we'll get some interesting racing there and we'll see that, that that Italian team get sucked back into the rest of the the fleet and have to work for it. Uh, yeah, let's see how that pans out. We are, we've are we got our camera focused on Netherlands 1. The big black and white one on the sail says that uh, Bart Lambriax and Floris van der Verken were the world champions from last year. I spoke to uh, Lambriex and Van der Verken a few days ago. Um, okay, actually, I, I'm hearing that uh, we can get an interview with, uh, with Chris down in the boat park, so let's see who Chris has for us. Awesome. We're here at the 2022 Worlds. We're waiting for that racing to get started. Same and way. I'm Sarah with Newbury. Sarah Newbury and David Leibenberg. Yep. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And hey, guys, you know, you, it was a two days ago, you had a one-two. And you like have these moments of brilliance where you're in the top five, and then like like everyone else, it's um. Let me just take this out. Like everyone else, uh, you'll get you know some you know teens or twenty something. So can you explain to me on you know why we see even across the fleet, not just yourselves, that kind of those peaks and valleys in finishes? Yeah, I mean, I think the first answer is about us, which is that we've been back in the boat for um, well since January or so racing and. Um, after me having a baby and and we're back on the on the circuit which is awesome um, so for us it's kind of hit or miss we've been training certain things and sometimes we put the pieces together um, but I think a lot of other teams are probably experiencing the same thing like they're working on a couple of the puzzle pieces and you know not every single team is here at Worlds uh, to peak and to win it um, a lot of us are in different parts of our training process so there's that and then I also think it's a testament to how good the fleet is like people have now started to really figure out how they want to set the boats up to foil upwind. And I think we're seeing the fallout of that. You know, it's a very competitive fleet. Cool. And David, as a crew, um, we see, you know, unique to the NACRA, there's a lot of, uh, you, you, there's a lot of range in terms of the crew's movement and the impact yeah. that they have on the performance. It's a little bit more noticeable than you'd see on a 49er or FX sometimes. So talk to me about uh, going through this week, you know, how diverse you have to be in terms of your body movement and your modes. I mean, it's extreme, right, in terms of how you have to handle each day in, in the conditions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and with the different conditions, w wind ranges and, and wave states as well. Wave state in our boat makes it a huge difference, sometimes more than uh, breeze states, but we had one northerly really shifty day that was really flat and it was, sea state was not an issue and it was identifying the pressure and getting the mode changes right in terms of that compared to day one where it touched up against the upper wind limit for us, um, you know, and, and got pretty full on and, and was wavy and that was um, j just very different types of sailing. What you're thinking about is, is very different. 
Cool. And I love talking to both of you about your lifestyle. Sarah, I know when we saw each other in 2020, uh, you were using a sports psychologist. More and more teams mm -hmm. are using sports psychologists. Uh, you even mentioned that, you know, being a mother. David, I don't know if you do have children. No, uh, <laughs> no, not, not yet. Maybe it's hard enough to have one team member with children. <laughs> um, but uh, talk to me about that balance between the two of you. David, you know, you obviously maybe don't have those types of um, you know, challenges, you know, for your free time. Uh, but, you know, you guys seem to be striking a really good balance, even though you're just back into the boat again. You go, go for it. No, you go <laughs> um, Yeah, I mean, we, we both work with a sports psychologist, and I, th I think it's true with everyone. You, you know, you have your strengths and weaknesses um, mentally as well as physically. So just trying to optimize, you know, every part of the campaign and really maximizing performance and figuring out how you can bring the best uh, to the water every single day. Right, and on your free time, I mean, if Sarah, if Sarah is taken away by other obligations, are you still hammering away on the campaign, or do you make sure you have that balance for yourself as well? I uh, d definitely take a, a bit of balance for myself. Um, I do some pro sailing and rigging work, and um, like rock climbing, and you know, getting outside and doing some camping as well. Cool, and Sarah, for your balance. Well, uh, that has been an ongoing challenge, and I'm learning a lot about it. Uh, I think that. Uh, the way that our team has operated and being quite patient with each other and trying to figure out what works best for us and knowing that maybe what works best for us is, is not what worked best for the team that won a gold medal last time or, or whatever it is. Um, so we've been trying to accept where we are and what we need individually as athletes and, and to give each other that, that as well. Um, so that's, that's been the best way to learn how to be a mom and also a sailor, <laughs> um, but it's not perfect. Cool. Well, it's really been fantastic to watch. I love talking to you all at Regattas. You're, you know, you're relaxed and realistic and honest. And so thank you for sharing all those details. I know it's not, uh, you know, prioritary, you know, for everyone, but it's not the same for everyone. But thank you so much. Uh, we have, uh, we're probably coming up to a minute for the start of the 49er Gold Fleet race for today. So we will um, send it back to the studio and let them preview that start. Thanks very much, Chris. And the U flag, that red and white checkered flag just behind the mast is flying. Lisa, what do the sailors need to be thinking about when they see that red and white flag? Yeah, so, I mean, this is their opportunity to uh, make their last minute decisions on their strategy. Um, you know, pick their spot on the line, figure out where they, th where they think the, uh, the bias on the line is. Um, we've seen that the, that the breeze is, it is a little bit unstable. It's, it's, there's, some, there's a few bigger shifts out there. Some of them are quick. Um, so I think it's the long ones that are going to make the big difference over this race course. So they've really got to pay attention to, uh, to the phase um, and also if they can see more pressure on the water. So you, these guys are standing up um, anyway, So, but you're trying to look way up in the distance in this last little minute. So because um, once your head's in the boat and you're, 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 uh, you're focused on your lane, you've really got to, your, your view is a lot less uh, it's more limited than it is right now. So this is your last minute decision making. And uh, within two minutes, they've made their decision now. And now it's all about execution. They've made their two minute decision and look how closely lined up to the start they are already. You've really got to book early. Um, you, you get penalized for, for, for late booking for your, for your holidays in a 49er start. So um, it looks like the left hand end is really, really popular. Uh, Lisa, from from what you can see, why would they be thinking in terms of the pin end? Yeah, so the so the breeze is clicked left in the in, in within that five minute sequence, and uh, so I think they're trying to get a, gain a little bit of an advantage from a left line, um, and uh, try and get out there. They may see a little bit of pressure out there. You know, we can't see that from where we are, um, but you know, if you if you want to go left and you want to be on the left-hand side of the fleet, there's only one place to start, and that is below the boats. That's the only way to get there. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's... Start as close to the left-hand end of the line as you can. Yeah. But that's, that's the reason why it's so busy, and only one boat can get the perfect start from that end of the line. Um, maybe there are opportunities further up the line where you're a little bit compromised um, in terms of uh, not being quite so far at the favoured end of the line, but isn't it even more important to be able, be able to hold a clear lane for five minutes out to the left-hand side? Yeah, on this race course, you know, with with the, with how tight the speeds are, I think, you know, if you do want to uh, to gain a little bit of leverage over there on the left, the real key is not having to tack. Um, so you want to you want to definitely balance that uh, confidence that you have in being so tight with the groups all the way over there at the pin. And giving up a little bit of that distance to, to have a little bit more of, uh, 
more of a, a yeah. softer lane so that you can go. Now, I'm hoping we can get our drone to sight directly down the line if possible. We've got 18 seconds to go, and it's great if we can have that direct line down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mike, flying the drone. Um, wow. So there, eight seconds, seven seconds, some boats very, very close they in the middle. Close. I'm worried about Australia in the middle. And two seconds, that I think Calling is going to be... Calling a general recall. Here we go. Yes, yep. you correctly <laughs> called it. A yellow and blue flag goes up just to the left of your screen on the, the yacht, on the committee boat, and that is going to be a general recall. So David Campbell James standing next to that flag. He's thinking, oh, what color flag am I going to put up next? Lisa, what color flag is David going to put up next? Oh, it'll be a black flag for sure. I mean, this fleet was just showing that they are antsy to get this racing going. Um, you know, all the chips are down today as far as um, the boats trying to establish their position and get into that metal race. And, uh, you know, um, for sure, they're they're trying to make sure that they don't they don't have to tack and they're staying bow even. So the black flag will keep them a little bit a little bit more at bay and uh, further away from the line. And uh, and then I think we'll get a race off in this in this next start for sure. So why are these guys still sailing up the track? Have do they, they not realize that there is a recall? Yeah, well, I mean, this is a great time to, to test your settings and to test what's going on. So a lot of times, especially with a U flag, where um, where there's no penalty for being over the line early in that uh, it, when you get a general recall, um, these boats will go up when test their settings, see how things feel, um, use this as a little bit of a training run before they go back. Um, sometimes you even see that when you get a postponement where um, if the if the race committee doesn't like something, they may postpone in that last minute, and boats will just go and use that time as a little bit of a of a of a test. Um, so that they can they know and they have a higher confidence in, in where they are for the for the actual start of the race. So now we see the boats turn back downwind, but they, they certainly milked that recalled start for, for what they could get out of it, just getting vital information and data, clocking some compass readings, getting a sense of, of how the wind is behaving. Lisa, what's your sense of how the wind is turning? Is it shifting much? Is it changing much in strength? Yeah, well, it's 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 popped up in strength, so it it looks a little bit more like we're we're into that um, f um, getting really close to that full sea breeze um, condition, where it's clicked a little bit left. It's I think it, we may see it start to settle in now um, in the range where it is. We're in we're in the kind of 155, uh, you know, 159 to um, to 149 degrees. So again, all the all the boats on here have compasses. Um, and they will know their compass numbers from one tack to the other. And so that, that gives them, uh, um, as, as well as looking around the race course, that gives them some confidence in what they're seeing um, on whether or not their bow is pointing more at the mark or not. Um, so it does look like the breeze has popped up a little bit in the last 10 minutes. Um, we're in and around the 11 to, to uh, 14 knot range, and it's, it's uh, settled down a little bit left. So I think that's why everybody was uh, was pretty raring to go and trying to trying to leg out to the left there. Lisa, you correctly called it. The black flag has gone up. So that 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 is the flag of death. There is, there's no nastier flag than than that. Um, so David Campbell James is very keen to get this race away without any further general recalls. And let's see if the changing colour of the flag um, makes people take that line more seriously and and make sure that they start the correct side of it. Yeah, and again, the good starters like that black flag because that keeps the uh, the people who maybe don't have quite so uh, quite so good of a call on where that where that invisible line is. That keeps them a little bit further back. And then if you have got a really good sense of where the line is, you you can confidently know that you can get a jump. Um, so uh, so for some of the fleet out here, they're actually really happy that that flag went up because likelihood is that we're going to get a good start off and if you're a good starter you're probably going to have a little bit of an easier time so just taking a breath just a moment to go before three mi three minutes you need to take those those moments don't you lisa where you you just need to uh, check in with yourself um, people often have rituals yeah so um you know, uh, preparing for uh, for Beijing, my training partner Anna Tunnicliffe, who won the gold medal, 
um, before every single race, she did a deep breathing exercise um, before she went into the start on the last uh, on her last approach. And uh, you know, your body doesn't know whether a tiger's chasing you or whether you're starting a race in the in the gold fleet at the World Championships. And uh, it's really important to keep uh, to keep those nerves at check. And you know, anybody who's watching this at home, you. Um, there are nerves out there, even for the gold medalists. So it's really important, you know, all of that um, performance management um, that these athletes do to make sure that their mind and their body is ready to go and is in, in, the, in the mode that they need it to be, to be as flexible and as open as possible to see what's going on in the race course. Is it okay to be nervous at this point? Because I know that at this point in a pre-start, I'm always nervous. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's the definition of, of of nerves. Some people, in order to be in that ideal performance state, that flow state, they need to be like you know super calm and uh, and very chill. Some people need to be hyped up and and kind of charging like a bull. So you've got to really know yourself, know what type of athlete you are, and know your brain and what it needs to be able to take in all of the information that these athletes need to take in. We've got one minute to go. And so right now they're really honed in on where is that line and, uh, and, and what do I need to do to manage my spot. You can see that there's a much bigger sag now with that black flag up. Certainly at this end of the line near the committee boat, that is true. Uh, there is still with 50 seconds to go some boats that I would suggest are pretty close. They're, they're only about a boat length away from the line. Uh, so the, the boat's up at the pin end. They need to be careful. I think I see Poland 7 getting pretty close. That's the most poked out boat at the far end. Croatia 83, really good day yesterday. They had the be they made the, the best of the sea breeze conditions yesterday. They are they have booked their spot right next to the committee boat with 25 seconds to go. So Fantella's looking like they have the control that they need down at that end of the line. Coming into the final 15 seconds. Yeah, so the breeze has clicked right a little bit. You can see the boats are, are much more even across the line. And, uh, and so, yeah, the Croatians are quite high on the line for a right. We've got five, four, three, two, one. Whoo, that is tight on the line for a black flag start. That was a little bit squeaky for Croatia 83, the Fantellas off this end of the line. They've had a great start, but what we don't know and what they don't know, was it a little bit too good? We might find that out in a moment if we can get any intel from the race committee. Meanwhile, Netherlands won leading overall in this championships the defending world champions decided to start on port the great thing about that is they know that they were nowhere near the line and also they're straight out into clear air as they blast out to the right hand side the downside lisa is that a lot of separation is developing between them and the bulk of the fleet on starboard tack. Yeah, I mean, they're sailing fast right now. They're one of the fastest boats on the race course, as you can see as they leg away from the, uh, from the Chinese and the Uruguayans be behind them. Um, so that's one of the reasons why, why they want to do that. Um, and uh, there was a little click right, so you think they might want to um, come back if the boats don't, don't tack, but I see a lot of tackers um, coming back uh, uh, to, the, to the other side. Here we are on the... Fantella brothers. So this is Croatia 83, who are very, very close to the committee boat and to the start line. They had the best of the conditions yesterday with a 115. That's Shime Fantella on the right and his uh, brother, Miho, who is working the main sheet up at the front of the boat. Look how low they are trapezing. Yeah, so they're trying to get every last piece of leverage out of their bodies and transfer that into the boat. And, uh, and you can see them looking down. You just saw the, the skipper there look underneath the boom to see what's going on. They're looking over their shoulder. They're trying to take in, um, take in all the information. And then, and then they're also dialing right back into their speed because, again, this is we saw yesterday it's all about speed on a day like today so um, as soon as they're confident with where they are and what they're doing and they're not making any decisions they're just talking about how the boat feels and how to get the boat through the water as fast as they possibly can they're making this low trapezing look very very easy and and at this level this is what everybody is doing they're low down on the trapeze but it means that the margin for error is extremely low because if they don't get that balance correct, they, they can end up dumping in the water. And once you get your bodies in the water, that's really, really slow. So the ideal 
setup is to be having your body skimming just above the surface of the water. Yeah, and you could see there as we panned out that the Croatians are doing a very good job of managing their lane. They're a little bit forward of the boat, both to leeward and to windward of them, which are the boat ab above and below. And so they've got a really nice spot there to be able to go fast. So we see attack from Netherlands 1. China responds immediately. Lambriex and Van der Verken, they are controlling this side of the race course and now it's the moment of truth as they sight back through the windows on their mainsail and on their jib to see how are we doing? How is the right hand side of this race course working out for us compared with the boats that have gone left that, like the Fantellas that we were just talking about? Yeah, so um, originally because, um, because we had a little bit of right um, pressure as we started, um, the boats on the on that had gone uh, starboard tack on the left were uh, looking like they were um, they were doing well. Um, the boats that had won the pin, um, so that would be the uh, the French, the the British, all the boats down there. Um, but then China and and the Netherlands, who were able to sail fast right off the get go with no traffic around them, now that they've tacked. They're basically looking exactly bow even with the boats um, with the boats down there to the left, and I actually quite like their position because I feel like they've made a little bit more distance towards the mark, and there's going to be a long, heavy traffic uh, track back from the left. You can see all those boats over there at the top of the screen. Um, boats together go slowly. Netherlands 1 tracking really nicely. Floris van der Verken just leaning in for a moment just to adjust the tension of the vang, the, the, the kicker control that controls the tension in the mainsail leech. China also going very quickly to leeward. And then Germany 21 tacking just to leeward of them. But in terms of how they're going, the Dutch, they re no one has been in their way. They had to duck a couple of boats off the start line. Since then, they've been sailing in clear air able to VMG drive that boat as fast as possible. Now it's up to up to the Dutch to see how the left hand side has worked out. That's the bit of the race that they can't control. Yeah, I mean they've got a great lane here. They're sailing fast. Um, Chinese and the Germans, they're a little bit further further back than the than the Dutch. But again, these guys have had clear air and they've been able to sail fast all the way around uh, the race course so far. So um, as they approach the mark, we're going to see those those two sides converge, and uh, and then it's a matter of whether or not they cross that group and uh, and get the the group behind them. But I actually think that the Dutch might be able to um, to make a nice tack in front and kind of lead the group back as the pointy end of the arrow, and that's really ideal. That's what you want to see if you're uh, if you're leading your side out to to link up with the, with the other side. Well, in the next minute or so, we're going to see how these crosses work out. They're on a converging uh, direction now. The Dutch coming in from the right-hand side as they're looking at it. And Austria, Croatia, Spain, Poland 7 coming in from the left-hand side. So it's the first cross. It's the moment of truth. Looks like the Dutch might have tacked away they have they have so they've gone back out for a little bit more of um of something on the right it did look like they were able to cross the rest of the group so um i actually think that they just think that their side is better there are some boats that you can see here on the right um the, the polish up on their hip and i think that that might be the boats that they're worried about and they may be saying you know what we're not as worried about the boats on the left now we've gotten close to them we know we're good we're going to make sure that we're the rightmost boat coming into this mark and we're going to control this side incredible drone shots here watching the reigning world champions racing up this side of the track and uh i, I know that uh, some of the the NACRA sailors have been asking our drone operator, Mike, to, um, to show more of the Italian boat that's, that's leading the NACRA World Championship. Here is a masterclass in 49er sailing from the very best in the world. Uh, these two guys from the Netherlands, Bart Lambriax and Floris van der Verken, making it look very easy because they are sailing that boat extremely steadily. Look how upright the mast is. It, it, there's, there's no variation 
side to side. That is a fully upright mast. Yeah, so in sailboat racing, you really want, um, you know, a slow boat is a boat where you can see the mast going um, going back and forth um, towards the water and, and, and then upright again and towards the water. It's not what we would call a balanced boat. And these guys have the mast tracking directly upright and, uh, and it's really not, it's not healing. It's not changing, and uh, and then they're just changing their weight, changing the tuning to keep that boat tracking as fast as possible. And you can see now they've tacked on the ley line, and they're well crossing the rest of the group. So that was a pretty strong move to come back and uh, and and make sure that they they're winning their side. Um, so we'll see. They might be a little bit low on the ley line, so uh, we'll see if they have to do another maneuver to to get across. And there is the rest of the fleet. That's the fleet, uh, the, the view that Lambriex and De Verken will see through their sails. Uh, they're crossing the first port tackers. Will they cross all of the port tackers? It's looking very, very good for the Dutch right now. Yeah, so it looks like they got a little bit of a knock there, um, but not enough for them to miss the cross. And I think the Germans um, that, are, that they just tacked on are probably going to be the, uh, the, the second place boat around um, as we get up closer to the mark. And here they are, now they're on the ley line and now they're making their final approach to the mark. And by doing that, they've done, done two extra tacks. Um, is that a little bit of a mis mistake by the Dutch? Should they have not got the ley line nailed on the previous tack? I think it might have been that little shift um, that, uh, that, that took them off the ley line because it did look like they were on when they tacked. Then as they approached the, the other boats, they kind of their bow got sent away from the mark, and that was that that would be a knock, um, and uh, and it was a little bit of a shift in favor of the boats on the left. But again, the right we see the Chinese directly behind the right paid. That was where you needed to be, and um, and even though they got a knock coming into the mark there, they were able to do, make their cross. But they only still just got round. I'm wondering if there's a bit of adverse current on, on that mark and boats are struggling to make it on that ley line. Maybe they need to put a bit extra in the bank on the starboard ley line. Yeah, there could be for sure. Um, there is current out here. Um, likely not a difference from side to side, but definitely it could make it hard for the ley lines and for the start. So, Netherlands round in first. China round in second, breathing right down their necks. Then a bit of a gap back to Germany in third place. And we're on board with uh, Shimi Fantella and Ooh. Miho just getting back onto the uh, the trapeze. So the Croatians, I uh, don't know where they are in the um, in the fleet, but that didn't work out that well for them. Yes, they're, they're up and running with a kite. We see the first jibe set that looks like an Australian boat that's gone for the jibe set. Australia 71, and then maybe a New Zealand boat jibe behind them. And a bit of a messy jibe going on between Belgium and the Danes in the middle. There's a bit of a tie-up between two boats with red kites there. Very, very messy as Belgium looks eventually to get clear. But I wonder if there's going to be a protest between those two boats. Yeah, Croatia had a really hard time getting out of the left. We were talking about that. Oh, yeah. And there's a boat taking a turn. I'm trying to think. That That's is the Croatians. Croatians. Yeah, so they, um, they rounded the mark in 19th. Um, heavy, heavy, heavy traffic. Probably sailing pretty slow up that up that left side in a lot of traffic. And then, if there is a little bit of current, like you were saying, around the mark, it gets really dicey when you have to throw an attack and then try and get around the mark um, with not a lot of flow on your foils. And uh, you can get in trouble and hit the mark. Well, maybe that's what happened. I'm, I'm wondering. I think they got their kite up. We saw that onboard footage with kite up. I th it looks to me maybe they oh, had to drop the kite. They did a foul with somebody else and... And then they had to take a turn. But anyway, disastrous for the Croatians at the moment because the Croatians were looking like the biggest threat. The Dutch, the Dutch are leading this event already by 13 points. They're now leading this race. It's just getting better and better for the Netherlands. Yeah, and so that's what we were talking about, how, point, how cl close these points are, you know, when you start to have... Uh, have races like this because these boats are all bow even. You can see them all jiving um, and trying to uh, trying to take their step back with clear air. And uh, and this is very tactical sailing downwind for for these boats. Asymmetrical, you know, you're jiving downwind just like you're tacking upwind. Um, so it's pre it's really exciting sailing and uh, a good positioning on a downwind can make a massive difference in your in your points. 
You could see uh, the French just launching off a couple of these waves. Um, some of this chop is really, really tough. And uh, the sailors have been saying that uh, some of the chop is, is pretty hard to, uh, to jive in as well with uh, your not getting your bow stuck in some of this chop. Okay, it, does, it doesn't look that bad from the drone shot, does it? So maybe we're, we're not getting a full sense of the extent of the chop. Maybe uh, this overhead view is, is flattening out the water a little bit. But you, you can see the bounce of the boats as they're going downwind and, and those white wakes running off the back of these high-speed planing boats. Lisa, what kind of speed are they doing at the moment? Yeah, so the boats right now are, uh, the Croatians are, uh, are, are sorry, the, the, the Dutch are one of the fastest boats out there, and they're going almost 16 knots downwind. Um, so that's um, very close, or it's faster than the breeze itself. So they're sailing in around 14 knots, and they're, uh, and, but they're going 16 knots downwind. Okay, very impressive. So the Dutch leading this race, and also impressively Wen and Liu from China, uh, going pretty much as fast, and, and they are the main threat to the Dutch right now. And the Chinese, they're, they're very new on the block in 49er skiff racing. To see them in second place in these kind of conditions uh, speaks very highly of the training that they're going through. So there's a jibe drop for the Dutch as they get the black kite down and, and away down the chute, and they pull the sails in, and it uh, doesn't surprise me to see the Dutch cheating in on port tack going out to the right hand side no no doesn't surprise me either um the breeze has been fairly steady um but there may be just a little bit more breeze out there we'll have to see how how it shakes out on this on this uh this next upwind the italians have done a nice job um on this uh on this downwind um there you can see them coming in there with the uh with the blue kite and uh they've um They've done a really good job of solidifying, I think, a pass on a couple of boats here on the on the downwind by jiving early out of that out of that big train. Okay, right. So gains to be made for Italy. And meanwhile, out on the left, Germany, Stingler and Schiel are in third place. They are the first boat to choose the left-hand gate mark. They're hoping that with a bit of separation, they might be able to get back at the top two, the Dutch and the Chinese who have chosen to go out right. And now we're in the really busy part of the traffic. These are the opportunities for the Fantellas to make up ground from the back of the fleet after taking that penalty turn. Fantellas really need to get back into this race and, and see what they can salvage. Yeah, you can see here, it, it it's tight in the middle of the fleet. They're basically rounding bow to stern, and the boat handling makes a huge difference in your ability to keep your lane and be able to extend away from some of the traffic and then be able to, to, uh, to make your choices on the upwind. Looking at that top 10 on the left, um, things are just playing into the Dutch's hands. Um, they, there are a few people further back in the standings that are in the top 10 at the moment. So it's going very well for the Dutch. Meanwhile, the Croatians, you can see them just about to round now. They really haven't made up much ground. It looks like they might only be second last in this race right now. So a lot of work for the Fantellas to do as they go around the right-hand gate. Yeah, you would expect that this this race may prove to be their, their drop race at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, with another three races left to race, you know, you can't be making too many more mistakes like this for the Croatians. No, not if they've got realistic hopes of being able to win a world title, such as the world title they won in 2018. Yeah, so the uh, the Dutch have done almost um, exactly what they did after the start of the of the race before. They are hammering it out to the right side, just sailing really, really fast. Um, I, they've clearly got conviction over their over their um, over their speed um, and where they're going. So they're just dialed in and and sending it. So wherever you are in the world, thank you for joining us today, for watching the live coverage of the 49er, 49er FX and NACRA 17 World Championships. Uh, another amazing day in Nova Scotia, in Canada. Thanks for um, liking, sharing, um, that w whatever you're doing on social media. Please tell others who you think will enjoy this coverage. And make sure that you're subscribed and join the conversation with us. We're on all the usual social media platforms. Um, you can find everything through 49er.org. So keep on watching and tell your friends. And especially if you're in the Netherlands, well, this is really good news 
for the Dutch as they continue to stretch out to the right-hand side of the race course with China in hot pursuit. What do you think about the Germans on the far side, meanwhile? Germany 21, how are, the, how are they doing? They were the first to go left out of the bottom of the course. Yeah, so the Germans actually do have a really nice nice position. I mean, it looks like it's all right right now, but really, the, the breeze has settled down. There are, are very, very small shifts out there. So this is a speed game, and the Germans have a nice lane over there. The French do as well. Um, so if if they're able to get, a, again, a little bit of a click left, like when the Dutch came back at the very top. They can make a little bit more gain, um, but they've got really nice lanes to just drive fast and, and make their speed work. Um, and I think that's really one of, the, one of the big things out here is avoid traffic if you're in the middle of the group and get your boat going. We were speaking to one of the coaches earlier today, Mark Asquith, uh, about what he thought about the conditions yesterday. It seems like very similar direction, very similar conditions generally. He felt there was something in the top right of the race course. Do, do you think that's being borne out today and what we see? Yeah, I mean, that was a little bit later in the day when the sun was going down as well. So um, the breeze, uh, based on what I see on the, on the, uh, on the meter, the breeze has settled down into that full um, breeze in. I think what the Dutch did really well off the start was they were in no traffic and they were going fast. Um, it seems like it may be, you know, they did get a little bit. It could have been pressure. It's really hard to see at this point um, from the, uh, you know, from the drone shots. Um, but uh, they could have had a little bit more pressure out there in the middle of the race course. Um, that got them to be able to to uh, to get ahead of um, to get ahead of the Germans who were coming out from the from the left, but um, I think the Dutch are, are just we'll we'll have to take a look after after, but I think they're just faster. Yeah, it does look like they've got extremely good speed. Uh, they they well certainly um, Bart the the helm he's quite tall, so they're, they're sort of the the same spread of uh, of height and weight probably as Pete Burling and Blair Chuk, winner of six world titles and, and two Olympic medals, the, the most successful ever uh, 49er sailors who are not now retired and focusing on America's Cup and, and Sail GP. But th that tall helmsman, slightly shorter crew set up that the Dutch have reminds me of Berling and Chuk. There we see them, fully stretched, low down on the trapeze, standing back along the racks. Don't want to dig that bow into this St. Margaret's Bay chop. So. Pretty far back along the boat. Boom, centralized. Quite hard leeches on the sails, operating at, at full power. Probably, well, depowered to some extent, actually, in, in these conditions. But absolutely flying along upwind. And look at the gap yeah. back to the bulk of the fleet. So interestingly enough, a lot of the sailors, you can see that there's a mix between um, sailors using the, the newer black sails and the, um, and the, the clear sails. And... Uh, one of the things is is that the newer sails have a lot of power, and uh, the Dutch here, um, you know, having power means that you that you're limiting a little bit on your top speed. Um, it's like a Boeing 747 wing versus a, a fighter jet wing, and uh, when you when you get this boat up and up and running, especially downwind, um, you want to make sure that you're a fighter jet. And so um, right now, with the development in the class, um, I think. This mainsail um, seems to be ha allow the boats to have a little bit more ha more of a higher top speed, um, and they're able to, to control their um, the the pressures on the boat a little bit more um, as this as their newer black sail develops. Um, we'll probably see more and more of those in this fleet um, over the next over the, or as we lead into the to the Olympic Games. Well, most likely it's going to be compulsory for the World Championships next year, so you'll see only black sails. At this event, it's been allowed to use the older style main, mainsails like the Dutch are using, who just go into attack. Let's see this attack straight out onto the trapeze. Very, very minimal delay time uh, through the boat. So looking to maximize that writing moment as quickly as possible through the maneuver. So you can see here the Germans, they actually did quite well with that lane that they were coming from, from a little bit uh, course left as far as the fleet was concerned um, and they took a step all the way up to the ley line which was a nice move i like that move and i think they've made some gains on china doing that that late step and that limiting that extra extra maneuver um and uh, they're definitely in it um to play with the uh 
with the Chinese in that 2-3 uh, position. Yeah, well, let's see how China 349 does. They're going to have to do attack fairly soon. And let's see if when they do their attack after that, can they come in ahead of Germany 21? But at the moment, Netherlands 1 absolutely marching away with this race. Very hard to see anyone taking this away from the Dutch right now. And that is only going to extend their lead uh, further at the top of the leaderboard, particularly because their closest rivals, the Fantella brothers from Croatia, are having an absolute shocker. Yeah, so as we pan back, we're just going to see that cross or potential not cross between China and Germany. And uh, China is approaching, and I think we're going to see China just below the Germans right there. Yeah, so the Chinese just finished attack. They're a little bit unstable as they get, uh, they get settled after their attack, but it's really close between the Chinese and the Germans right now. So the Germans did a good job of, uh, of managing their lane and uh, and picking a great spot to go up the second beat yeah so let's see this unfold between china and germany as they go around the top mark for the final time uh, i'm constantly surprised to see chinese boats doing as well as they are here they, they they have really come on very strong in a short space of time germany a very well established 49er skiff nation a uh, great hoist from the Chinese and actually a, a better one from China than from Germany as, as China just gets a little bit of breathing room on the, the Germans chasing them in third place. Yeah, so the boats have to come down a little bit to release the pressure on the sails, um, get the crew into the boat so that they can raise the sail, and then they, they both get back on the trap and get going, and the Chinese had a really good transition moment in there, for mm -hmm. sure. The New Zealand has given themselves a lot to do here going round in Port Tack and there's a tide adverse on them as well. Are they going to get cleanly round without hitting that mark? It looks like New Zealand 18 has just about pulled that off, but that was a very squeaky moment for them. Just getting around ahead of Austria 10. Now they've got to avoid being rolled, but they are going to get rolled and there's potential contact there between Austria and New Zealand. So very messy and in incidents like that, you can see sometimes why the leader continues to extend further ahead of the rest of the fleet. Yeah, so you're just, um, when, once you're in the pack, you know, you're trying to manage your lane, you're trying to execute your maneuvers and, and uh, trying to keep your, your air clear, and especially there where you're slow rounding the mark because you've just slammed an attack on the, on the port ley line. Um, you know, maybe they should have uh, delayed their hoist just a little bit to make sure that somebody wasn't going over top of them. It's a tough call when you're in that when you're in those tight moments, and uh, that's why all that breathing makes uh, <laughs> makes a big difference. <laughs> I need to breathe after watching that <laughs> mark rounding, but uh, they, they did really well. New Zealand 18, just to avoid hitting the mark in the first place. And meanwhile, here are, here are the hopefully the uh, the comeback kings. We'll see if they are because at the moment the the, the Fantellas still have a lot to do. This is Shime and Miho Fantella still somewhere near the back of the fleet. Croatia 83 with a lot of ground to make up. How are they getting on, Lisa? Can you see where, what position they're in right now? Yeah, so Croatia is still at the back of the pack. They're, in, they're currently uh, tracking in 21st, 22nd position. Um, they've straight set around the mark, um, and they're basically following the train of all the boats out to the course left downwind. Um, there are a few uh, jibe setters um, that are trying to make a little bit of inroads on the pack. The boats are really tight, so, um, you know, first... Second and third have a little bit, and fourth actually, the Polish are right behind the Germans and the, and the Chinese. They have a little bit of a cushion, but behind them is a pack of dogs, and they there's going to be some tight finishes here as we uh, as we come into the to the finish. Yeah, and no one's going to take it away from the Dutch in this race. A, a absolute masterful performance. The only time the Dutch were behind anybody was at start time when they actually started behind the fleet intentionally on port tack so that they could pop out into clear air so isn't it strange that you can start from behind the whole fleet and and end up leading them the way that they do yeah i mean if you looked at the speeds of the boats off the start i mean there's a significant speed advantage to being by yourself um, especially in conditions like this and a lot of the boats that were in the middle of the line were sailing quite a bit slower than them so very smart tactics at start time very safe because they know they're not going to get a black flag disqualification that might still be coming up to bite some of the sailors as they cross the finish line. They might find out that they were over the line at the start, but that certainly wasn't the case for the Netherlands. One who were just, uh, Flor Floris van der Verken just stepping into the boat, ready to get the Jenica down. 
ready to jibe first actually and now dropping the Jenica ready for the next race what a dominant performance by Netherlands one clearly proving that last year's victory in Amman at the World Championships was well deserved yeah and in very different conditions as well so um, you know they're showing that they've got they've got all the tools in their toolbox and uh, there's somebody to be reckoned with in this quad so here you see the boats coming down we've got the um, the blue kite in front there is the uh, the Chinese the Germans with the black kite just um, just above them and then the Polish have the black kite that's coming down um, but it doesn't look like they're going to be able to touch those first two, uh, the, uh, the, pol uh, the Chinese coming across the finish line very soon. There they are. And then the Germans right behind them. Great races by these two boats. Absolutely. Wen and Lu absolutely owning that second place. And Stingler and Scheele, who were threatening to overtake them at the Wimbledon mark, actually dropped back on them. But it's still a very good performance by the Germans and it's Storch and Staniel that's looking like they're going to take fourth but it's very close call it Lisa yeah so this is the Polish with the with sorry with the orange kite they're coming in and I think they've just been able to soak away from the Spanish who were above them and uh, and so I think it's Polish Spanish and the third the the last place boat there is the other poles so very very tight sailing and now on the leaderboard, top right, Botin and Trittle are called as fourth across the line. I'm not convinced about that. Mm. I, I thought the Poles beat them to it. Okay, they've just done a switch. <laughs> there yeah, we no, go. You don't have to listen to me as the commentator. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, if you want to, that's fine. Clearly they've uh, got the uh, commentating <laughs> going on on the boat. <laughs> um, so really, really close across the line now. Um, but for, for a lot of the teams, but uh, these, uh, these are names that are not up near the front of the, uh, the overall leaderboard, with the exception of Botin and Trittle, who have now been relegated to sixth. And so it was two Polish boats that just got ahead of the Spaniards. That's even better news for the Dutch who won that race, because Botin and Trittle are the closest threat to the Dutch in this top ten uh, lineup that yeah. we're seeing in race 12. So here we see the Croatians with the black kite coming down hammering it in on starboard tack, trying to pass any boat they can as they cross the line. And, uh, you know, I think they got the uh, the Polish that was behind them there, but they weren't able to touch. It would have been really nice for them had they been able to touch that those three that were just coming in off the left. Yeah, wouldn't it just? Because uh, it looks like the Fantellas only managed to get two or three boats behind them in that race. So, oh, there's, there's one way, way back, right at the back, actually. So um, someone's still to finish in about one minute's time. Yeah, and that's, uh, let's see who that is. Having a little bit of trouble around the race course today. I think um, that um, Mollerus and McDermott from the USA. I think it might be, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. But anyway, just to sum up, a really, really dominant start to finish uh, performance, domination by Lambriax and Van der Verken. And uh, Lisa, if I can just prompt you um, just to, to have a look at manoeuvres and speed and, and distance sailed. Uh, we'll come to that in a moment. We'll just give Lisa a little bit of time uh, to look at that. And, and just to remind you that later on this afternoon, we are going to be watching the NACRA 17s and seeing if any of the other teams in the Foiling Catamaran can take a race off the utterly dominant Ruggiero, Tita and Caterina Banti from Italy reigning Olympic champions in the old style NACRA 17 and in the new style NACRA 17 that enables the boats to foil upwind as well as downwind. They are proving the masters to an even greater degree than for the Olympic Games last year in the semi-foiling boat that they had then. Um, also competing today, the 49er FX. And, and actually, it's uh, Bart Lambriex's girlfriend Odile van Anholt that is leading the 49er FX's and and it was those two that respectively won their world championships in Amman a year ago so uh, what a golden couple for the Netherlands to to have two world championship winning uh, skiff sailors who also happen to be going out together yeah so um, some some of the keys that we can see from the uh, SAP data analytics um, is uh, not surprising, the top average speed over the race course was the Dutch. Um, upwind and downwind, their average speed was 11.22 knots. And uh, a few boats, the Germans and the Polish um, and the Danish, and a few boats behind them actually in like um, 
you know, in in fifth and sixth, broke the eleven, but n did get close to the to the to the Danish over. Or sorry, to the Netherlands over the whole the whole race course. Um, distance sailed, huge uh, gainers for the Dutch on distance sailed and the Chinese. So those um, that especially on the first upwind, that move out to the right um, was a was a big gainer for them on distance sailed. Um, we'll come. We'll dig into those that data a little bit more in a moment. I understand that Chris is in the boat park. Let's see if we can get an interview with Chris down from down in the boat park. Great. Welcome down to the boat park. Uh, what an awesome race. I don't know what happened to the Croatians in that 49er race, but we're going to talk a little bit about NACRA, who we're going to be covering this afternoon. We're with uh, NACRA 17 coach Darren Bundock from Australia. What's up, Darren? Yeah, it's great to be here. We're here in Canada. We've had some fantastic conditions here so far, and the racing's been awesome. Cool. Well, we want to talk to Darren about Darren's a multiple Olympian, Olympic medalist, America's Cup sailor, your families, you know, your young families all sailing. And uh, we wanted to talk about the transition to articulating uh, foils in the NACRA. You went through a little bit of a transition. You were first in with the NACRAs before they were foiling, right? Yeah, so I, was, I did a little bit of a stint for an Olympic campaign for the 2016 Olympic Games. Um, so we're seeing the class go from sea foiling, which is just the curve boards, to the next quad was actually foiling with Z-shaped dagger boards. Um, and now we've seen um, the rudders with differential, so you can change the lift on the windward rudder and the leeward rudder um, to make the boat full foiling upwind now, so we're right. seeing that. So that's just a mind-blowing move, right? Just getting to that point with the rudders. And what I, I think what we, a lot of people are asking is, sure, first year with these um, you know, articulating rudders and being able to rack a little bit, you know, pull down on the weather run and push up on the leeward one, how you figure that all out. It seems like it's a surprise to a lot of people that um, particularly the Italian 26 team of Tito and Banti really have got it a lot more figured out than the other people and then everyone else is kind of scrapping to figure things out. Does that surprise you so quickly that one team can figure this out in foiling? Well I guess we're seeing all the teams, like we've only had this introduced since March so it's not that long ago, but all the teams are getting used to it and it's obviously a different technique. But really I guess um, for Ruggi and Katarina I guess you know they've gone from being Olympic gold medalists so they're already 90% there um, and now they've obviously adapted to the full foiling very quickly you know we see um, Ruji doing a lot of moth sailing as well so he's used to the foiling used to the speeds um, you know they're obviously sailing really well with their maneuvers uh, as well um, but yeah they've you know they're a, a class above the rest at the moment but they've you know the whole fleet sort of trying to work out what they're doing whether it's technique whether it's just boat speed um, you know what they're doing there's a lot of pe smart people watching them very closely is it one of those things in foiling, sometimes you can get too wrapped up in the details and there might be just some a bigger overall feel and philosophy in terms of how to approach the race course uh, when it's a, a fully foiling day or a marginal day? Yeah, I think so. But I, I think, you know, at this stage, there's a lot of technique. Um, there's a lot of just judging the boat speed as well, getting a feel for your boat speed, making sure that you're not foiling off into a corner really fast and low. Um, so you, you know, making very good VMG, getting closer to the women mark. Um, but yeah, I, I think there's, you know, there's a lot of feel and obviously those two have been sailing together for a while now um, since it's become foiling in the previous quad and they're obviously a really good team and, and they've got a good team behind them obviously as well with their, their maintenance for their, their foils and their boat in general. Cool. I know Australia has a really strong program. Um, Waterhouse and Darman and have really, you know, they're medalists and they've really shown, thrown their weight around, around the World Championships. What, um, what kind of cross training is everyone doing? And yourself too, are you doing things to get a better handle on the falling aspect and the upwind falling aspect? Yeah, well, I, I guess, well, for Jason's side, he's involved with the Sail GP, which is, you know, just a much more faster boat, but they're seeing all that technology filter down from Sail GP now into the NACRA 17 and same with the America's Cup. Um, and you know Lisa's involved with the in Sail GP as well with the commentary and sort of in touch with everything that's going on and you know I'm still doing um, the A class which is a foiling one man boat um, where there's a you know I guess we've seen all this the differential and stuff come through the A class before it's come to the, the NACRA 17 so we're all trying to stay in touch with what's going to be next, what the new developments are, and it's, it's been a big learning curve. Cool. And, you know, actually, you know, when all, all is said and done, it's still a sailboat race. And, uh, you know, is it, is it also pretty easy to get stuck in uh, just in, a, in the 
NACRA to be just practicing on straight line. Yeah, I, I you know, obviously it's still a, a sailboat race, but I think at the moment that speed is, is key. Um, but obviously you've got to be going fast in the right direction as well. So, you know, getting out there, doing your homework, working out what side of the course is working or whether it's, you know, the breeze is oscillating or whether it's just a simple sea breeze where it's a persistent shift type thing. So obviously you've got to have that down pat, but if you're fast, you're a genius. Yeah. You th I was just thinking about that as you were saying that the 49er class is 22 years old. Yep. And so a lot of stuff has been worked out. You know, and you're down to just the individual teams and that flow between them. And, uh, you know, they can focus focus a lot on the, you know, on the race course. Um, do you find as a coach that with this kind of complication of, um, you know, articulating rudders and the foiling upwind and, and the newness of it, that that kind of uh, gets in the way sometimes? You know, it's a little bit more complicated to coach? Uh, I guess it's just put in a whole new element that, you know, we, we have been working a lot on technique. Um, and we've seen a lot of new teams come up that weren't so competitive last quad, so, but they've been putting in the hours. And you can, you, really, you can see who's putting the hours this year. Um, they're the yeah. Okay, sorry, we seem to have lost the audio there in that interview with Darren Bundock. Um, the Australian NACRA coach. We, we are um, just coming up into the sequence for the, for the next start. So, in the sequence. Right, so the 49er flag is up. There goes the uniform flag, the U flag, the red and white checkered flag. That means that the race officer, David Campbell-James, is going to give them that slight get out that if there is a, a general recall... Um, then boats will be able to restart. Will that mean that we get away cleanly first time? Well, let's hope so. It's still a pretty harsh flag to fly. Let's hope that's that's good enough to to get the teams sorted out. So um, just coming back to the data analysis, Lisa, you've been looking at the last race. Now, if you were a coach and uh, you've just poured through the SAP sailing analytics data, um, I'm, actually, I'm going to do leaderboard first. That's just popped up. So just update you with... Look at the gap now. Because of what's happened to the Fantellas with the 21st in that race, they dropped down to third. And crucially for Lambrex and Van der Verken, um, who lead, they now have a 24-point gap. Now, if they maintain that 24-point gap to the Spanish, uh, that means that they would wrap this regatta up with a medal race to spare. But, of course, we've got two more races to go this afternoon. We've got another race tomorrow morning, and then we've got the medal race. Dunning and, Be uh, Dunning, Beck and, uh, and McCarty, the two uh, Kiwis are still in fourth and fifth. Bill Stein, Hussle in sixth. Wen and Liu with a second are now up to seventh. That is a phenomenal score for China. Eighth is Buxak and Vizbitsky and Ruel and Amaros from France. Crivelli, Visconti uh, bringing up the rear of the <coughs> top ten. So... Based on what you saw last time round, assuming we're going to get something similar this time round, Lisa, which way are you going to tell your sailors to go up the racetrack? Well, I mean, the thing is, is that as a coach, I never tell my sailors where to go because you want to make sure that they're actually watching the indicators of what's actually happening and uh, and they're making the assessment. But, um, you know, the... I want to be told. The Dutch, I want to be yeah. spoon-fed. <laughs> tell me, Lisa, the, I have my head full of spinnaker. Yeah, so the Dutch did a really good job of picking the right side, um, the correct side and the right side. They sailed a lot less distance. So they sailed fast, like we were talking about, but the Aust Austrians, actually, they won the, the, the left side. Um, they didn't come out on the left side as, as winning, though, because the left side just sailed more distance. They sailed all the way to the left corner, super, super fast, faster than the, than the Dutch, actually, but um, they sailed way more distance. So right to left, it was definitely a right pay. There was a, there, there was a little bit of a shift out there when the Dutch were coming back. Tiny little left hit at the top, but it didn't matter by that point because the Dutch were able to make the cross. The second beat was a lot more even. So again, each leg of the race and each race is its own race, so you've really got to be paying attention to what's going on in the moment. Well, it seems like the success of the right-hand side of this race course in the previous race has not gone unnoticed because yep. look how busy it is around the committee boat now. They are like bees around a honeypot. And the pit end was super popular last time round. Yeah, Bill Stein and Hussle, if they wanted it, could have the pit end all to themselves. 
for this start because it seems like things are a lot more popular. 45 seconds to go. Quickly, Lisa, can you just give us an analysis of bias on the line? The line is almost dead square right now. Um, you know, we've got uh, almost 14 knots. It's almost going straight down the race course. And again, we're going to see, I think, a little bit of a drag race, just like we did in the second beat where the Germans made a really good gainer just in the middle of the race course. So um, I think this one is going to be all about lanes. We see the Croatians. Woo, they are in traffic again, tacking over there by the, by the race committee boat, trying to make a little bit more space to lure it of them. Really neat double tack by the Croatians. We've got 10 seconds to go and New Zealand 18 got a really good spot USA 43 look like they're going to win the committee boat four three two one start I'm going to call it as clear I yeah. think that was okay and it's good starts for USA 43 who's going to try and pull the move that the uh, Dutch did so well last time around looks to me like Germany 22 has the best of the port tax starts potentially but good ones also by Belgium 24 and Australia 71 so this was the winning move last time. Belgium has got all the space in the world to put the bow down. That's Lefebvre and Pelsmakers. And uh, these are, we haven't spoken about them much so far in this competition, um, but they are perfectly capable of sailing this boat quickly. And they are in the box seat to go out to the right-hand side. Where are the Dutch? I thought we might see the Dutch have a have a similar strategy for this start. So I really like what the Dutch just did. Um, the the breeze clicked a little bit left right off the start and the Dutch you can actually see them on the on the screen there they're in the middle of the race course they started right at the pin on port so they're sailing um, the, the the left hand lift um, and uh, they made they made gainers on the um, uh, there they are right there they made gainers on a little bit of bias to the pin right at go and uh, and now they're trucking back out to the left to the right which is likely going to be the next shift um, so we'll see how they do with uh, with the rest of the boats who tacked off at the committee boat. So super adaptable. They're, they are not one trick ponies. Uh, the Dutch have again found a different way to get an incredible start off these really competitive start lines in the men's 49er fleet. The best 25 in the world competing against each other here in St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia. And the Dutch sailing out to the right hand side looking like they've got good control in the middle of the fleet with Croatia just on their, their windward hip. You can see Croatia 83 also uh, with a good line out towards the right hand side. So now the, the Dutch and the Croatians are in a good speed race against each other with, with plenty of others still in play in the, the early stages of this race. Yeah, I mean, the, the front row of this start, everybody pretty much is on port. Um, all sailing in this in this uh, this left shift. Um, as it clicks a little bit further left, um, the boats over here, the Germans and the Croatians and the Spanish are all looking quite good. Um, but the Dutch, uh, moments ago, were tracking like they were leading. So just think about this. They ducked a number of boats who were on starboard tack to start, and then within within seconds, they're in the lead. Um, so. Uh, really interesting tactics on uh, on those port starts. But it is very early days. It's a very, very even line. It's almost like the boats all did a gate start on, on port tack. I mean, this, this is in incredibly competitive in the fleet right now. Yeah. Poland 7, looking good. Further along the line, USA 43 struggling to stay in the front row. And Belgium 24, they're in the position that Netherlands 1 was in in the previous race. How well can Lefebvre and Pelsmakers um, work this position from the far right-hand side of the course? I think they've got cause for concern with Germany 22, who look a little bit poked out on them. I, th I think Germany 22 are also looking very strong going out towards this side. Yeah, you can see the Belgians here. They look like they've got... Um the Germans look like they've got a little bit of a tighter leech. They're holding a little bit more pressure than the Belgians. The Belgians may be losing a little bit of height on the Germans. So VMG, velocity made good towards the mark. I would tend to give this to the Germans over the Belgians, just based on their setup and their ability to hold height and speed. Um, and the Germans are looking really nice out here. But, I mean, it is, it's bow even all the way across. Through the Dutch, you can see there in that shot, and all the way over to the boat's... Um, who are coming up on the left. This is a drag race. 
and uh, it's all going to come down to execution on the tack and, um, and, and your lane holding when you're coming into the mark, which they're all going to be doing pretty soon because we're getting close to that right-hand corner. And what's your impression about the, the top mark? My feeling was that there was a bit of adverse current, and that was making it a little bit difficult to, to get past the mark on the starboard ley line. Yeah, I mean, there, there definitely could be. The chop also is going to be making the maneuvers a little bit hard, um, and uh, it's going to kick the bow around, and, uh, and to reestablish your flow. Yeah, you can see the Belgians just slamming into the chop just before they go into their tack, and now, again, jumping up and down. We call that hobby horsing, and you really want to try to avoid that as much as possible. You can see the boats as they start to move um, and, and get their flow back, the boats settle down quite a bit more than they did in that tack. Yeah, yeah. So minimize the hobby horsing as much as possible. And partly that's choosing where you tack, choosing your moment to tack. But it seemed like Belgium was waiting to tack as soon as the Germans tacked. So they were looking over their shoulder, waiting for Germany 2022, sorry, 22 to tack. Um, that is uh, Jakob Megendorfer and Andreas Spranger in Germany 22, who were sailing really, really well with Croatia 83 coming out behind Belgium 24, so going further up to the right-hand side and the Fantellas, uh, the most extreme right-hand boat at the moment. Yeah, so these boats aren't quite on the ley line. The Croatians may be close, um, but, uh, but I think they're leaving a little bit in the bank um, just in case they get, um, they get some more shifts here. It is very close racing here, and really it's, it's all about their technique and speed at this point because... You can see the Dutch are just making little tiny gains on the boats around them. And the, the Polish, just above the Dutch, are doing very well in their lane as well. Yes, they are, aren't they? That is uh, uh, Lukas Cibatek and Jacek Piasecki. And, go, sorry, yeah, that's right. Uh, Cibatek and Piasecki going really, really well uh, just to windward of the Dutch. And the Polish are a tight squad. They work well, really well together. They've been in the 49er game since the very beginning for 25 years and um, a lot of depth in the, in the Polish squad. And at the moment, Chibatek and Piasecki making it stick. Storch and Staniel also up there as well. So Poland going well, Belgium going well, and a different German team from the, the last race also going well. That's Jakob Megendorfer and Andreas Spranger. They're currently um, just outside the cut for the top 10. So... This is a crucial performance by Germany 2020, sorry, 22, if they want to make it into the top 10 tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, they've been having a really good day. Cl clearly, they've got their, uh, their modes lined up really well. I mean, I think their setup looks nice. They're able to hold nice power and height, and, uh, and they're going really well. So, Lisa, as we predicted, it is going to be a game of... Uh, centimeters or inches, whichever measurement you prefer. It, it's all about the tiny detail today, isn't it? It really is. I mean, the lead c just keeps flipping back and forth between the boats on the right, the boats on the left, the boats that are poking out in the middle, which really tells you that it's quite an even race course. And there are some small shifts in there, but nothing that's going to, uh, going to wind the uh, boats around. Like we saw in that first leg of the, of the first race, that was the only one that really... Uh, really had a, a, a big gainer for the Chinese and the Dutch um, over the rest of the group that went out to the left. Right now, it's a game of inches, and uh, this mark rounding is going to be really crucial. These boats are going to round in a lot of traffic. Um, there's going to be some, some big ducks by some of the boats coming in on the port, like the, the, Austri the Austrians, the Spanish. Um, you know, they're going to have to manage their lanes coming in in this traffic. Okay, so not far from the windward mark now, and uh, now is the moment of truth to, to see which, uh, who has played it smartest in, in this really, really tightly fought game. Chibatek and Piasecki nominally in the lead, uh, but we won't really know that until we see the final approach to the windward mark. It looks like... Oh, they're, they're getting a lift into the mark right now. The right is starting to pay. Um, they looked like they weren't going to make the mark, and they've just switched into high mode. You can see them coming right up under the Germans, trying to get on their line. They're squeezing everything out of their mainsail they can to make that mark. That, that, um, that shift was huge for the Polish right there. 
They're going to reduce a maneuver over the Dutch that they were almost bow even with. And uh, they're going to turn what could have been a second or a third into a uh, first rounding. So the poles about to go round in first place with just a few boat lengths lead. How's it going to go for the hoist? And they're going to jibe set. Oh, no, they're not going to jibe set. They're going to keep going. And Belgium going round again. I'd be surprised if we see any jibe sets in this yeah. early stage, although you did say there was a big lift there, so that would be a reason perhaps to do it. Germany going round in third place, closely followed by Croatia, who really overstood coming into that, but it served them well just ahead of the Dutch, who are in fifth. Uh, but the Dutch still really, really solid. Australia following round, then New Zealand 18, and then Spain 74, also one of the leading contenders for this world championship mm -hmm. at the moment. And look at the Port Tackers coming through. What kind of traffic are they going to have to deal with as they come up to the Wimmer Mark, only just avoiding the starboard drivers? This could get messy, particularly for the second boat, the Danish boat. Is there any room in there? Surely not. Was there a bounce of the Luatilla extension as they went across the starboard boat, the New Zealand 45? That is a very, very yeah. sketchy rounding by Denmark 3 right there. there. There may have been, but they would have been coming into that mark asking for the cross. And, you know, the New Zealanders would have been happy to give it to them. Go, 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 go. Don't slam it in there. And the Danish did exactly what they needed to do. Get across, tack above everybody, don't foul, and just make sure that they get around the race course. That was, that was probably some, some, some good yeah. communication between those boats to make sure that somebody didn't make a mistake and uh, really make that dicey for everybody involved. And, and, and is that a beer that they, the Danes have to buy for the Kiwis further down the line, maybe tomorrow after the event's over? Yeah, potentially. But, you know, if I was the Kiwis, I would have been happy that they would have been asking for the cross and they would have taken it. So that was, uh, you know, that's just good sailing all in all for both of them. Yeah, I was reminded of that recently, um, sailing in a 450-boat regatta at Chichester Harbour, that... Um, that weekend warriors sometimes a little bit too aggressive on the port starboard calls. They they do it because they can, not because it's good for anybody. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and and so what the Danes did there and the Kiwis, that was good sailing for keeping the boats clear, just getting around the mark, making sure that there's no major foul and that, you know, you're just you're you're not you're not calling starboard because you can. You're making sure that you keep clear so that you can race your own race. Now, Chris, you're up from the boat park uh, for a moment. And um, before you, you go down there, I just want to catch you. Uh, you've done a really good interview with the Chinese. Um, I'm not sure if we're going to get a chance to play that. If we don't, I just want to get your view on, on what's going on with the Chinese. How is it that, um, that China was able to come second, Wen and Liu second in that race just now? They are competing at world-class level. Yeah, that's fish and CC, fish skipper and CC crew. And uh, even I'd be sitting here qualifying for a goal in the 49er, I would, would have said you were, you were having me on. And, uh, and he literally got a little emotional in that interview, thinking about where he was right now, kind of that honor. You know, the, China has been kind of insular like they, they can be. Another nation, a big nation, but they're going south of that mark during the pandemic, especially. But they've done a really great job. Uh, YQ, their coach, has coached the Singaporean team at the Olympic level, women and men. And a lot of experience, and they brought in their first ever <laughs> from Finland uh, to coach them as well. So they've, they've been doing their thing, they've been putting their hours in, and just to let you know, you know, they've also just been so sub reading on this boat. They read books, they read articles, they watch on all these videos that we put on, they watch them and put them in the book. So uh, for all those young sailors out there who are kind of at home during the winter in their countries, uh, there's a lot to be learned. Right, okay. Well, Chris, thank you very much for that. And I'm constantly fascinated by how well the Chinese are doing, not just in the, the 49er men, but also in the other two fleets here, the 49er FX. Uh, we've, we've seen them win races this week for the first time ever in the FX, and they're also doing very well in the NACRA. Meanwhile, Lisa, uh, update us on the situation as Poland 7 approaches the Leward Gate. Yeah, so um, the Polish have done a really good job of managing uh, the traffic um, around them, um, you know, they jived basically bow even with the boats behind them in Croatia and Germany. You don't want to give somebody too much distance um, uh, to the inside so that they can come down and take your breeze. 
And uh, now you can see that they're going to round and go out to the right with the, uh, with the Belgians really close behind. And the Belgians really benefited from that last big righty that happened right up there on, on the, uh, right before the, uh, the, win, the windward mark. We're going to see some boats coming in here from the right. There were boats that jibe set into that righty, and they've made some gains um, on the rest of the fleet. Um, and they're going to be coming in on starboard tack and able to, uh, to make some gains, I think, on this downwind. So Fantella's going out to the right and the Dutch going out to the left. I think this is the first time we've seen the Dutch go out to the left. They've generally favoured going to the right-hand side, but this might, might be a short-term play before they tack over to the to the right-hand side. But as ever, I'm thinking in terms of corners. Lisa, what are you thinking in terms of? Uh, I'm thinking still a little bit in terms of shift, and I think uh, right now um, these these athletes may be rounding in a little bit of a, of a right phase. Um, and so uh, you can see the Germans and the Dutch may be trying to get a, a decent down number before they tack back and, uh, and make their way back over to the, to the right-hand boats. China going round to the left, Denmark going round to the right. It was Denmark that just got away with that port tack cross at the wind of Mark a few minutes ago. Meanwhile, the Dutch have tacked on to uh, port tack. They're just kept going through the last bit of the traffic, but uh, the Dutch have got their clear lane going out to the... To That's the, the British, actually. Oh, sorry, it's the you British. You can see the Dutch, they, so they, they actually got a nice shift out there and they're coming back across. So they're going to be hoping that that holds for a little while. While they, uh, while they limit the distance between them and the, the, uh, the Belgians and the Polish who, uh, who have not tacked yet out going out right. So Germany and the Dutch now on port tack going across the right hand side. Spain 74 has done a double quick double tack actually so that was just to clear their air. So pretty much all the fleet seems to think there is something in this right hand side. I, I, Dare yep. to suggest, Lisa. I think so, yeah. Um, you know, I think some of the boats, again, are trying to get that clear lane, trying to be able to sail their own race a little bit. And, uh, but yeah, there's, there's definitely something in the water over there on the right. And, uh, and we can just see right now, the boats are slowly starting to track back down from that left shift that Germany tacked on. Seems like the left shifts are just a little bit, um, a little bit quicker. And it's harder to use them to, to, to get back in touch, whereas the right shifts seem to be a little bit longer, a little bit bigger, more punchy, and, uh, and so you can use those a little bit more to your tactical advantage. Chiba Tech and Piaseki firing along here. Really good conditions. It looks like the breeze has picked up a little bit more. I don't know if it's just this camera angle, but it looks like good breeze right now. Yeah, it's, it's in around 13, 14 knots, nice and steady. You know the, uh, the the breeze isn't dipping much at all, um, and we're we're you know we're seeing um, we're seeing uh, um, degrees shifts between you know kind of 10, 10, 10 degrees or so, so not huge. Um, so these athletes are really able to dial into their lane, have some patience, and and uh, and really just sail sail fast. Slight bit of body separation between the two of them there. We see other teams standing a little bit closer together. Chris, what's, what's your take on it? You know, it's, it's, you know, a couple Polish teams kind of scattered throughout the gold fleet. And, you know, I've been kind of surprised that we haven't seen them up in the top five as much as they could have been. You know, I just think that the legacy, you know, of uh, sailors like Pavel Kolodzinski, you know, multiple time Olympian, big hero in his country. Now he's working on junior sailing initiatives in Poland. Um, such a strong team, such a strong contingent from Poland. This is now they're right up where they, what I would say, where they should be and where Pavel is really hoping that where they would be. I know they're watching very closely in Poland right now, but we shouldn't be surprised to see these teams at the top of the fleet. Yeah, and so good to see them coming on strong in this particular race. And um, if you put all the best Polish performances together this week, you probably have a, a really good set of scores. But unfortunately for the Poles, they're each of the, the teams in the squad are showing versa performance. It's a matter of how you put it together across the whole week. That's the real challenge. Poland now on starboard tack, crossing Croatia 83. Belgium 24, still going further out to the right-hand side, prepared to uh, keep that separation going for the rest of the fleet. And, and behind them, Lisa, actually, that's not a bad thing for Belgium to do because the fleet is coming their way. 
Yeah, so they didn't really, <coughs> excuse me, they didn't really take too much of a risk. Belgium, they're kind of in the same spot that they were um, going up the going up the um, the last beat, just not willing to give away any leverage to the to the right by anybody, and happy to be that 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 higher end uh, boat almost on the ley line early. I think they, yeah, they may be able to make that make the mark from where they are right there. Um, Poland's in a really nice spot, and uh, and now they can choose as they as they start to approach the mark whether or not they want to lead back, and they think it's going to fall a little bit left. Um, and in that case, they're going to stay closer to the mark, or if they think that it it might wind a little bit more right, or they might be a little bit more of that right pressure. In which case, they'll tack out and come a little bit closer in front of the Belgians to limit their leverage and any gainer that they can make. Belgium closest to camera, Croatia just behind them. And out to the right are race leaders, Poland 7, who must be thinking about um, how they're going to execute the next two tacks. It could be, as Lisa said, that Belgium is on their final approach. No more tacks for the Belgians if they've judged this ley line correctly as, as they just leap over a couple of particularly big choppy waves. Um, Chris, uh, what's your what's your take on uh, these conditions in St Margaret's Bay? It it is a it, it's a boat speed track, isn't it? Right. Well, a bunch of things are going through my mind right now. We've been talking a lot, comparing against a NACRA class, which is kind of new. How how really established this class is, and how in the coaching they can really uh, focus on the race course. So the differences. I mean, I don't envy both of you uh, commentating on these races because it's such my minute differences. Uh, the one thing that I like to see here is Megendorfer and Sprenger. You know, we talked about the um, Highland Plusel, who didn't even make the Gold Fleet. So this team has been sailing in, you know, in their shadow. So it's nice to see them up there too. So getting close to the top end of the Wimmer Mark, the, the poles attacked. They have got one more attack to execute. So now it has Belgium got a piece of them? It looks like Belgium would have a piece of them but the, maybe they've overtaken the ley line yeah the... it looks like the pole the poles have been sailing a little bit higher than the belgians uh the whole time so i think and the belgians did make quite a bit of gainer on the polish as we were going in so i think again the poles are their worry is all the way up on their hip um they didn't want to lead out to the left because it doesn't seem like anything is going to be um, happening for anybody out there and uh, and they wanted to minimize their risk and it was getting to be um, a little bit of uh, of a bigger risk and you can see here that how bow even they actually are um, the Croatians if they get any more right the Croatians may be an issue with uh, being able to squeeze in here on the mark so it'll be interesting to see where they are on the ley line as they approach the mark yeah, well, that would be interesting and, and uh, a real game for Croatia if they can make this in one and a real giveaway for Belgium. But Belgium don't seem to be putting the bow down much yet. So um, it seems like Belgium's still pretty happy with the angle that they're sailing. Yeah, and they're, they're ever so slightly uh, a little bit faster than the other two. The other two, I think, are trying to squeeze out and trying to make that mark. And the Belgians are a little bit fat on the ley line and they're going fast. So... Um, differences in speed here. The Belgians are going kind of 9.4. Um, and uh, I think that was... Uh... The Belgians doing 9.4. Then we, we've got uh, Poland 7 and Croatia 83. So if we can get the respective speeds of those boats, that yeah, would so, be... An... So the Belgians are, are, are consistently um, actually closer, more closer to 10. And the other two are in the, uh, the mid 9, 9 knot range. So they are sailing a little bit higher and slower, trying to make the mark, and the Belgians are charging um, almost half a knot faster than the rest of them. Okay, so the Belgians, have they judged this ley line to perfection? It looks like they have done. The other two have to put in two extra tacks, and so this plays into the hands of Yannick Lefebvre and Tom Pelsmakers. Uh, they picked a really, really good ley line and they're rewarded with a good healthy lead of about six or seven boat lengths right now as the Red Jenica goes up and that's a lead change as Chibatek and Piasecki are now back in second and fighting off the close attention of the Fantella brothers from Croatia. Croatia's got to be really happy with this execution. Um, you know, 
get the get all of that uh, out of their system from the first race and then come out here and execute a really nice race so far in the in the second race of the day. Meanwhile, holding fifth just behind uh, Germany's uh, Megendorfer and Spranger, it's the Dutch leading this regatta. They won the previous race and fifth is not at all shabby. They keep on slotting in scores like this. They are going to be unbeatable for the World Championship. Yeah, you know, we kind of questioned uh, the rounding there, but um, they didn't lose too much, um, you know, uh, doing that early hitch out to the, out to the left. Um, and they did a good job of getting back out on a strong um, right lay line um, approaching the mark, which seems to be where you wanted to be. Yeah, it, it didn't hurt them too badly, but I, I feel like any moves that you make to the left, I, 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 I feel like it feels risky. It's starting to feel risky not being in the right-hand corner. Yeah, top right-hand corner for sure, yeah. I think, uh, and that's the thing is that, you know, with tight fleets, if you're not making the move early, it's hard to get there. And, uh, and so it just seems like we're, we're getting consistent um, right pressure up on the right hand side and that may be um, proximity to the, to the mouth of the bay and, uh, and some sort of a, a winder off there. Um, not really sure at this point, but uh, it does seem to be consistent that you're getting a nice little pressure and shift up there on the right. Yannick Lefebvre and Tom Pelsmakers doing really well at the uh, front of this race. I'm just trying to identify who we've got here, whether that was the Fantellas, it might have been another team. That was the Polish. Okay, so that was uh, a book second Wyszbitski, Poland 5 that we were on board with then, I think. So Lefebvre and Pelsmakers, they put in the jibe onto port and really big lead now, more than 120 meters on Chibatek and Piasecki who need to watch out for the Fantellas. The Fantellas, the 2018 world champions in the 49er, ready to pounce and, and take another place in this race if they possibly can. And the, the Polish are doing um, an identical job to what they did on the last race. Here they are, they're just waiting a little bit longer um, to, uh, to jive back over towards the mark and letting some people go um, more into the middle of the race course before they take their step um, down towards the finish. So we'll see how that uh, plays out for them um, as, we approach, um, as we approach the finish. You can see the boat bumping up and down over the waves. The Belgian boat absolutely firing along. And as usual, once a boat in this Gold Fleet gets out in front, such as the, the depth of quality in this fleet, um, it's so easy at the front. We haven't really seen much of this Belgian team, but they're, they're one of these teams that have got the raw speed. And uh, if, they can, if they can get the distance on the rest of the fleet, they can't be caught. Yeah, and I mean, that's testament to the depth of this fleet. You know, they're currently in 21st, um, but anybody in this gold fleet pretty well, if they can get some room to move and they can make a couple of good decisions, then, you know, they can win a race. Uh, the, uh, the Dutch are in fifth right now. They've, they've sold a, a good, solid, conservative race. Wh which race should they be more proud of? Running away with a race win earlier... Or, or getting a very sort of solid fifth place in, in the pack here? Well, I mean, you know, uh, I think they had a little bit of a tough time uh, managing the top of the first beat, which is, I think, what sucked them back into the, into the pack. Um, and uh, I think they're going to probably stay out of the middle of the race course in this next one, I think, if, uh, you know, um, we'll, see how, we'll see how they do. But, um, you know... Execution wise, you know, um, I think they'll probably feel a little bit better about their, their choices and their speed in the first race, to be honest. Um, and this one, I think, might feel like a little bit of a slog for them. Well, this is a moment to savor for Lefebvre and Pelsmakers from Belgium. They're about to cross the line of race 13 and take their first race win of this event. So congratulations to the Belgians. Really well executed race particularly on the second beat when they decided to stick to their guns, go a little bit further right than their rivals, and they took the lead off Chibatek and Piasecki from Poland, and they deservedly take the race win. 160 metres back, Chibatek and Piasecki hold on for second, and uh, they come in clearly ahead of the Fantella brothers with... Um, who This is the Fantellas we're on board with now, Jimmy and Miho Miho on the left. Just pulling themselves up on the trapeze, running in, and they finish that race in third place. 
with Germany's Megendorfer and Spranger in fourth and a tight race for fifth. Will the Dutch, the world champions, be able to hold on ahead of McCarty and McKenzie because that's been a really good gain for the New Zealanders on that rundown. Actually, I think that was an Australian boat. I think it was an Australian boat um, in uh, who were just about to uh, take it from Lambrex and van der Verken. But that's fifth place for the series leaders and they are going to consolidate that uh, that lead at the top of the leaderboard. Spain in eighth. They're still very much in with the shout of a podium, but the uh, the dream of a gold medal here for the Spanish team is beginning to slip away. And Wen and Liu from China, second in the previous race, ninth in this. The uh, the Chinese charge in 49er racing continues. Yeah, yeah, solid race for them. Interestingly enough, it seems like both. Both corners of this downwind seem to be paying. The Polish did a really nice job of holding on to their lane and establishing their position, and that was fast. The Dutch actually lost a little bit by jibing into the middle, and uh, the boats that did an early jibe set, um, the, the British there, they made some gainers just by staying outside, clear air, and, uh, and coming in with pressure on either side of the race course. Okay, so that was race 13. Um, I wonder if we've got time to watch the uh, the interview that Chris did uh, with the Chinese sailors um, and I'm just trying to see which one that is that's uh, interview 29 so if we can go to um, interview 29 with the Chinese that would be great to get now welcome back to the 2022 world championships in the 49er day four long day Gold Fleet, I'm with Team China, and I'll just try to make this happen. The crew in the 49er TT, we have Fish, and we have YQ, the coach, who also coached Singapore for a while, and then we have Joyce, our interpreter, and then I'm Chris, of course. So um, what we're gonna do is we're gonna hand this over to Joyce for a little bit to also do a little introduction, and then we have a couple questions for everyone. Am I writing saying maybe YQ, you know this, that this is the first time a Chinese 49er team has qualified for the Gold Fleet at a World Championship. Yeah. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Awesome, that's fantastic. Also what happened this week is, I think this is correct as well, first ever uh, 49er FX uh, first place uh, at, the, at a World Championship as well for Team China for the women, and they're just shredding over there in that fleet as well. So a lot of firsts for uh, Team China, and I'll pass it over to Joyce before I ask my question. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Um, so maybe just a little introduction to the, uh, to the team okay. and some of the team titles that uh, YQ is talking about too. Yeah, sounds good. Hello everyone, my name is Joyce, and then beside me, we have Chinese sailing team that's from the Chinese Yan Association, CYA. And beside me, there's uh, YQ, uh, Mr. Zhang Yongqiang. Uh, he is the head coach of the 49er, 49er FX and the NACA 17 team. Uh, beside this, uh, fish Wen Zai Ding uh, is our um, 49er athletes and Liu Tian also 49er athletes. So Chris, thank you. Great. So we talked about our questions a little beforehand because we want to get the translations correct. But the first question was: We know that the Chinese uh, 49er teams uh, train mostly in China, and a lot of the teams here at the World Championships spend a lot of the year training in Europe with other nations. And so when Team China shows up, they haven't gotten to see as much of each other except at some of the other big regattas. And, and right away, you know, one big achievement for a nation is to qualify for the Gold Fleet in the 49er Worlds. And right away, this team does that. And the other, the other teams are like, wow, we haven't seen a lot of you. How'd you do that? So um, we just wanted to ask the question, um, what has Team China been doing in their home waters? Who have they been training with? And, and what are some of the secrets to get getting this country so quickly up to speed. Okay. Uh, Chris, 对大家的第一个问题呢就是说在这次世界锦标赛之前中国队其实并没有出现在其他的大的国际赛事上那中国队一直都是在自己训练比较多但是其他的各个欧洲国家都有在欧洲一起训练很多次所以大家就非常的好
参加这样大的国际赛事，就打进了啊四十九人的金组。我们是怎么做到的？有什么秘诀跟大家分享一下？张教练，哎、呃，其实我们训练很刻苦，大家我们在一起的，经常在一起研究、学习，通过录像，通过。呃，书本通过呃朋友一些知识，呃，我们大家伙儿在一起，我们训练很哈，不是很很很努力，很努力，每天都很训训练，所以就这样了。Yeah. Uh, so, uh, YQ is saying, uh, everyone has been training very hard, both the coaches and the athletes. They've definitely learned a lot from, uh, let's say, videotaping from the. Uh, the textbooks from all the materials and then also from their friends that's in this industry around the world and then basically it's hardworking that's pulling up this um, uh, nice result here. 还有一个很重要的就是呃中国帆船协会对我们大力支持我们成立了那个国家队以后呃对我们的后勤各方面保障起到了一个关键性的作用。And he says, secondly, is a very strong support from the Chinese Yacht Association, and to form this uh, team, this uh, first ever uh, 49er, 49er FX and Nakra team, they provided lots of uh, behind-the-scenes supports to make this happen. Awesome, that's fantastic. And the next question is for the sailors. Uh, the you know the one thing that we know that when I've watched nations either qualify for the gold fleet or win a race, first race for their nation at a world championships, and it's a sorry, it's a huge benchmark uh, for a nation and for the sailors. I just wanted to ask the sailors. Um, you know, I don't know if you're thinking in a, about it this way as a big deal for your nation. You're just sailing really hard and and trying your best and following the progression that YQ is helping you with. Um, but how does that feel to know that you qualified the nation in the 49er, this really important Olympic class, um, you know, qualified for the gold fleet for the first time? Thank you, Chris. Uh, Chris 的问题呢，就是说我们呃，作为从运动员的角度，呃。第一次能够代表中国打进了这这样大的一个国际赛事的四十九人的金组，呃，大家是一种什么样的感受？因为不管是对任何一个国家，能代表自己的国家打进金组来说，都是一件非常大的事情，然后也是一个非常大的呃节点。所以他想听一听大家的心情和大家的感受，呃，每个人都分享一下吧。先给。首先就是还是非常激动吧，然后还有开心，嗯，有些难以想象。可能放到几个月之前，如果说我能够进入金组，我可能自己都不会相信。好了。So Fish was talking about first of all, very excited and happy, and then also a little bit hard for himself to believe that they already.、Um, I sailed this far along of、uh, breaking into the gold fleet.、Uh, if it's、um, let's say a couple months ago, they wouldn't believe themselves that they can make this far. Yeah, um, very, very happy. We entered the gold fleet. Then we now just want to enjoy the competition in it. Learn more skills. So TT was talking about first of all, definitely very happy to break into the gold fleet, and most importantly,、uh, he he really wants to just enjoy the process of this regatta, and then learn from all the other peers, all the other sailors around the world, and then try to improve on the skills in the future. Great. Well, thank you so much. That's fantastic. It is a big deal, but I know you have to focus. There's a lot more racing left. There is a top ten to qualify for, so that would be a big first too for any 49er sailor.、Uh, so thank you, Joyce. Thank you, YQ, Fish, and TT. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. We're excited to keep watching you, and we'll go back to the studio and keep walking the docks、uh, tomorrow and day five. Chris. TT standing next to you. He looks like if the fin was still around, he he could have been sailing a fin. But of course, the 49 is here, and he'd much rather be doing that. Oh、uh, yeah, he's excellent. And, and you know, we can't draw any major stereotypes, but he's one of the tallest crews in the fleet. And you know, a lot of the other sailors, you know, from China are you know a little bit shorter. But the FX crews, one of the FX crews, is really tall. 
And uh, so they've got some great leverage on their side. And we know that's a, uh, a serious competitive advantage. So they have something going for them. But um, Lisa, you know, you we can go on to my question for you in a second. But you had some statistics on the Chinese. Yeah, so uh, I was just looking at some of the stats from that last race. And uh, the Polish and the Chinese, identical in speed around the race course, both the fastest boats out there. Um, and the Chinese really saved their race by sending it up the second, uh, the second beat of that course. They went out to the right. They had three maneuvers, and they were by far the fastest. There were only two boats that broke an average speed of 10 knots, and the Chinese were 10.4 knots, and the next closest boat was uh, 10.05. So the Chinese just sent it over to the right, and uh, they passed four boats basically just by speed alone. So that was a great, great uh, beat for them and a, and a good save in the race. Chris, I, I know there's something you, uh, you want to ask Lisa about, but let's look at the leaderboard and update ourselves with the situation after the end of race 13. So Van der Verken, 47 to Spain's 74. It just keeps on getting better and better for the Netherlands. Van Teller's closing the gap on second place, now, now in third, but only four points behind the Spanish. The Kiwis still in fourth and fifth, but they've done a swap around with McCarty and McKenzie's sixth place, lifting them to fourth ahead of Dunning, Beck and Gunn, who got a 21st in that race. Bildstein and Hussel, I think they might be up a place as well. Uh, Chibatek and Piasecki, second in that race, nearly won that race in seventh place. Wen and Liu, they are up a place in eighth with uh, a two and a nine from today so far. Fastest boat on the racetrack for the Chinese. Megendorfer and Spranger from Germany. Great finish for them with a fourth place in that race, lifting them to ninth. And then another Polish team, Buksak and Wierzbicki, in tenth. Just uh, looking at those scores, um, the, uh, the drop is going to be a, a big deal, I think, for some of these boats, um, giving them a little bit of, uh, of wiggle room. There's a couple of boats there that have a really small drop. And so uh, you may see some of those boats get a little bit more aggressive here in the last few races leading into the, uh, into the medal race. Okay, now, Chris, over to you. I know you've, you're burning to ask Lisa a question. Well, I mean, the one thing that I really enjoy sitting with someone in the booth with, like Lisa, is that she just is like everyone we're watching. So, you know, we have to give some credit where credit is due. Lisa, you've been to two Olympic Games, and uh, there are a couple of your former competitors here racing, actually. And the one thing I want to ask you is, in these fleets, do the, um, you know, you have the Fantella brothers, you have Bildstein and Husserl, who've done many world championships. Do you ever uh, feel like you have to pace yourself in these things? You can't always be grabbing opportunities. You have to be accepting what's coming at you and just being um, steady Eddie for a little while. I mean, are, do, you, do you gauge the, gauge the vibe of the fleet? Do you gauge the vibe of the fleet and decide, you know, we're going to either be going for it and grabbing opportunities or we just have to, um, you know, keep things consistent? Yeah. So, I mean, it really, it, it depends on where you are on the, it, in the series and also how your, um, how your series has been shaping up. And that's, and that's, you know, really seasoned competitors are really good at sailing a series and, uh, you know, and they, they take it slow and steady. They put it all together. Um, you know, I keep going back to Anna Tunnicliffe cause she's a great competitor. She won a gold medal without winning a race. And so, you know, I mean, there's, there's, you know, um, there's lots to be said for being able to lock up a gold medal before you go into the, uh, into the medal race. Like it looks like we might have here. Um, but for sure the seasoned competitors, you know, they're, constantly risk risk assessing it's like a poker game you know you know your risk you know where it is and you know how that's going to play out in your series and that's what you're really doing on, on a regular basis during the during the race course okay two minutes to go to the start of the next race uh, lisa i just want to tee you up to uh, do a bit of an analysis on the start line which end you think might be biased while we do that let's just update ourselves with what's going on on the 49 fx race course this is new to me as well. I've not been looking at this until today. So, um, no, we no, we can't see the. Uh, oh, we can see the FX. Okay, so th there we are. Van Anhalt and Dutz uh, with a first place in in that race, and then eighth for Bobek and Netzer. So look how those two are stretching away. But the the Dutch are very much in the box seat. So the Dutch leading the 49er men, 
and leading the 49er FX. Okay, back to the start. Lisa, which end are you going to pick for me? Yeah, so the, the line is, is quite square. Um, there's a little port bias, um, you know, maybe because the right has been paying. I think yesterday the race committee was, was looking at setting up a, um, a committee committee end line to keep the sailors all the way down the line. I think now they might be trying to set up a little bit of a port bias to get the fleet all the way down the line so that we don't have a big crowd. We're seeing a big crowd anyway. Um, that means there is free money at the, the port and port pin end of the line and there's hardly anyone up there. So um, if you can have a look and see who you think might be lining up for pin end start, I'm wondering if they are going to do well out of this because well, it's looking super busy down here. Can, can you guess who's on port at the pin right now? Ned one. Ned one. There you go. You got it. So there's a few port tackers looking to take advantage of that pin bias. It's only a slight pin bias, but if they can get across those starboard tackers, they're going to be looking really good going into the right. 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, go. And it's a clear start, but no one's very fast off the end of this line, which means is the port tack boat going to be able to cross everybody? It looks like China's going to stop a clear port tack start. But Netherlands 1, if you look top right of your screen, they are trying their best to, to get through the fleet. They, they're going to have to duck a few. So it's not that clean a start for the Netherlands at the far end. But it won't matter if in 10 seconds time they can find a clear lane through there. But it looks very good for Germany 22 on the right of your picture. A good start for USA 43. Netherlands 1, can they cross Italy Ooh, 88? Just about. So Netherlands 1, just about squeak into a clean start with New Zealand 18 also looking good to windward of them. So the Dutch have just about got away with it. Lisa, what do you make of it? Yeah, so I think the Dutch, I thought that the fleet was give, giving it away to them, but they were a little bit late ducking that, that pinboat, and they, you know, it's a game of inches, especially when you're trying to cross the fleet on port right off the start. And I think they gave it away a little bit by being, you know, I, I would say that they were about two or three seconds late ducking, ducking the, uh, the pinboat. And uh, that might have made the difference in those first couple of crosses. Um, and then it was really tight. I bet you there was some words being said between, uh, between the Dutch and the, and, the, and the Italians coming across there. So uh, we'll see if, uh, if that ends up moving into the room after this race. Or well, as an Italian that's, that's not really in contention for the world title, do you start to give a bit of respect to the, to the leader and, and sort of give them a bit of a room on a marginal call because they're fighting for a world title and you're not? Um, you, you may, it depends on what type of competitor you are. Um, but, uh, at the end of the day, you know, everybody's out there to, uh, to prove it, prove themselves to the, to themselves and to, uh, to everybody else. And, uh, you know, it, it's, um, it was hard to see how close that was as far as the, you know, whether or not they were moving the helm. Um, but, uh, you don't want to be giving away that to those type of things too much because um, then people are going to kind of just expect that uh, you're going to give it away all the time. Yeah, you don't want to be seen as soft, do you? Um, I, I really like the way that New Zealand 18 is going right now. That's Isaac McHardy and William McKenzie. They look like they've got the measure of the Dutch in terms of boat speed. I, I don't know what you think, Chris. Uh, just, just looking at the Kiwis there, I, I, I have them going a little click higher than the, uh, the Dutch boat. Oh, absolutely. The New Zealand teams have been pushing each other really hard. I mean, uh, uh, both of these teams, uh, McCarty and McKenzie and Dunning Beck and Gunn, they've been, they've been behind the shadows of the best you know, team of their generation. So Peter Burling and Blair Took. So, I mean, it, let's not forget that they have a lot of that mojo that came from their country, even though they start to uh, they sail in a, such an a isolated place. So I, I'm sure right now they're definitely a little bit higher and probably same speed, so net gaining. Lisa, what's your take on those two? Yeah, so the Dutch are in a little bit of a New Zealand sandwich. You can see the boat that's below them is the New Zealand's uh, teammate, and uh, they're really struggling to keep their height on both of them, um, not able to get the bow down, get the foils working for them, and get their speed up, and uh, both New Zealand teams are walking away from them right now. Right, so the Dutch struggling to live in the middle of that NZL sandwich right now, but it's looking very good for Croatia, for the Fantella brothers. They look like they are the best of the boats out on this right-hand side of the race course. Uh, China, 3-4-9, really good start at the pin end. 
Um, we know that they're fast, but they're on the, uh, the, the far left of the race course, making tracks over to the right with the majority of the boats at the moment. But Croatia looking particularly good. Yeah, so these boats here all started on port, um, and they just fired it off to the uh, to the right. Um, they didn't have a lot of tacks. A lot of the boats that you can see up high on the screen, um, a little bit further back, they've already had a tack or two um, trying to get their lane to go out right. Um, and as you mentioned before, we've got the Belgians and uh, the Uruguayans um, all the way over on the left-hand side. So there are... Our, uh, our race leaders from, from uh, last race hitting the right-hand side hard are now hitting the left-hand side very hard um, and sailing fast. You know, one thing we noticed there is on port tack, you have a swell that was coming on the side of the boats, and, and now starboard tack is going to be a lot slower uh, because they're running right into this little cross swell. And so even though uh, they might have an advantage on the right-hand side, uh, the boats coming from port may be able to gain, make little gains on them because they have that swell on the side. It's a nice camera angle there. Yeah, and that, that happens all across the bay as the swell kind of leads in, and it, and it gets more and more pronounced as, um, as the swell picks up and as the breeze picks up. Um, but, yeah, you definitely have um, swell on your nose um, or, yeah, and waves on your nose on port, and then you can see here on starboard tack, it's much more side swell and... Uh, and you can kind of get the boat going a little bit more. So that means setting the boat up slightly differently side to side as well then? Set up differently um, and, uh, and body position differently and then technique. So you can drive the boat a lot more to your pressure on starboard, um, but on port you're really slamming into the waves so you need more power and, uh, and you've got to get the bow down a little bit more. Okay, so it's easy to have a favorite tack to, to be on. The, tactically, does that make a difference? Do you do you want to save your favorite tack for, for, for certain moments in the race? Yeah, well, I think what it does um, lead to is that you can sail a tighter lane on starboard than you can on port because of that side swell. Um, so you have a little bit more of an option to squeeze on the, the, the your leeches and gain a little bit of height. We saw the Polish do that. They're doing it right now. Um, and we saw them do that really well up to the first windward mark where they actually sailed up into somebody um, to get up to that mark without doing that extra tack. So you have, I think you have a little bit more of mode choice on starboard where you don't have that on port. Still a very, very close game at the moment. The, the Fantellas are leading, but uh, Lefebvre and Pelsmakers, the winners of the previous race, also looking very strong in these conditions. And I think the Belgians are taking confidence from their performance. Yeah, and confidence, they went all the way out to the left. So, uh, you know, as soon as the breeze clicks over just a little bit, they can use their speed out there. They're all by themselves. They've got clear air and, uh, you know, and they're just trying to get across that group now because um, they're going to be on port coming into the mark and uh, they've got to try and cross as many boats as possible. I'm just wondering... If the Chinese are, they're, they're up in the top five again as well. And um, I think that Titi, I think the crew, Liu, is the tallest in the fleet. And I, th I think it's significant in these conditions, Chris. Oh, absolutely. And the one thing that we're noticing here is that this is, this is a flat-out drag race. Once you get on whatever the tack it is, it's, there's not a big variance in the breeze strength or direction right now. So it's hammer down. And that's one thing uh, I wanted to talk to Lisa about. It's pretty easy to think too many steps ahead, right? Um, is that a conversation that, that you, know, you have when you're on team boats that uh, right now it's just, just all fast forward, let's not think about anything else? Yeah, I mean, we talk about our, uh, our, our um, focus cycle. So you want to be focused out of the boat. You know, are we in the right spot? Do we need to be thinking about something? And if we're not, then it's all hands on deck to make the boat go as fast as possible. And even if you're not in the right spot, you've got to refocus on sailing fast, even if you're going in the wrong direction while you're making the decision of what to do. Um, and especially in a condition like this, you know, you don't want to be uh, second guessing yourself and you just want to be settling in and, uh, and really focusing on speed. Um, you know, the Dutch have done a good job of, you know, managing what's, what was a little bit of a mistake on the start and a bad, um, and a bad lane there in between the, the, um, in between the New Zealanders, but they've been pushed out to 
the wrong side of the approach. The only thing that they've done quite well is um, you can see as, as we get out there, uh, th there's the Dutch just below, is they've been able to keep their breeze clear and, uh, and keep away from the traffic. As you saw, when you sail in traffic, you sail slow. Yeah, but it's a maturity thing too. If it's an obviously correct direction or you need to get to one place in the race course, uh, there's a maturity in being able to be patient in not the best lane in the world. Oh, totally. Yeah, and, uh, and make that lane work for as long as you can. Yeah, living in thin lanes, that, that is one of the key skills that's, that's hard learned, but, but one of the most valuable skills at Olympic levels of racing and, and in any forms of sailing for that matter. Very, very good rounding by the Croatians. Will it be a good hoist? Because they have got a pretty healthy lead over the next boat about to come round. It looks like it's going to be Germany that comes round in second place, closely followed by New Zealand. Germany 2022, 20, uh, uh, Megendorfer and Spranger, they're round in second, and then it's really close between Poland and New Zealand. And then Uruguay, is that a USA, USA going around in fifth, France in sixth. So we can see um, the Dutch there. A lot of the boats that, it, that got um, shoved out to the left for uh, by the, either by their own choice or by their lanes, really paying for it here at the top of the race course. Again, that right pressure. Yeah, so a bit of a painful moment for the Dutch. They're not invincible after all. They uh, Just a small mistake at the start, just a slight mistiming of two or three seconds, and there you see the effect of, of getting things wrong at the start by a tiny margin can have magnifying effects across the race course. So the Americans and the, and the, and the British jiving out in that right pressure, um, trying to make something happen here. We did see on the last downwind that the edges really paid, and uh, getting in the middle didn't seem to be working very well. So we'll see how, that, how it works out, and, and if we have a lot more late jibers rather than that playing the middle, middle lane, um, which seemed to be a little bit dangerous for, for a lot of the boats. Lisa, have we been seeing any uh, tide influences here? You've been watching this race course. You've sailed here, but it's a big, wide bay with a small entrance to the ocean. What's your, what's your observations here during this, this regatta? Yeah, so um, the tide influences, like we've been on course A the whole time, um, and this is quite deep water over here, um, and uh, and. There's not a lot of, I don't, I don't feel there's a lot of change from right to left. I think it's more wind driven here, what we're seeing on the race course. Over on the, uh, on the other courses, especially course C, that's um, a lot shallower. It's very close to a couple of um, bigger little inlets. Um, there's some tidal influence there that uh, can be different from, uh, from, from place to place on the, on the race course. It's one of the key jobs of the, of the coaches um, is to, Get as much information as you can, uh, you know, before the racing and, and while you're while you're going up and down the race course watching um, to make sure that you're you're on top of those uh, tidal influences and, and things that can affect uh, can affect the race course. We have these awesome images. It's so beautiful to watch them going on the course. It's you know when there's not a lot of changes in in the fleet. You know, it's not this uh, slice and dice light air stuff. It's in Pretty fantastic to just enjoy the athleticism of these boats and watching the Fantella Brothers sail when we had the onboard camera before, watching how absolutely steady they are. Ben Remacher and I were, were watching that really closely and waiting to see what, you know, little, little loss of balance or whatever, and there's nothing. The heads are f flat out, right back. They're working together really, really perfectly. Yeah, so we'll see here. We've got uh, Croatia and Germany coming in. They're pretty well on the ley line to the mark, so they've done that long, like that wait all the way until the uh, till the ley line to jibe in. Um, we're going to see as we get closer that um, the American boat that jibed inside made some good gains coming going into that right pressure at the top and coming back. They're uh, they've been clicking back and forth um, between second and fifth down this run. Um, so nice move by them to um, to make to take the inside and uh, and try and make something happen on this run. Barrows and Henken are right on the cusp of making the top ten. They're just outside at the moment, just two points outside the top ten in eleventh overall. So those moves are going to be key as to whether they make the cut tomorrow for the medal race. While the Fantella's bottom left of screen 
um, are still making good ground here. Lisa, that uh, red kite coming across on starboard top right, that's that's uh, Barrows and Henkham we're looking at. Is that right? Yeah, that's the American boat, and uh, they're making their way through, um, through the group that... Uh, yeah, you can see that there. They're making their way through the group, and they're going to be jiving um, in front and uh, trying to establish a really good position on a ley line coming into the mark. That was a nice ley line, I think, that they called. So some of these boats jived ahead of the ley line, so, um, so they're trying to minimize their, their maneuvers coming into this mark. Yeah, regardless of the ley lines, you can see that they took one puff all the way over and sailed right into the middle of that middle puff, which was the strongest breeze on the course. So they're go everyone's going, these boats are fantastic. They're going they're almost like foilers. They're going fast enough that they can hunt down breezes. And if they have enough clear air, they can do what they want across the race course in this breeze. So here, the Americans, you can see they weren't going to get inside of the French. Um, uh, Ruel and, and Amros, so they chose the other gate to minimize um, the damage of, of, uh, of not being able to get inside the French and keep their air clear. The French did a, a spin around that mark, not great execution there, and the Aussies um, have a nice lane on them, and uh, you know, so they're going to be in trouble eating a little bit of bad air from the Polish, and uh, that's going to be a painful lane to try and hold all the way out to the right. Well, and funnily enough, it's Ruel and Amaros in 10th. The Barrows and Henken from the USC, USA need to get past for that final spot in the medal race. So that mistake by the French will also be playing into the hands of USA. So a real tight battle going on there to, to make that final spot of, for the top 10. Um, we've got one more of these Gold Fleet races tomorrow morning, and then it is the medal race. So it's not all done at the end of the, the afternoon. Um, meanwhile, Croatia 83 making really good ground out to the right-hand side. Shimi Fantella and Mihovil Fantella making easy meat of race 14. It's just really nice to see the Americans up there, obviously. I'm American, and I think that uh, Barrows and Hank and, you know, some sailors wish that they can go out and just win regattas, but they've been so steady. They were top five at the last Worlds. It was a highlight of their event. I remember talking to Hans right after that, and he felt very comfortable with it. You know, just because they were close to a, a medal didn't mean that he felt bad that they didn't win a medal. It's more like it was the culmination of a lot of work, and they're at a good stage in their campaign. So uh, just they're nice and steady. They're not lighting the world on fire, but they're, they're starting to always be there when it comes to trying to get into the medal race of each event. Yeah, I mean, interesting to think about um, when... Athletes show up at world championships. They're all in different stages of their process. And so they'll have different goals. And, uh, you know, the athletes out here aren't going out to win every single race. Like you said, they're going out to execute certain things. And if that leads to a win race win or if that leads to a second or a third, that's what they're, that's, but it being focused on the process is you'll hear that a lot from, from, uh, from especially the, um, the, uh, the more experienced athletes. And that's what it's all about. If things start to go bad, you refocus on the process. What am I trying to do and what am I trying to do well? And if you do those things well, good things come. Croatia continuing to lead out to the right-hand side with Germany 22. I'm not going. I'm going to say that all day, aren't I? 2022. Well, Germany 22. Megendorfer and Spranger um, also going well out to the right-hand side, but no real threats to the Fantellas. That's the McCardys lying. In, sorry, McCarty and Mackenzie lying in third in this race at the moment and getting stronger and stronger throughout this regatta. Andy, who needs to really be, you know, Lisa talked about this being moving day. It's hard to make big moves when the breeze is so steady and everyone's pretty established in their routines. But, but who needs to make big moves right now in your estimation? Yeah, well, one of the things I think that I want to point out here is uh, we were talking about the Americans and the French who are battling it out for that 10th place spot. And that, um, that mark rounding for the French really cost them. There are no tracking at uh, six, so they've tried to make that bad lane work. And the Americans are strong, coming in on a nice lane. They're tracking at seventh, but I think that they're going to well have the French once everybody tacks, and, and they're leading them back into the mark. So little pieces like that make a big difference. They all add up across the course of the week. Uh, we're on race 14 here at the World Championships in St. Margaret's Bay, Nova Scotia. 
and this regatta really has come good. Uh, it's It's been just incredible conditions for this week, better than we might have even expected on the postcard, Lisa. Yeah, I mean... The bay is really, uh, you know, holding up to it, true to its name, and uh, and it's delivering amazing conditions for these sailors. Um, you know, their their physios are going to have their work cut out for them because they're all, you know, working at max power and max speed. And in, in these, uh, th these are called max conditions. You know, the 14 knot into the swell. I mean, this is uh, this is where where you're you're really putting in a lot of work. Um, we're right over top of the uh, Croatians. You can see how much the boats of the very best are getting kicked around by that by that chop. Um, but you know, the boat is. You can see how steady. So the we don't see that the the mast. Um, falling to the left and coming up to the right you know it's going forward and back a little bit with this with the swell but they're tracking really really well and that's a nice shot of you can see the steering you can see the bow coming up going down coming up going down um, to get the boat around the swell keep the bow attached um, the longer the um, you know uh, the less of that hobby horsing you have the steadier the boat is Got a bit of line out the back of the boat, a bit of spinnaker sheet dragging. <laughs> um, so, so not quite perfect, but probably not worth reaching in to do anything about it. That, that's minimal drag out the back of the boat. That's the only criticism I can <laughs> offer the Croatians who are absolutely firing along at the head of this race. Yeah, if you can see, you can see the uh, the crew is constant work on the on the mainsail in and out. So these these crews, um, the crew and the skipper are constantly working on getting matched up. If the crew is trying to sail the boat in a different mode than the skipper, the boat's going nowhere. So they're locked in and they're really dialed into exactly what they're trying to do with the boat. Um, and, the, and the driving is matching what the crew is doing exactly to keep that boat balanced and, and sailing well. And Andy, I think Mihoville heard you. He went in, he pulled in that sheet and tucked it away. But every, every inch counts. But that was a be beautiful images coming from there. And that's, that's really what we like to see, just to see how these athletes work so smoothly. Those sails, really flat. And I know that the older sailors could get a little bit flatter than the, um, than the current black sails that the other sailors are sailing. But you can see how that, that Cunningham is baked on hard. Um, the, the sails is about as flat as it can get in, in that mode. And then uh, they, they might open that up a little bit on the downwind legs. But just really, really great to just meditate and watch these sailors do what they do best. And to some extent, tactically, they can switch off now, can't they, Lisa? Because this is turned into a bit of a, a one-track race course. All their competitors are, are following them. So that means that um, they don't have to be that heads out of the boat. They can, they can really go put the blinkers on and just focus on boat speed. Yeah, I mean, right now, and, they, and they've done exactly that. They are stretching away from the Germans and the, and the New Zealanders, and, uh, and they're sailing the boat really well and really fast, whereas everybody else is a little bit more concerned about their placement. Um, and the Germans and the New Zealanders, again, they're probably moding a little bit more, trying to dust the ones on their hip, um, and they might be playing a little bit more games. Um, and, again, just giving the Croatians um, a little bit more space to, uh, to get the boat going. I do have a little bit of a communications question, and each one, either one of you can field this one. And you know, that last lured mark rounding, the Chinese wound up w rounding really wide, uh, the boat on the inside of them. Uh, internationally, uh, when you don't speak English, uh, in terms of communications around the course, is there, I mean, I've been out of competition for a while, but what's the uh, international communications? Does everyone just kind of wing it in terms of port starboard or communicating leading into a mark or, or tight situations? Yeah, I mean, it's really hard to communicate any more than one word, and, and pretty much everybody, you know, knows starboard, room, cross, um, you know, and so um, uh, that that would be uh, where, you know, where uh, uh, a group that might not, or a, a crew that might not speak um, English very well, when you're asking for a cross, that may be a little bit more of a challenge for them, um, you know, where the Danish came in there, and they would have been clearly asking let us cross, let us cross, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I think the um, English takes precedence in the, in the rules on the, on the race course, and, uh, and everybody knows the, the, w the words that you, that you would need to be able to say in order to communicate what you need to do. Sometimes it just comes down to, hey, hey, yeah. hey. Yeah. It, it just, uh, just making guttural sort of Stone Age man sounds <laughs> sometimes helps. 
That's about all you can get out sometimes. So. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we see the boats coming around here. We've got Germany and New Zealand. New Zealand had that really nice rounding on the French, squeezed them out, remember, at the Leward Mark rounding, um, with, with the Poles as well. Here's the Polish, and that's the boat that was giving the, the French debt uh, some, some bad air. And here's the Americans coming in, um, and they're coming in at... Uh, what place are fifth, they? Fifth. fifth place. And I'm just going to look back at where the French... The French are the, are the, is the boat right there on, uh, on Port Tack. They're trying to find their, their lane, and they're now in eighth or ninth. So you can see just those little moments, like uh, a mark rounding, can, uh, can really make a big difference. It's been a very expensive um, couple of moments for the French, just uh, not quite getting that mark rounding and, and then losing their position out of the tight line of... Port tack boats going out to the right hand side and, and that's the the result that, that you see. Yeah, eleventh place around the mark for the French, Chinese sneaking in front of them. And there's Netherlands one going around just behind the French. So so not a disaster for the Netherlands. They're up to about twelfth place, something like that. Um, so considering how conservative uh, sorry, how consistent they've been in other races, that's not at all bad. The Dutch going for a, uh, an early jibe, um, just seeing what they can find on the other side of the race course. Yeah, not surprising. The, again, we were talking about drops and about risk management. They don't have a big drop. So when they're, when they're uh, you know, kind of mid to high teens, they can fire it out there and really try and make something happen on the last leg of a race because, you know, if it doesn't pay... They're gonna they're gonna they're gonna use their uh, their mid teens drop that they have. If it does pay, then they're then they're into another keeper, which is a smart move by them. Well, that's an enormous luxury that they can afford to do that. Most teams can't afford to think that way, but that's just a measure of how far ahead they are on points to be able to to be able to sail that way and to do a bit of gambling down this final leg to the finish. Yeah, and, and, you know, that's the brilliance and, uh, and the weapon that having a consistent line um, and consistent finishes is when you get down to the, to the very nitty-gritty of the end of the series. And as you look on the leaderboard on the top left of screen, you can see for the first time Lambrex and Van der Verken do creep up into the top ten. That jibe set now puts them up into ninth. So, so that gamble to split from the, from the leaders looks like it might be paying off. Yeah, and, you know, that's the mental game that, um, that people are playing out there. The ones that are really, like, trying to get back into the, into the top ten, don't have a lot of room to, to maneuver, are a little bit more likely to follow and not to, like, push. Whereas, you know, if, you've, if you can hang it out there, um, you know, you can kind of make something happen. Meanwhile, Fantella's almost 300 metres ahead of Megendorfer and Spranger, in second place and the Germans will be more concerned about the Kiwis McCarty and McKenzie that are on, on a big charge and beginning to threaten to take over second place from the Germans so a real tight battle for second and once we've seen the Croatians cross the finish line I, I really want to see if we can focus on second and third uh, because that is a very tight battle we're looking at between Germany and New Zealand meanwhile not putting a foot wrong are those brothers the Olympic champion from the 470 in Rio 2016, Shime Fantella, sailing with his brother, Mihovil Fantella, and uh, one of the, the all-time greats from, from their country. Really, for a small nation, Croatia really punches above its weight, and these guys are, are national heroes back in Croatia, and with the performance that you see here, you can understand why. Yeah, they nailed it straight from the, uh, the port tack, um, across the, the start line all the way through this race. They just sailed a great race. And if we pan back, we can see this uh, battle here with the Kiwis and the Germans. The Kiwis did a great job of jiving just before the Germans and then soaking down on top of them and making it really hard for the Germans to keep their air clear. And I think the Kiwis are just going over top of them right now. Um, so the Germans are trying to keep their air clear, trying to get down towards that pin end of the start line, and, or sorry, to the finish line, but the Kiwis have got them. So really, really well-timed jibe, and then switching modes to soak as much as they possibly can and get over top of the Germans to take a, a second place in this race. Nicely sailed. Yeah, um, McCarty and McKenzie, they just keep on getting better and better throughout this series, and they are knocking on the door of uh, being able to take a top three in this championship. 
So we've got uh, three boats coming in here for fourth, fifth, and sixth. The, the American boat there is in the middle of this pack with the, uh, with the red kite. We've been talking about them a lot this race. And just on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, we're going to see soon the Dutch boats coming in for a strong eighth place. So big gains on, that, uh, on that, that jibe set. And that's what happens when you're free to do a little bit of gambling. Yeah, good gambling by the Dutch. And good sailing by Chiba Tech and Piaseki across the line in fourth, ahead of Barrows and Henken in fifth. And the Germans just coming across Stingler and Scheel in seventh. Let's see where the Dutch are. This is them coming in with the black Jenica just above the committee boat, coming in for eighth. And so they've taken these four boats down this final leg to the finish and just adding further points gap between themselves and the rest of the fleet. Really strong finish by the Dutch salvaging something really useful, but a nasty situation between China and the uh, the other oh, boat. Oh yeah, China just got caught there with a the port starboard, but once they get, they do have room to finish, so uh, there might be some words about that one there. Um, you know, uh, definitely port starboard, you gotta keep clear, um, but once once they get overlap with that boat and they get inside, they've, they've gotta have room to finish. And Ruel and Amaros, the French that we talked about earlier with that poor mark rounding that cost them so dearly, uh, they finish up in 12th in that race. And the battle for 10th place in uh, to get into the medal race has got really tight, but it, it looks like Barrows and Henken might be doing just enough to, uh, to break into the top 10. So we'll, we'll look at that in more detail in a moment. We hope you've enjoyed this so far. Stay with us because we've got the NACRA 17 racing up next and uh, we're going to see some upwind foiling which is the, the, the new game in town and it's the ones that the, the, the game of foiling upwind is what the Italians do so well to be leading this competition. Um, like, follow and subscribe if you aren't already doing those things. 49er.org or NACRA17.org are the places to be. Go to both and Make sure that you're, uh, you're fully up to date with all the news in the skiff and the foiling catamaran world. So we've got an updated leaderboard for you. Uh, let's see how things are shaping up. Let's look at the bottom of the leaderboard because there we have Barrows and Henken just displacing the French to get into the top 10. And then we've got Wen and Liu um, who are just looking so strong in, in these uh, stronger wind conditions. They're in ninth. Megendorfer and Spranger getting better and better with a fourth and a third today, up to eighth overall. Bildstein and Hussle having a, a steady day in the middle of the pack, holding seventh place. Chibatek and Piasecki having a really good day with a 5-2-4 for, uh, for the polls. Uh, Dunningbeck and Gunn, a bit of a below average day for them, drops them down to fifth. And they have been displaced um, by McCarty and McKenzie who are knocking on the door of third place. They're in fourth at the moment, but the Spanish, bit of an average day for them, but it's still good enough to keep them third. Fantellas, they just got better throughout the day. A poor 24 first, followed by a third and a first. Keeps them in second place, but look at the points gap. 24 points is the distance between first and second. Lambriex and Van der Verken, they have got one hand on the trophy already, and there are still two races to sail. A, a race 15 of the gold fleet and then a medal race, but it's looking increasingly like the defending world champions are gonna be repeat world champions. What do you think, Lisa? Yeah, well, I mean, for the Dutch, you know, the first race was great. They, they picked the, the spot where they needed to go. Um, the second race with that fifth was a little bit of a slog, but I gotta hand it to them on this last race. They made a mistake off the start you know, where they were and, and that, that lack of execution really made it hard for them. But to come back from, you know, where they were, they were deep in the, in the fleet, they were in the weeds and it was, uh, and you know, they did a great job of keeping their heads about them, making a nice call, using a little bit of risk and getting back to an eighth place was huge for them. Okay, Chris has got an interview lined up for us. Uh, let's go to him in the boat park. Great, we are live. We've got Jay Walker, who's the, I guess, what would you give your official title? Uh, the safety lead for the World Sailing Championships uh, this week. 
Awesome. And what's your background? You're like a special operations person, right? Yeah. So um, I come from EHS, which is Emergency Health Services, which is the Provincial Ambulance Service or Paramedic Service. And then we have a cadre of paramedics who are specialists uh, that do uh, more than routine ambulance work uh, here throughout the week, out on the water and as well on land here, helping out the athletes, uh, both in the primary health care and, of course, trauma and anything like that that ha tends to happen. Cool, and we got your radical bike here with all the equipment that you need. Um, I know you said to me yesterday that like, you know, a great day is when you're just bored out of your mind. Um, but right now, just when I talk to you, you got a bunch of calls in. Uh, what's going on out on the water right now? Uh, lots of activity, a little bit of contact here and there on the, on the markers, which is pretty normal for, you know, uh, uh, professionals like this, uh, this caliber. Uh, things get relatively tight in the, in the squeeze points or choke points, and sometimes there's a little bit of a rub or a bang, and uh, we tend to be there to pick up uh, any pieces if there's any problems. And uh, so far, so good. Everybody's safe and happy and uh, healthy. We just want to make sure we're close by in case something does happen that they need some help. How many people are out on the water right now as part of your team? Uh, we've got a combination of paramedics and uh, rescue technicians from the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, so a total of eight on the water right now, and there's two of us uh, on the course, on the water here. Cool. And, uh, and for yourself, do you basically specialize in maritime? No, uh, our guys uh, do a little bit of boat work, not a lot during the summer months. We typically stay out of the water in the winter because it's a, a specialist role there. Uh, my guys, uh, the paramedics, do more... Uh, police activity and hazmat and chemical biological emergencies and stuff like that. This is uh, just yet another st string or arm of uh, response that they do, they do. And for your team, do you have to do any uh, kind of special education and work with yeah. the event for figuring out what are the, some of the special needs or, or common injuries and other accidents? Yeah, the, the big thing is to be orientated in the, in the uh, rescue craft. So there's two rescue boats out there. So they spend every weekend or their uh, one day a week uh, practicing with the Canadian Coast Guard Auxiliary, getting familiar with the boats, practicing their protocols in, uh, on the ocean and uh, getting used to the conditions. Well, I know I know Lisa's husband's been a, a rescue swimmer for the Canadian Coast Guard or you know agencies like that so we we have them all over the world but it's it's specialty each region um, how is uh, is your job basically a, a full-time career as a paramedic yeah I, I work for the provincial service and all the paramedics here are full-time paramedics and uh, and uh, this is kind of extra duty for us to help the event uh, take off and be safe and then the last question is a lot of times uh, big events learn a lot from people like professionals like you in terms of rescue protocol. What happens? Who do you call first? Who's, who do you have to call on land to make sure there's yeah. someone prepared? Who prepared that document for the event? Yeah. So I did the master plan for the for this event. And the secret to, to good planning is not necessarily that one transaction, someone getting hurt and, and, and taking care of them on the site, but is making sure that from the site of injury, the person arrives to a surgical suite or an ICU, making sure all those connections are drawn and connected so that the time uh, is not wasted and the person's outcome is optimized. Great. And, you know, around here, I mean, this is a really rural place. We drive and see nothing for the 20 minutes yeah. until we get to our hotel room. Yeah. So what's the closest uh, really proper medical facility? Uh, well, uh, the closest one is in Halifax or in, or in Bridgewater, which both are about uh, equidistant, about 30 minutes away. But for those folk uh, uh, who don't know, is that all the planning is that the paramedics have worked out already with air ambulances. They go to the top of the hill and they pass off a person to an air ambulance. And that 30 minute drive is now only a 10 minute flight. Great. So all those plans are all all done in the background no one really sees it unless it happens so yeah well that makes me feel a lot better considering yeah. sometimes it feels like you're far away from something Great. so as boats are coming in right now jay thank you so much for your Great, support thanks. and uh we feel better having you here right. so back to the studio chris thank you very much and there you see a canadian nac 17 because we are getting into a different game now it's foiling catamarans for the rest of the afternoon and uh, so let's just have, just have a look at the leaderboard and remind ourselves of what the situation is. So we've got two Italians leading and, and look at the scoreline for Tita and Banti, the reigning Olympic champions. A row of bullets um, across all 12 races, with the exception of race seven, where they got an uncharacteristic 20th. Ugolini and Jubilee looking pretty comfortable in second, the younger Italians. Kurt Bay and Keskinen. Uh, fin the Finnish team in third, Gimson and Burnett, the Olympic silver medalist in fourth for Great Britain, Waterhouse and Darman in from Australia in 74th, Wilkinson and Dawson from New Zealand in 79, Sweden's Jeruden Jonsson in seventh, another Italian team, Bissero and Frascari in eighth, ninth, uh, Vandermeer and Bauer from the Netherlands, and in tenth, Magdalani and Bosco from Argentina. 
I did an interview a couple of days ago with Sinem Kurt Bay, um, the leading female skipper in this lineup at the moment. Let's hear what she had to say. Okay, we've just reached the end of day two of the NACRA 17 World Championships. Sinem Kurt Bay, it didn't start so well for you, but you seem to have got better throughout the day. Third overall in the standings at the moment. What's your assessment of the day? Uh, assessment of the day, I don't know, but I'm quite surprised that we're still third. Oh, well, that's good. You can come ashore feeling a, a little bit downbeat and then yeah, podium position, positive. not so bad really, is it? Yeah. Now, um, tell me about what you're learning day by day about how to sail these boats in this full foiling mode. How, how much has that changed the game since Tokyo? Oh, it's, I think completely changed, especially the upwind aspect, well, the downwind as well, because now we can change our rudders as we want, which we couldn't do before. You'd set it for the race and sail through the whole race with it. Um, but yeah, upwind is completely different. The setup of the rig is quite different as well. And then there's quite a lot of variables to uh, think about and how to relearn all the VMGs and and the small changes that you want to do when you're changing moding and uh, there's quite a, quite a bit. Yeah, so that question of moding, and any good sailor knows that there are different ways to, to go up the race course. You can go low and fast or high and slow towards the windward mark, but now you've got this high and low with uh, whether you're foiling or whether you're not foiling. So tell us, wh what is the, wh what's the magic switch over from when you go from low riding to foiling upwind? I think it's pretty quickly that we go foiling already on like eight, nine knots of wind. So it's very, and I think from then on, and maybe on eight knots of wind, you have a VMG where displacement and foiling is quite similar, but pretty quickly foiling gets better. Okay. So it's quite quickly that we go into foiling once the wind increases enough. Now I'm hearing that the British have this um, high and yeah. slow form of foiling. So even in foiling, <laughs> there are different modes of, so, yeah. so where do you fit in that? What's your philosophy about getting up wind? I actually think we're quite getting quite good at, at both ends of it. I think generally we have been better in the low and speed mode. Um, we didn't quite match Gimson's, uh, Gimson and Anna's uh, high and slower mode, but uh, I think we're getting getting better at that end too. So we're trying to become like more overall in general and trying to figure out what are the small changes I need to make to change modes and be quick on it and get locked in again. So when you're coming off the start line, uh, what, what are the sort of considerations there? You've, you've got not got much space either side of you. What, what, what are, what's the thought process there in terms of being able to get into your favorite VMG mode? Just make enough space so you can go foiling ASAP. <laughs> if someone beats you to it, what's it like? Yeah, they did beat us in the first one and that's why we had a struggle. But uh, yeah, I think whoever gets foiling first and whoever has enough space to go foiling first, I think uh, makes some good gains. In the, on the fleet in general. So in, in normal boats, it, it's about gaining that space to lure to be able to put the bow down, accelerate and, and get up to full speed. Are we talking about the same kind of things with, with the NACRA getting off the start line in foiling? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and so how do you manage to do that? How do you set yourself up um, when everyone else is trying to achieve the same thing? What are, what are the skill differences? Just try to be ahead of everything and anticipate a lot and yeah, do the right things. I, I would tell you if I knew. <laughs> a lot of it must come down to communication. Yeah, it does. So, so how much? Repetition as well, having done enough. Right. And uh, everyone obviously is trying to work out what the Italians are doing differently. What, what's your take on, on why the Italians are able to win so many races? <laughs> the first race was quite embarrassing, I thought, and the second one as well. Um, took a, we, we both took a quite a bad start and they just sailed around the fleet and and we couldn't so uh, yeah I don't know whatever they're doing if I knew I would I would mimic but they're doing everything a bit better than everyone else I think they're a little faster better around the race course probably more hours foiling than everyone else and than the fleet they're doing a very good job whatever they're doing now you and the rest of the fleet will surely be doing in a year's time do you think that's just the, the nature of development a year's time that's depressing <laughs> <laughs> yeah so t t tell us where 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 they are now where do you expect to be, where do you expect to be how, how long is it going to take to close that gap who knows because i mean they're going to keep improving as well so but uh give us the winter we'll see in palma how are you spending the winter? What's the, the best use of that time away from competition? Have good training partners around, sharing a lot, um, being quite open with each other, putting a lot of hours, having a good time. Having a good time. Are you having a better time in this full foiling era compared yeah. with the semi-foiling era? For sure, 100%.
Okay, so it looks good from the outside, but why are you enjoying it more? I think it's more challenging, even more challenging, but more... Uh, it gives you very direct feedback, and I feel like, uh, I don't know, it's, there's more adrenaline, there's more going on, you have to be more on it all the time. And you did before as well. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't explain it, I'm just more fun. Well, you're not entirely happy with today. You're still third overall. That's not too shabby. Well done, Sinem Kurt Bam. Best of luck for the rest of the regatta. Thanks. Thanks. We'll try. Sinem Kurt Bay doing extremely well in this regatta so far, but frustrated that she can't yet close the gap to the Italians. Uh, so we got one minute to the start of the first of three races in the NACRA 17s. Lisa, what's your pick for which side of the, the start here? Yeah, so um, the line is showing a little bit of uh, uh, port bias, so closer to the pin. Um, but again, you know, you've got to be aware of giving away any advantage over to that right, I think. Um, it's, it's, Sorry uh, about that. It's, uh, it's, it's looking like there's a, there's a big sag on the line with 30 seconds to go. And uh, from what I can see, Lisa, we've got a bunch of boats here on starboard, but also at the far end, a, a bunch looking to uh, to start on port. We're going to have a, a few collision courses to think about. Yeah, there's a bit, there's a little bit of a port bias, but there's a big sag um, in the in the line from uh, you know from the the starboard end. So some of those port boats might be able to get across that middle group, which would be a huge gainer for them. Seven seconds to go, and increasingly it looks like we're going to see some port tax starts. Three. Two, one, can anyone get the perfect port tack start across all the starboard tackers? If they can, what a gain that would be because we've seen the power of the right-hand side of this race course in the 49er racing. Let's uh, look at those boats further out on the uh, the port on that side. Who's going to cross? Who's successfully going to get across the starboard tackers? It's actually not looking as easy as we thought. No, I'm not sure if anybody's going to be able to get across. Maybe the Italians. And there they are. Oh, making it look good. Which Italians are we talking about? Is it the Italians, Italy 26? Italy 26 just won the pin, tacked across, or won the pin, started on, on, on port and just sailed across everybody. So uh, they're going to be pretty happy about being able to execute that. And now they're on top of all the boats that, you know, we had the, um, we saw just there with the early pan out, um, the other Italian team and New Zealand's and... Uh, and the Chinese starting on port right at the committee boat. And that's your indicator of, of how the committee boat was. But because of the port bias of the line, the, the Italians are on top and bow even with the boats that started at the, at the, uh, at the committee. That yeah. was brilliant. Well, it was brilliant. And it was nothing to do with technical superiority. That was execution of time on distance, having some courage, and, and some really good boat handling. That's, that's nothing to do with, with having superior technology, which is, is what uh, the, the Italians are often suspected to have. The, that is about just plain better sailing yeah, off the start that's line. That's what the Croatians wanted to do in the 49er race, the race before. And you can see how costly it was when you couldn't do it. And right here, this is looking like it's going to be a, a nice race for the Italians. And that's no uh, slouch of a sailor behind them. That is Billy Besson and Noah Ancion. Billy Besson, uh, the winner of the first four world championships in the early history of the NACRA 17, uh, but playing catch up with Italy 26, with USA 50 further down to Leeward and Denmark 31 and China 564 also doing well. Aus Australia 5 and another Chinese team doing well out to the right hand side. So, um, China really wanting the right-hand side of the race course and uh, so a really strong bid for this side of the race course and that's Italy 98, uh, the second place team from Italy, um, Jubilee, sorry, Ugolini and Jubilee also doing well out to the right-hand side. It could be an Italy 1-2 in this race at the moment. Yeah, so um, interestingly, right now, um, the tracker has some of the boats that are way over on the right um, still playing in 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 the mix um, with the um, you know with with the amount that uh, with the amount that um, that when they had good starts on the uh, on the on the the race committee end of the line and they uh, they started the Swedes in the finish but um, as you could see with the uh, 
with the 49ers, this group right here that we're seeing right now, I think they're going to they're going to have all the control as they come back to the to the uh, um, to the mark. It's going to be an Italy Italy um, call on the way back to the mark. I think. So so bearing in mind that uh, the uh, the maneuver loss is even higher in a, an Acura 17 than a 49er. Does this make it even more important to to get early? Um, on the track out to the right-hand side, do you think? Yeah, well, I think, you know, you could see the, the danger um, of uh, of that uh, that port tack um, start above the the um, the group. This group right here, the Italians, um, the Chinese, they, they took a little bit of an easier route, started um, at the committee boat, um, but were trying to limit, again, their, their maneuvers to get out to the right. I think it's really the only way that you're going to be able to get out here is to start on port. And, uh, and really fire it out um, without having to do attack. It'd be interesting to see on the next start if we see even more boats sliding up just on Port Zach and forgetting about even trying to start on starboard. Pretty, pretty unorthodox kind of sailing. But uh, they've obviously been watching the 49er racing. Uh, they will have had the info back. And uh, uh, tell us, what are you seeing at the moment? Well, just there's a little bit of a click left um, in the... Uh, it, in the, in the breeze, so there's uh, you know Galen Richardson um, is is tracking like they're winning the race, but they are hard out on the left corner. It's going to be hard for them uh, to come back, but a little bit of a glory moment for the for the young Canadians. <laughs> right. Well, that's nice to see, but we'll have to see if that if that's real. Um, what I'm also seeing is that Italy 98. That's who we've got in the front of our picture, going along very nicely. But it looks like the other Italians on the, on the very right at the top of the screen are going about 15 degrees higher. I mean, they seem like they're in completely different breeze. So m maybe that's what the Canadians have been benefiting from. Yeah, that's that little bit. Of, you can see there's a line of pressure there. That's that's that left pressure that that the uh, the boats on the left were currently in. It doesn't seem like it's it's holding in its direction. And uh, and but the um, uh, um, Tita and Banti have been able to to link into that pressure and take a lot of height from it and really walk away from the other Italians. Um, Tita and Banti are currently going 16.4 knots, and I'm just going to scroll in here and get a sense. The other Italians are going 16, so half a knot currently faster for, uh, for Tita and Banti, which is, uh, you know, that's, that's quite significant. It seems like these Italians are making a move forwards um, on Tita and Banti behind them. Um, but uh, the, the other Italians, Italy 26 in the distance, are generally got better VMG. There's the tack. There's the moment of truth. Looks like Ugolini and Jubilee are going to be some way behind uh, their Italian teammates. Yeah, so... Um I think they might have t even tacked on a thin ley line. Um, yeah, the, the other Italians have tacked just high of them. And, uh, oh, and you can see the steering. This is a great shot of, of just how much they have to steer to keep everything connected, keep the boat tracking. Again, we want to see that really, really steady mast and, we're, we're, uh, and keep the boat going fast. You know, a lot of uh, direction change here. Look at that boat going up and down, up and down to try and keep the boat tracking as fast as possible. And wow, look at that. Great shot. It, to me, it looks like a video game. If you'd have been watching this 20 years ago, you wouldn't believe that this was real. But this is where sailing has got to in the year of 2022. And um, it, it, yeah, it, lo it looks like a video game to me. Yeah, and it just shows you how in tune the crews and the skippers have to be um, to get these boats going fast. And, you know, like the Italians were, were, were talking about, there is, you know, there's no, um, there's nothing better than time on the water with these boats because they're so hard to sail well and there's so much learning going on right now that training time is everything. Yeah, and these boats would be hobby horsing all over the place if we'd be, been looking at them a few years ago. Um, the, the rate of learning that has gone through the NACRA 17 fleet is quite phenomenal because these are the people that are writing the manual of, of how to sail foiling catamarans. There, there is no textbook about how to do this stuff. It's brand new in the sport, and they are learning 
every leg of every race that they do right now. But, but look at that lead for Tita and Banti. Yeah, the Italians are flying, both Italian boats right now. Um, Tita and Banti are going 18.4 knots, um, and the other Italians are sailing a little bit higher. They've got, they, they've got some, uh, some work to do with, with some of the other boats, and they're going 16.6. So, um, you know, just to give you a little bit of an idea, the, uh, the British, who are, you know, no slouches, are going 15.5. So there's some different moding going on out here, but the Italians, because they've got that clear lane, are able to walk away, and they're above 18 knots when others are in the 16-knot range. So two knots faster than the, than the boats around them. And when we saw the Italian 26 boat the other day, we thought the attitude of the boat in re relative to the water was different. It, it looks a little bit more bowed down. It looks a little bit more heel to windward. And it's all, all, almost like the foils, uh, the two floats of the boat are, are twisted. Um, so we're looking at them right now. Now, you can be sure that uh, later on this evening and, and in the coming weeks, uh, this footage is going to be analyzed very, very closely by rival teams because this is the best team in the world showing us how to get an Acra 17 upwind on, on the new mode of upwind foiling. Yeah, so you can see them just pulling the boat over just slightly to windward, really driving the foils into the boat. And I mean, that is so, they're on a fine edge there, but they're gaining every bit of height and speed, really making the foils work for them. And now they can see they're a little bit above the mark. So now they're charging into the mark. And, uh, you know, just to give you a little bit of a sense of the speed that they're going right now while we watch them, 19.7 knots as they bear off and go into that mark. They're almost going 20 knots into the mark. Huge, huge gainer for them. I mean, this is, this is, you know, this is what everybody's trying to do. Just adjusting themselves on their trapeze wise, getting themselves a little bit higher. Uh, Katerina Banty reaches in to adjust some controls, uh, release the, the Cunningham power. Oh, bit of a dive there. Even these guys struggle at times. Now to the spacer leg. And yeah. Just uh, pulling, eking out the first few feet of the uh, the spinnaker out to that bow sprit, and Katerina will run in very shortly to get that Jenica hoisted, and another nose dive. They didn't quite manage to keep a, a steady foil there as the Italian flag of that Jenica goes up and flutters in the breeze until Banty. That's not the that's not the best of their hoists actually. That's, that was a little bit ragged by their high standards, but it's not going to matter because they are already leading this yeah. by country mile. And you could see a little bit of weed patch there too that they went through. So you could just see how hard these conditions are and how much work um, you know everybody can, can do, even the best, to get even better um, in this fleet. These are hard boats to sail. They're very, very technical. And you know they're on a knife's edge all the time and they're pushing, pushing, pushing. So, um, you know, there's, there's lots, of, uh, lots of room to maneuver. Gabriella Bruni, the coach of Italy, will be very proud to see this moment. An Italian one, two, three. This is a full Italian job around the Wimbledon mark because around a long way back, but in second place, are the 2019 world champions, Bissero and Frascari, and then Ugolini and Jubile, the young team who were second in the world's last year behind Gibson and Burnett. Well, they're just ahead of Gibson and Burnett in this race. The defending champions from Great Britain struggling to get on even terms with the Italians at this world championship in Nova Scotia. Yeah, so we're coming up to the, uh, to the middle, to the back of the fleet. Um, and uh, you can see how the teams are, are getting ready to launch their kite. They do a little bit of a pre-hoist pre before they come around the mark to make it a little bit quicker and easier for the crews. Um, when you're in traffic, you can see there's less of a pre-hoist because they've got more on with uh, just managing the, uh, the boats around them. Yeah, that's right, which again plays into the hands of the leader that doesn't have to worry about that positioning relative to other boats. But there's that trap that's been set for all the boats, which is that weed line just after the hoist. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so you really don't want to be getting any of that weed on the rudders in these boats. It's an absolute foiling killer. Look at these four boats go around now really, really close with Brazil leading this particular charge. And China, two Chinese boats um, in there as well. And uh, I don't know if those are the Chinese boats we saw going out to the, uh, to the right-hand side earlier, but they've really dropped back from, um, from where they were earlier in the in the race. Not sure what happened to them. 
dive set from one of the Chinese boats as we're tracking back with our drone pilot, Mike. Um, there, are, there are no ribs or any other form of craft that can keep up with these NACRA 17s very easily and, and without creating a lot of wash and wake that could uh, affect the competition. Whereas the great thing about a drone like this is that uh, you've got a helicopter's eye view without any of the downdraft of a helicopter. Yeah, interesting. Um, you know, with the addition of, of a number of foiling boats um, in the Olympics, with the foiling kites and the, the, uh, the foiling boards, um, you know, drones have become more and more of a tool of a lot of the coaches. Um, coach boats are becoming less and less of a thing, especially when you look at the kites and, uh, and the IQ foil. Um, you know, these boats come a little bit closer with coach boats, but, you know, you need a bigger and bigger coach boat in order to keep up with them. Yeah, that's right. Really, really hard to do. It looks a little bit light here for the boats that we're looking at at the moment. That's Argentina. And uh, they, they look a bit a little bit soft for breeze at the moment. Yeah, so um, as the boats were rounding the mark, they had a, they had a, a, a breeze uptake, and that might have been, you know, some of that boat handling. Um, they were up to 16 knots, and we're back down to about 14. Um, so it's, it's not down by, uh, by general standards, but it is down a little bit by what they, were, what they rounded the mark at. Okay, and there is the battle between the, uh, the second two Italians along with Gimpson and Burnett from Great Britain. And that's Italy 26 in the lead. Doesn't look like they're eking out that much of a lead downwind. If anything, it looks like Italy 71 might have closed the gap slightly on the race leaders. Um, but uh, nothing too much at the moment for Italy 26 to worry about. On the, on the strength of this event so far, this looks like it's going to be another race win for Tita and Banti, who look so solid on the upwind legs. Yeah, and it, it, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things where these boats are so full on that you wonder if, uh, if they're taking their foot off the gas pedal just a little bit on the downwind to be safe, um, to make sure that they're executing, they're not pushing it too far, they don't make any mistakes, because they know that they've got wheels upwind, and uh, so they just have to make sure that they've got a nice little cushion so that they can make the upwind easy. Newbury and Liebenberg, USA 50. They are um, just outside the top 10. They lie in 11th, uh, but it's a bit of a points gap for them to make up today. They're having a good race in this one at the moment, but that's a, another battle to watch as to see who makes the cut for tomorrow's final medal race. The uh, where We've only got the top 10, and it's a double pointer. We've got the Leward Mark rounding now for Italy 26, still getting that red... Uh, white and green Jenica squared away. A little bit of a late drop there. Katrina Banty only now getting out onto the trapeze. So, so it was a late drop. And it looks like a bit of bias on the left-hand gate mark, which is maybe why they've chosen that one. But uh, I would have thought, based on the strength of the first beat, that we would see them protecting the right again. Yeah, so you can see the, uh, the second-place Italian team doing exactly that. Firing it around that mark. That was a really nice mark rounding. Wow. Lots of speed as they, as they turn around that mark. Um, I, I do agree that I think the, uh, the port hand mark is a little bit higher. But, you know, you see Tita and Banti tacking as soon as the other marks, as soon as the other boats round the mark. So that's a pretty classic move. They made a little bit of gain upwind. And then they're trying to limit the amount of bow forward that the other boats have towards the right-hand side. So they're going to be in a nice spot. It's almost identical to where they were off the start, where they were above but bow even with the other boats. And that's kind of their, ba their boats between them and the mark, which is a really nice spot to be. Here are the second place Italians, Bissero and Frascari, the, the rivals for Olympic selection for Tokyo 2020. They didn't manage to get that. That went to Tita and Banti, who went on to win the gold medal. But this is another real world-class team. And this is our sea level sideline camera doing their best in a high powered rib to maintain speed with an Acra 17 going upwind at full chat at about what 16 or 17 knots. So um, that's going to be a rough ride on board a rib to try and keep track with this boat. Yeah, and you can. this gives you a really good sense of how fast these boats actually are going. Those drone shots are beautiful, but you're so high up that you don't really get a sense of like just how fast a boat's got to go to keep up with these boats. And here you can see, if you, we get the sense from, from, um, fr from Leward, 
you know, how much they're really pulling on the foils and, and, uh, and driving the boats a little bit with a little bit of windward heel to create that lift um, off of these, uh, these super fast boats. Busy Mark rounding on the left-hand side. And this is one of the Australian boats coming round on the right. Just got the mm -hmm. Jenica down. Chinese boat getting the Jenica down and about to go round the right. And then Australia going round to the left as well. Brazil with the blue Jenica about to get that. Oh, and it's a late drop. It's a late drop for Brazil, and they've given themselves a, a lot to do. So it's a ragged rounding by Brazil. And now it's going to be a jibe drop for that Australian boat just going around. Australia 5, we can see in the middle of screen. Um, that is Jason Waterhouse and Lisa Darmanin. Uh, they are uh, currently going upwind, having gone round the, the left-hand gate. But uh, back up near the front, GBR 21 in fourth place for Gimson and Burnett, and then it's the uh, the charge of the Italians. Tita Banti leading Vissero Frascari second, and Ugolini Tubale in third, as things stand at the moment. Yeah, so just taking a look at that, that British boat, you know, um, with metal in hand, they're not going to be happy about having all three of those Italian boats ahead of them. And so I think this is going to be some uh, fodder for determination to, to close the gap with those guys. Absolutely. And with Ian Percy as their coach, uh, the former America's Cup skipper and three-time Olympic medalist um, working with Gimson and Burnett, um, he's not going to want to settle for second best. The Gimson and Burnett campaign is all about winning the gold medal. They got the silver in Tokyo. They they really want to get their own back on the Italians in Marseille, the uh, the venue for Paris 2024. And uh, there's still two years to go. And uh, some are wondering if the Italians have, have shown their hand with too much too soon. But of course, when you're campaigning the way that you are, it's, it's really hard to sandbag. It's really hard to take your foot off the throttle. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I think it's just about you know, pushing as far as as fast as you can, learning as much as you can, and keep moving forward. The British have done a really good job here. You'll just see in a moment of getting up and under the Brit the, the Brazilians. The Brazilians and the and the uh, and the, the British were kind of bow even there for a little while, and the British just did a better job of sailing higher and the same speed. And now the Brazilians are actually in their dirty air, sailing slower and lower. Well, Sinem Kurtbe, in the interview that I did with her a couple of days ago, the one that we saw just before we, we got onto this race, um, she commented on something that a lot of people have observed, which is the, the high and slow mode of foiling that the British are able to use, and they've used it to really good effect against Brazil here. Yeah, and, uh, you know, that's um, they've been able to solidify their lane. They've taken the, Br the Brazilians right out of it, and the British really probably aren't going to see them again in this race just because of that mode. So they, they're sailing about a, a knot and a half, maybe two knots slower, but uh, settling for, for less speed, for better direction through the water and, and a real tactical advantage. But uh, it'd be interesting to see if Gibson and Burnett can also do that low and fast mode that we see the Italians using. Yeah, so just to give you a little bit of a, they were going about 13 knots, while the Italians ahead of them were going about 16 knots. So it's a three knot a three knot give up for um, for giving for getting quite a bit of height. So uh, VMG, I think it'd still give it to the Italian mode of, of of bow down and fast, but definitely a weapon in traffic. Yeah, absolutely. Not one that you want to use for too long, but a, a real nice tool to bring out as and when you need it. So it looks to me like there aren't many tactical decisions to be made on this race course. We saw a little bit more variety with the 49er, but increasingly, this is looking like a, a one-way racetrack for the NACRA 17s. And Lisa, how much is that likely to change as, as the afternoon moves on? Because we're coming up for four o'clock local time. The, 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 the highest of the, the heat is, is coming off the day now, and, and we're, we're at the beginning of autumn. So it's getting cooler in the evenings. What effect will that have? Yeah, so... Um it may make the, the right a little bit stronger, but it's definitely going to make things more variable. So, um, so we may see that boats being able to, to especially early on in the race or, or, or lower in the race course as the day goes, tap into a little bit of pressure difference 
um, in various parts of the race course and then try and use that to hook in because the breeze is generally as the sun goes down. So give it another hour or so. Um, so we'll see if the knackers are actually out here for that. Um, but as the sun starts to go down, it will tend to track right. Um, so we will see bigger shifts on the right hand side, but there will be pressure differences. And sometimes the breeze will click back to the left with some pressure where the sea breeze was before. So you might see dying right with big shift, but then some left pressure. So it may get more variable out here as the day goes, but I'm not sure. It's still feeling nice and strong. The wind hasn't dipped. When we see velocity dips, that's when we'll start to see that variability, but we really haven't seen it yet. Okay. And would you, would you let others test the waters out to the left first, or do you like to be the, the one to dip your toe in before the, your rivals try it? Well, for me, I think the big thing is it's going to be it's going to come with a, a variation in um, in the pressure. So I think anybody who who is playing that uh, that change will see it on the water. So you'll have kind of a high confidence that you're actually sailing towards something because it is going to be a pressure difference. Um, so um, I think when that does happen, I think uh, you know it's going to be a this is something that I can get to, and, and, and I'm going to use that in my, in my tactical move. It looks like all three Italians are already on the ley line. And uh, while that is happening, I'm just wondering if you can do any analysis on um, relative speed or, or distance, some of the, uh, the great stats that you've been pulling up for us. Yeah, so, I mean, not surprising currently, Tita and Banti, average speed around the race course so far, well and above the highest. They've got their their choice of mode, especially on this starboard tack ley line. They seem to be really flying when they're going with the swell and they're not going into it. Um, and uh, so their average speed is uh, above 17 knots, and they're the only one to break 17 knots on the average speed around the race course. And a lot of that has to do with their upwind speed that's really dragging that up. Um, the Brits, not surprisingly, have a slower um, average speed than the, uh, than the Italians ahead of them, but they have less distance sailed. So that's their VMG mode, right? That's uh, sailing a little bit less distance, a little bit higher, but a little bit slower. That's keeping them in, in the hunt here. Okay. Interesting difference of approach. And uh, it so shows there's many different ways of uh, skinning these cats at the moment. But Italy 26... Slightly overstood on the lay, lay line. At times, uh, they were touching almost up to 20 knots as they approach here. They're actually getting a tiny bit of a left shift here, and um, their speeds clicked down from what it was before. And uh, they're what doesn't look like they're pinching, but they're actually pinching a little bit to make to make this mark. They again, these boats are so fast that they've got they've got some different modes, but you can see how they're going up and down, and that's actually um, you know they're they're pinching a little bit. If the British were right beside them, they'd be happy because I think they'd be a little bit better in that mode. And the boat looks so twitchy all the time as as they uh, pull out that small bit of uh, Jenica on the bowsprit. Um, come back to what, what I was going to talk about, but let, let's. Uh, there's the gap back to the left, uh, back to the rest, and it's Bistro and Frascari still with a long way to go. So that's a measure of the distance and uh, the increasing gap that Tita and Banti are pulling. But it, it looks like that boat is so twitchy all the time. I can't imagine the level of concentration that these sailors are applying to the sailing. Yeah. So that little click left has made the ley line uh, quite difficult for, um, for Ugolini and Gubaleli. Um, and uh, so the, the British are hot on their heels and they're trying to make up every little bit of distance that they possibly can. So here's the second place Italian team. And then you can see this tight ley line that the third place Italian team is really trying to eke out um, to, get, uh, to get around that mark. Yeah, and if we could just rotate a little bit left, I wonder if we could see the British anywhere. Yeah, so we'll see the British come into, into view, and they're hammering into the mark at 17 knots, trying to, get, um, trying to make up any distance they can on the, uh, um, on the Italians who are ahead of them. And we're on board. This is Maria Jubilee. We're on board with Ugolini and Jubilee just going into a jibe by the look of it, or is that the hoist? Hoist. Okay, that is the hoist. So uh, Maria Jubilee quickly got the Jenica up, arm over arm, hoisting. Now she's taken over control of the Jenica sheet uh, from Ugolini, who was holding it for her. 
and now they're gunnel running to uh, to keep the boat level as they go downwind. Yeah, and you can see her moving forward, trying to get the uh, trying to get the boat pulling down, get, getting her weight um, forward on the uh, on the hulls, and really trying to balance the boat out as they turn down. Gibson and Burnett in a clear fourth place, a lot to make up the gap to third, but also a big comfortable gap back to fifth place. And boats actually, are they even in low riding mode to try and make the uh, the mark here? It looks to me like the Brazilians are actually one float in the water just to try and get around the mark. Yeah, I mean, they, they sail the high mode for quite a while to make that, but faster to do that than to uh, to put in two extra maneuvers. Um, so, you know, they're, I think... After losing their lane with the with the British earlier on in in the uh, in that leg, they're really happy to be rounding right behind the British. Yeah, yeah, and Argentina follow them round, and now it gets busy as this gaggle of boats. That's the French, uh, French fifty one, uh, the Australians, the Finnish, and the Danish, all rounding. You know, basically uh, overlapped. So not long until Italy 26 goes across that finish line. They, uh, they rounded a couple of minutes back, and it takes no time for these boats to, to get down to the bottom of the course. What kind of speed would you say Tita and Banti are doing at the moment? Oh, Tita and Banti are flying down the run right now. They're going uh, 21.6 knots. And you got to think, that's them. You know, you can't really take your foot off the gas pedal too, too much in these boats because they'll they'll get squirrely you know fast boat you got to sail it fast um but you've got to think that they're taking it a little bit easy um, because they've got such a comfortable lead so they are just flying um the italians behind them 19.3 knots and uh and 19.9 knots so you know first place boat they're just you know they're having a time out there in front yeah, I wonder if they actually get a moment to enjoy what they're doing, or is the whole experience so intense that they, they can't really think about anything else? I think they love it. They've got to love it, or else they wouldn't do it. <laughs> um, they, you know, if you're sailing this boat, you've got to love speed. You've got to love being on the edge. And, uh, you know, this is beautiful sailing. So I think they're, uh, you know, I would hope that they're having a great time. Yeah, and... Uh, they, they train in some much tougher conditions than, than this from uh, the conversation you were having with their coach, Gabriella Bruni. But uh, this, this is absolute champagne sailing for foiling boats like this. I think St. Margaret's Bay is really delivering some perfect conditions for foiling catamarans right now. Yeah, so, um, you know, just to, to back it up, as we watch this beautiful sailing by the Italians, um, we saw the Australians jive set around the mark um, and uh, I was just, you know, thinking and wondering how, how that move was going was gonna to play out for them. And they are flying down the run. So as we, as we pan out and, uh, and we get to see the rest of the race course here, um, we're going to see that the Australians are making a move, um, sailing almost down the run line and going in what looks like a lot of pressure and really, really nice position. Jibe successfully completed for Tita and Banti, and they're going past the leeward gate marks, and they are just moments away from crossing the finish line and winning race 13. That will be their 12th race victory here in St. Margaret's, Nova Scotia. Your hat is safe so far. <laughs> yes, I did say that I would eat my hat if, <laughs> if anyone was going to take a race off them today. Well, so far I'm safe, um, and... Uh, for Italy, it doesn't get any better than this because it looks like it's going to be an Italian one, two, three. Yeah, so just at the very, very top of your screen, you can see some big moves. So Australia has jived onto starboard, and they are making their cross all the way across the Danish, the Finnish, and trying to make their way towards the Argentinian and the Brazilians. Now remember, the Brazilians rounded right behind the, um, there was a little bit of a gap, but they were the fifth place boat behind um, Great Britain. So if the Aussies can start to um, start to uh, um, touch the Brit the Brazilians and the Argentinians, that would be a huge move for them. Okay, so if we can rotate the drone to start looking at that battle for the uh, the next places, we've got Ugolini and Jubilee about to cross the line 
in third place. And now we want to see this battle for fourth, fifth and sixth between Great Britain, Brazil and maybe Australia, if Australia have done enough to, to make up the ground on them. But it does... Yeah. It, it, it doesn't, doesn't look like Great Britain is still fairly safe in fourth. Yeah, and actually, it looks like the uh, the Swedes are uh, with a, with um, with a late uh, jibe have uh, have been able. The Australians, after they jibed, were a little slow coming across the uh, the rest of the fleet. Where um, where the group coming out of that uh, that right hand side, I think, were able to stay in their mode a little bit longer. You know, sometimes it's a little hairy when you when you start to. Um, when you start to approach the other boats and you get out of your mode thinking about what your tactical move is going to be and uh, maybe you take the foot off the gas pedal a little bit. So that is the rest of the fleet about to finish race 13 in the Nacras. But uh, I believe that Chris has an interview lined up for us from the 49er fleet that we were watching earlier. Awesome. Here we are. Uh, let's see, we finished, uh, we have one more day left in the racing at the 2022 Worlds 49er FX. I'm with Patricia and Maria Espana 5. Yeah. So, uh, Cinco? Cinco. Yeah. Very good Spanish. <laughs> Fantastic, thank you. Um, so, you know, you've been hovering around in the top 10 uh, a lot of this regatta. You've had really great moments. How did the rest of your day go? Uh, yeah, today a was bit. a good day we for kind us. Of cut out uh, right it was the we... classical day here in Canada with like sea breeze, 12 knots yeah, more or less. I, I mean... We're like um, good stars holding the lane and having good boat speed was crucial. And I think we managed to do that like very well. So we're pretty happy with our consistency. And we're also happy like to race more tomorrow with the same conditions. And I don't know, give some good results that we had in Oman last year. Awesome. Yes, we saw. And as a team, with you and Patricia, the uh, you know going into tomorrow, there should be one more fleet race. Yeah. Uh, before, so the work isn't over yet before the medal race. So you know, how do you approach tomorrow? Is tomorrow just you know you can't even think about the medal race, and it's just one more fleet race? Yeah, I think we're gonna stay calm. You know, I think taking everything step by step and just focusing on our process is the key thing for tomorrow, same as we do every day, and that's what we're gonna focus on. Great. And then one last question for you. As a team, you know, uh, Tamara and Paula on your team are world champions, uh, they're medalists from different classes. Um, how much uh, support do you get from, from your teammates as well? I think it's really good to have like two really strong teams together. And I think having them as team partners would be like really great because they are like very strong. And we're very happy to be together under the same team. Actually, before I f finish, uh, what were some of your goals going into this world and do you think you're starting to achieve those? Yeah, I think we wanted to be in the top 10 and we're achieving that. We, we know we still have one more day, so we're going to focus on that. Um, yeah, so we're very happy right now. Cool, but like in the boat, are you working together the way you, uh, oh, you want to? Of course, yeah. I think that has been one of the key things of this event, that we have been like working very well together and supporting each other. And I think that has been like shown on the races. So. Very good. <laughs> great. Thank you so much. You have a great attitude. So uh, good luck tomorrow. Thank you. And we're going to move on to the next people in the boat park. Perfect. Thank so you. Let's, uh, let's keep moving on. And we're going to kind of slide on down uh, Team Germany. Pretty please. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris. How are you? I'm Freya. I'm good. Freya, right? And what's your sale number? 212. 212. Yeah. OK, cool. Um, so today, uh, did you make the gains that you wanted to make today? I know we have one more race left yeah. uh, before the medal race cut off. Uh, not really. We had a really bad race. So the first race was really bad. The second was better, but not the gains we wanted to make. Right. And what do you think it was? Do you think it's uh, conditions-wise or is it just... Uh... Um, probably the starts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and everyone's been talking about that too. Um, we talked to o o Odile mm -hmm. uh, and Annette at the beginning of the regatta and they said that they kind of filled their... They've learned more recently how to fill their time uh, yeah. leading up to the start. Yeah. And what, what's your process in the pre-start? Um, I think checking the transits, checking time and distance, and um, getting the right compass numbers, yeah, and the right settings. Right. And even with all that today, was it sometimes uh, not being ready to, to pull the trigger at the right time, or is it just it's really tight on your yeah, starting line? Tight. It's tight, and I think in the first race, the problem was that we hit the pin end, so we had to do penalty and had a late start. Right. And that's pretty hard. At time and distance, especially at the pin, is so critical. So in it, and at the boat, it's the same. 
in the middle you have a little bit more leeway. Yeah. But um, do you ever say, uh, like today, was it pretty obvious which end of the line to start on? Um, for us, there was no end where we wanted to start. Our plan was just to go to the right side, so we um, decided to, to do a port, um, st port tech start in the second and third race, so that was our plan. Yeah. And so going into tomorrow, we have one more fleet race left, and I know you feel you know, like you didn't have your best day. Yeah. You had some improvements to, to um, you know, to talk about. But uh, going into tonight and tomorrow, you know, what's your what's your kind of process for kind of resetting if you need to do that? A little too deep of a question, <laughs> or you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. I don't have plan yet, so just um, yeah. And the reason why I ask is because you know a lot of sailors, you know. There's a lot of ups and downs. There's a lot of things in your control and out of your control. Um, and sometimes you remember, you know, that one time where I had, you know, not the greatest day in the world. I did X, Y, and Z, and it and it really set me straight. So I think for us, the most important thing is to have a good team spirit, like that everything is all right uh, between my helm and I. And then there's just some kind of physical, um, how do you say, regeneration. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. And uh, and I hope you get to recover tonight. Yeah. You know, we we'll have one more fleet race tomorrow. Thank you. So you stamp your name on that one. Yeah, thanks. Awesome. Thanks so much. All right, we're going to... Ah, you missed out. <laughs> we're going to continue around the boat park. Uh, we're going to talk with Max and Nevin Snow if they'll give us the time of day. Max, you all take this interview. Pretty yeah, please as you, as you undo knots. <laughs> so... All right. Part of the day. Yeah, exactly. So we've got a 49er Silver Fleet. Mac, ha Max, how do you pronounce your last name? Agnese. Agnese. Yeah. Fantastic. And Nevin Snow, we'll, let, we'll give Nevin a break to uh, clean up the boat. But Max, how did it go in the Silver Fleet today? It was a, it was a fun day. We had good breeze, uh, three good races. And um, for us, you know, we had some good ones, some, some okay ones. So. Well, it was, it was really, uh, it was hard all the way across the board, but did you find it as steady as, um, you know, as all the other courses? All the other courses were relatively steady, but with a lot, bit of weed. Lots of seaweed, for sure. Uh, but yeah, steady and, and awesome awesome conditions, really. Prime 49er sailing, so. Cool. We're going to throw it back to the studio, but, you know, Silver Fleet wasn't your goal for this regatta, uh, but, you know, you're, you have got good company in it. So, you know, can you take some solace in the fact that you've got really great competitors around you and you're still learning a lot? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have... Yeah, the Silver Fleet is full of some of the best guys in the world still, so it's definitely not easy out there, and every boat you're around is a, is a challenging, challenging boat to beat, so still motivated to, to keep fighting. Awesome. Well, still a couple more races tomorrow. Thanks so much, Max. Thank Thanks so much, Nevin, and we're going to send it right back to the studio. Thanks, Chris. Um, and uh, we just got the, uh, the last of the finishers coming across in the NACRA 17, but uh, while Chris had us talking to some FX sailors, let's have a look at the FX leadable because that's the one that we we haven't been watching live today. So um, we've got one race to go tomorrow before the medal race, and as you can see, it's uh, Joe Alley and Molly Meach who are in tenth place with uh, the Olympic champions Grail and Kunz surprisingly back in ninth. Maloney and Hobbs also from New Zealand in eighth. Spain's Suarez and Cantero in seventh. Robel and Shea, um, good day for them. They're up to sixth place. Black and Tidy, bit of a drop for them today with a 23-32-9, a, a bit of a shaky day for the Brits. Mel Zaka, Jankowiak keep on moving up day by day. And uh, it's a bit of a gap to get to the podium tomorrow, uh, but you never know. The Poles are, are doing what they can. Eshogoyen and Bartholo, where they had a bit of a shabby day yesterday, they've made amends uh, today with a 5-7 and a first. Bobek and Nexler, and Nexler, solid day for them, but the best day recorded by the team already at the top of the fleet. And Adil Van Anholt sailing with Annette, Annette Dutz. Adil uh, looking across at her boyfriend, Bart Lambriax, and saying, whatever you can do in the 49er, I can do just as well or better in the 49er FX. So uh, what, a, what a dinner conversation those two are going to have this evening. Lisa, is, is there anyone um, that can take that gold medal away from the Dutch, do you think? Oh, I, you know, at this point, you know, it, it is mathematically possible for, uh, for, you know, especially the Swedes to get in there and mix it up for the gold. Um, but there's, it's clear that they're sailing with so much confidence. I mean, that line, um, 
in the gold in in the, the last few races sorry not gold fleet but in the last few races have really shown that especially with this um especially with this sea breeze they're in their comfort zone and uh they're going to be really really hard to shake off um shake off their uh their current performance yeah so the only uh, the biggest homework they've got to do is is how would they attack day three again if they had to to face that um that was the shaky day for them when they got that 29th and 24th place when it was seemingly completely random and yet the polish and chinese teams show, showed us that there was a way of making sense of the randomness yeah and you know um various sailors especially with the way that they communicate the way that they think and and their comfort on where they want to position themselves on the race course tend to lead them to being really strong in certain conditions um and then also with their strengths you know if you're fast a day like today just you know, can make it look easy. So, um, you know, when it's not a speed game and it's and it's really variable, um, sometimes even you know really really strong competitors can get really shaken off their game because you can be in really uncomfortable positions, but you're going towards what you think or know is gonna is is gonna pay. And uh, so, you know, the Polish and the Chinese showed incredible patience on that day. Yeah, and it was great to see that day. We really enjoyed it uh, from a commentator's point of view. Um, but uh, really, really mentally challenging for the sailors. Now, I, I don't know if we have a, a start time for the next NACRA 17 race. Um, if we don't, I would like to go to interview 21, uh, which is with the Kiwi NACRA 17 sailors, uh, Wilkinson and Dawson. Um, they did really well on on the first day, and also did, they also did really well on that uh, on that random day. So they were good in the really strong winds and and good in the really light and fluky. Um, let's hear what Wilkinson and Dawson have to say from New Zealand. Okay, all right, we're, we're nearly there. We're nearly there. Um, so, yeah. We can just, just talk go us back. through those figures that yeah. you were analyzing from the last race. So we can just go back to a little bit of what, what was really at play um, on, that, on that first race that we saw with the NACRAs, and speed is king. Um, you know, uh, Tita and Banti and, and Bracero and, and uh, Frascari, they sailed more distance than the other boats by, you know, not an insignificant amount, but they were faster. And so at the end of the day, if you can get the bow down and you can get rolling and you've got the lane to do it, Speed is king. And, uh, you know, that's one of the things that the other boats are going to be watching is how do we get how do we get going? How do we use our lane? You know, I think the British aren't quite there yet. When they have the lanes, they're wishing that they were all sailing in traffic and uh, because that's their strength right now. And so I think, uh, you know, people are going to be trying to up their top speed because that's what the Italians have been able to do. OK, we'll come back to that data analysis in a bit. But let's go to that interview with Wilkinson and Dawson. All right, we are at the 2022 NACRA 17 Worlds. We are finished with day three. And the one thing that we've noticed with the NACRA is, man, you guys have been, it's been a pretty up and down day for absolutely everyone. But the one thing I noticed today was that people would come out of attack and they'd be in a high mode and someone would be foiling, you know, right you know in front of them and there'd be like a 20 or 30 degree difference in angles. It, was that like the same for everyone or was everyone trying to do the same thing all day long? I think it was a, a lot of your foiling was strategic and you know it was a day where you know the pressures were all over the place and if you were foiling but you know we, we came off the last start really nicely and just foiled to never never land you know so it was it was quite tactical when you chose to and when not to and some people were going for you know foiling hard for a pressure they thought they saw and some people were um yeah high moding and it's all, all about kind of strategic linking it eh? yeah linking the pressure really now, and Erica, are you guys talking through that whole thing? Like, is there just this rolling dialogue? And who usually makes the right call in that between the two of you? Uh, yeah, we're literally talking nonstop about the pressure today. Um, yeah, it was definitely a, a strategic day rather than a boat speed day. Um, and, yeah, I guess we both make decisions. I kind of look quite long term and then um, upwind and then Micah kind of has the final say and then Micah just takes on all of the downwind. I don't really look around at all downwind, I'm just focusing on boat speed. Yeah. Cool. Well, one of the things I did want to learn, you're doing great, you know, it's a long regatta, um, but I want to know what, did, what were you, we talked to you a lot in Denmark and that was a great regatta for you both. And what have you, what have you taken away from that? What, do you, what, what were you working on between uh, the Europeans and now? 
We had a great trip to Marseille at the Olympic venue. We spent um, five weeks there burning around, trying to improve on you know, some of the weaknesses we had um, from the Europeans. Is there any one specific one you can share with us? Um, I mean, we're always working on our upwind foiling speed. You can see the Italians are just rapid, so we're just spending our, our days trying to you know, find that extra gear that they seem to have. Awesome. And Erica, for you, um, spending, and I don't know about Micah, but uh, you guys have a really full schedule. You know, that was an awful lot of training, awful lot of training at the Olympic venue, super valuable. Um, but what are you doing these days to take a break? Are you in studies? Or are you trying to get a vacation in here and there? What's the, what's the break from this? Uh, yeah, a bit of both, bit of study, a um, bit of holidays, but yeah, I've been overseas since March, so it's been a big stint in Europe, so um, yeah, looking, yeah, and then now Canada, so yeah, I'll be looking forward to get getting home eventually. But there's kind of a big break now between now and the next major regatta? Yeah, yeah, so we'll go home to New Zealand, um, and then we'll probably head back to Europe early next year, um, but yeah, we'll just be training in New Zealand the end of this year. Cool, and last question is, being Kiwis, you know, back at home, we're getting, you know, we're two years out. We're going to be like inside of two years out from the Olympic Games. Uh, you're really aiming for that slot, aiming to qualify the country. Um, at home, do you guys have any obligations to kind of like talk to the kids, talk to the sponsors around the country? Um, we're kind of, not a lot this year, just because we've been away the whole time. Um, but yeah, we look forward to, you know, engaging, doing some coaching when we get home. It's always nice to give back um, in our sport. We get amazing support from Yoda New Zealand High Performance Sport. So here we give back where we can for sure. Awesome. Well, it's showing. So thank you for sharing. Um, it's nice to see that you like to sail with one boot. <laughs> um, but good luck for the rest of the regatta. And thanks for teaching us about the different modes and how they're used. So thanks much appreciated. Much. All right, we'll keep walking around the park and we'll see you back at the studio. Micah Wilson and uh, Wilkinson and Erica Dawson, uh, the top Kiwis and doing really, really well here. Um, chasing the, the, the top few, a possibility of a podium if they sail the last few races really well. So they're in the hunt. Um, meanwhile, we saw that Italian 1-2-3, and uh, the team that was second in that race uh, were Vittorio Bissaro and Mael Frascari. We had an interview with them a little bit earlier in the regatta. Let's hear from them. Welcome back to the 2022 49er, 49er FX, and NACRA 17 Worlds here in Nova Scotia. I am with Vittorio Bissaro and Mael Frescari. Frescari. And today, windy waves, probably some of the hardest conditions yeah, for foiling 14, boats, 13, right? 12, so today I agree. 12, 14, it was a really nice day. We expected it, like the it? first day of the championship, and I'm glad we did it. Well, so I'm run into power I have a good feeling today, here. and uh, oh, yeah? it was also yeah. tough on the yeah, water. Okay. Pretty good day. Victoria, how do you I think about a race like this versus, you know, like 15 knots in flat water? Is that is, the new machine? What's, how do you approach a race like this? Yeah. Well, it's huh. not that different. Must be hungry, sure. that uh, SAP stuff. In terms uh, of yeah, trimming of the boat, it's not the same. <laughs> you m need to be more tough in terms of uh, keeping up uh, and keep pushing also if you have a crash or a little bumps or a little injury because it's not a smooth condition, it's a harsh condition, but uh, it's always the same story. So try to have a good start, try to take the first shift and be fast. Awesome, well the last question I'm gonna ask you about is the physical side of things. And we know that with the new rudder arrangement, the loads are higher. You have so much more riding moment because you're just yanking down on the weather hull go. and lifting the leeward hull. Um, for today, uh, what were those loads like on your body and then how do you recover from a day like today? Like what part of your body is, is the most affected by a day like today? I think the arms, the hands, and of course my back. So I always try to put my foot on the ceiling and doing a square, that's the, the best thing. You can also fall asleep like this and then also take off a bit some tension from the hamstrings of the of the arms. Any sign this of a start is, uh, time this yet? Is pretty good uh, the things that I do. And also at the end some cream mm. at the end okay. of the day. Yeah. <laughs> for a good recovery. Now for Vittorio, do you have the same loads on your body as Mael does while you're sailing? No. For sure not. The crew job is pretty tough. And these uh, girls are impressive. In a day like this, they keep up with the uh, uh, performance of the boat, uh, always pushing. So I would say that 95% of the recover job is uh, on May. I just need to relax and be ready for tomorrow. 
And anything special for tonight to recover from a big day? I'll have a lobster. <laughs> awesome. Well, that'll help, right? A nice rich meal. Yeah, exactly. So, mangiare. So, awesome. Well, we'll let these guys go and we'll stick around the boat park for the 2022 Worlds. Thanks so much. So that was filmed a couple of days ago. You can see how different the conditions were on that day. Um, and uh, Maya Frascari saying she was going to have lobster. Well, lucky her. But th there's lots of lobster in this part of the world. It, it's famous for it, isn't it? And the, the lobster roll is, is one of the local delicacies. But um, 30 or 40 years ago, lobster, lobster was the food of the poor. It was. It was. There was actually a revolt in the prisons um, where I, I can't remember exactly what what uh, what time frame this was, but um, and they were successful. The um, um, the inmates were saying it's inhumane to serve us lobster day in and day out. Can you imagine? <laughs> so there you go. Talk about first world <laughs> problems in prison. <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> anyway, enough of the lobster. Uh, where where are we at with the NACRA 17 racing? Are we, do we have a start time in place yet? And do we have any images from the race course? Okay. So um, what do we make of that last race? Bearing in mind, we, we know the importance of getting out to the right-hand side. What are you going to do? You're going to start on port tack and try and duck through on the starboard tackers? Or maybe there won't even be any starboard tackers. Do you think we're going to see the whole fleet start on port this time? <laughs> maybe, maybe. Maybe they'll just all line up on port. I feel like the, if, if that happens, there's going to be one brave soul who's going to try and start on starboard and take the, them all out. Oh, the party pooper who's yeah, going to spoil yeah. it for everyone. Yeah, and that'll, that'll be just akin to the, uh, to the port tacker that goes all the way across and then ends up last because they went to the wrong side of the race course. So, oh, I've done that before. Yeah, so, um, you know, it's, it's a tricky business, right, where especially when, uh, when maneuvers are so costly, you know, you're, you're, um, you're, you're trying to gauge where you want to start, whether you want to be that the Italians again, um, Tita and Banti did a really good job of starting above the group um, and having a really, really nice spot, comfortable place above everybody going back over to the right. So here you go. We've got lots of boats over there by the pin and you, you've, you're, you got to think all those boats are going to be wanting to start on, on port. And here are the Brazilians at this end of the line. It looks like the Brazilians are going to try and, spoil the uh, the port tack party up at the other end of the line but i'm thinking lisa today between the 49ers and the nacras i think we've seen more races won from port tack starts than we have from starboard tack starts yeah we may very well have yep um that'll be an interesting stat to take a look at for sure with the uh, with the race line so here we've got two brazilian boats trying to uh trying to break up the party of uh of the port tackers coming over here and, uh, you know, we're into the last 30 seconds. And, you know, those starboard tack boats are going to try and make it as hard as they can for the port tackers. Looks like there is a little bit of pressure over there on the, on the left. But um, that's probably something to get sucked into and, and not be so reliable. Just coming up to 10 seconds, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5. Everyone clear so far. 3, 2, 1. Looks like a clear start. And they're off. Really nice start for Canada out the middle of the line on starboard. But uh, is anyone going to be able to get clean across the starboard tackers on port? It looks like somebody might just manage it. But no, I don't think so. So the starboard tackers have spoiled the party. But out on this side, breaking out into clear air, it's Ugolini and Jubilee Italy 98. Third in the previous race. And they've got a nice clear lane out to the right-hand side, as do a couple of boats uh, to windward of them, and I can't yet identify them, um, but some uh, some fast starters on port. Yeah, so the the Dutch are there on the top of your screen, um, and they had a really nice start um, close to the uh, close to the pin, and it looks like they're dialing into a little bit of that pressure that was that appeared to be on the top left of the screen um, and the top left of the uh, of, of the course. They look like they're having a little bit of problem, though. They they just um, popped up some wake, so we'll have to see um, see how this works out for them. Um, yeah, so they're so, so the Dutch doing really well, as you said, um, sort of uh, on the left hand side of the pack. Yeah, they're basically you know because because almost everybody is um, is on port heading out. They're kind of middle of the race course but definitely on top um it's a nice spot i i uh, i really like that spot but do they have the speed to leg it out 
over this and limit some of the um, some of the leverage that a boat like Italy 98 is going to end up having. So it, Italy 98 looking really good, but I see another Italian flag right in the middle of our screen that is definitely second, if not third row, and it's got that sort of windward heel attitude to it. I'm I'm just wondering who that is. Yeah, so that is um, Italy 26. That's Tita and Banti. They're in some traffic. They're below a whole bunch of boats. And uh, we'll have to scroll back to see how they ended up getting there because we kind of lost them off the start. Um, but it, it looks like I, they, may have, uh, they may have had a little bit of trouble um, finding a lane on starboard, uh, or sorry, on port um, after that start. So we've got, uh, this, is, this might be um, hat-eating territory <laughs> that we're getting into right now. I might have to eat my hat in in this race, but uh, Teeter and Banty proved me wrong. Let's see what you can do from a second or third row start because you've got some work to do this time. But you look how different the attitude of their boat is compared with the other boats around them. They, they really do stand out. Yeah, they do. I mean, they're so steady and, and they're really pulling their boat over to windward on top of themselves. Um, and that's a really hard thing to do. You can see the, uh, the finisher actually doing a nice job of it just to windward. And you got to be thinking, with the Italians behind them, they are trying to get into a mode that they've probably never been in um, today, um, just trying to make sure that they're uh, making it as hard as they possibly can on those Italians. Yeah, and uh, Sinem Kurtbe and Axeli Keskinen, the most right-hand boat, as you see our picture at the moment, doing a really nice job. They're slightly higher than Ugolini and Jubilee, and um, they are, they've, they're in a very good mode at the moment. And they've got some of that Italian-style windward heel attitude about that Finnish boat as well. Yeah, and the, the Dutch, um, you know, we saw that they, they started right at the pin in that left pressure. They're, the Italian 71, it, they're above the Dutch, the boat that's poking out there um, all the way over on the left. They're just, there does seem to be a little bit of left pressure um, coming out of the, the middle of this race course right now. Um, and then above them even still, the Brazilians um, who started on starboard, you saw, so they are going to be one of the leftmost boats. They're tracking okay right now, but as this starts to fade, likely over here on the right-hand side, um, I think those far left boats are going to have a lot of trouble getting across. Um, I kind of like the position of the two middle boats, um, the Dutch and Italian 71. So we'll see what happens um, as the, uh, the Finnish and the, and the Italians get to the point where they need to tack. But the Finnish doing really well with their moating right now. Aren't they? they? They look high and fast. They just go into attack just as we talk about them. So here's, here's the moment. And Italy 26 also tack in the middle of your screen in the distance. Uh, so that's Ruggiero, Tita and Caterina Banti tacking. And on this side of the course, we see France 571, Billy Besson and Noah Ancian also tacking. And now it's the Italians closest to our screen. Sorry, it's the Swedes, actually. The, uh, the Swedes that have just tacked. And they were making good ground on this side of the race course. But this looks a little bit different to the last race. I, I think there are changes afoot on this race course. Yeah, you know, right at the start, it did look like there was a little bit of that of pressure left. So, um, and the uh, um, the Italians really hooked into it nicely. And uh, I mean, right now we've got the French all the way over on the left, tracking like they're the leaders. Um, but uh, I'd be nervous being able to get back across. Um, you know, they're going to have to wait for something really nice to uh, to make it a um, just to just to give you a reference. The French are basically rum line on the race course, even though they're the furthest left. So we're still playing the right-hand side of the course. Um, as far as the geometry goes, you know, our left-hand boats are in the center of the race course. So here's Italy 71 going across on port tack. Very close port starboard there for Italy 71, but it looks like they got away with it. And that's Bissero and Frascari. And they're a little bit ahead of Italy 98. They were one of the best that went to the right-hand side. So it looks like there, is, there are more legs to uh, the left-hand side of this course now. Things have changed. And as we get later in the day, it's 4.30 local time in Nova Scotia. It seems like maybe the left-hand side is beginning to give some opportunity. Yeah, and again, we did talk about that uh, left pressure, but, you know, right shift um, potential. So you could see Italy hooked into that pressure, Italy 71, 
hooked into that pressure, but they didn't want to they didn't want to lead back. Now, interestingly enough, who is tracking first? None other than Tita and Banti. So they did that early tack underneath the group. They tacked underneath, but when everybody else went, and it does seem like they're um, you know, they're using their speed, using their modes to get their bow ahead and to uh, to keep themselves in phase with what's going on here. Is that another case of boat speed making them a tactical genius? Did they do something with that extra click of speed to get them through a thin lane that other people wouldn't have managed to do? Yeah, I mean, they're able to execute something that somebody else may not. They, you know, they saw that there was that right shift that everybody kind of wanted to tack on. Um, and I think they saw also that you wanted to exit from the right not go all the way to the edge and so they took the tack early and made their lane work and then they've got the modes to be able to do that and make the lane work and uh they are putting on the jets um they're they were going 14 knots when the boat above them was um you know and now they've got uh, the finish right on their hips can we see that there yeah they've got their finish right on their hips so they've switched modes again, and now they're going high mode to make sure that they can get around the mark. Tactical genius, they tacked on the ley line. That early tack was on the ley line. Italy 71, who was leading, went way beyond the ley line. So when we saw Italy 26 do its first tack, that is the tack that put them... They've only, they've only, they've done, only done one, one tack. tack. That was the tack on the ley line. And so they were able to see through all that traffic and just be like, we got to get out of here. We're too far over to the right. Wow, that's incredible. So such vision on the race course. It's so much easier to see those things from our bird's eye view with the drone, and they're seeing it from sea level. So that is, it uh, looks like my hat is safe again because Tita and Banty are around Mark 1 in first place. I can't quite believe that I'm saying that. Uh, and the finish are around in second with a bit of a crash down, a bit of a, a, a messy um, turn around the mark for second place Finland. And I can't quite make out We've the got next Argentina, boats. and then uh, and then Italy 71, and then Sweden, and a bit of a gap back to Sweden, back to uh, sixth place boat after that. But this that was a phenomenal first beat sail by Tita and Banti, and tactically brilliant. Yeah, I mean that was uh, that was really nice. I don't know if they knew that they were going to be on the ley line. But um, the boats were so far out on the right that any more right is just going to basically take you for, like, further and further above the ley line. And you can't make any gains at that point. And you're just ending up following people into the mark. And that's yeah. not where you want to be. Quite amazing. So what a giveaway by uh, the likes of Ugolini and Jubilee and the others that went so far out to the right. But very easy to say here from the commentary booth. Much easier to get those or much harder to get those judgments right when you're in the thick of it sailing a, a foiling catamaran at 16 knots up wind yeah and Ugolini and, Ju and Jubilee they ended up um you know rounding in in seventh or eighth um so it was a costly mistake to end up going so far yeah after such a great start and uh, so there you see at the top of your screen Italy 26 stretching away already to a 100 meter advantage over Kurt Bay and Keskinen from Finland with Magellani and Bosco from Argentina in third. Bissero and Frascari currently holding fourth just behind the Argentinians and a bit of a gap back to Gibson and Burnett from Great Britain in fifth. So if we are seeing some pr pressure differences on the race course, I think people are going to have to keep on their toes a little bit here on when they jive and, uh, and, and how they sail their lanes. The Aussies way back um you know uh they rounded i'm not sure exactly even where when they rounded but they did a early jibe and uh they're firing down the uh the inside very close to the rum line on this race course again it it seems to be that it looks really good from the from the beginning but it's a matter of can you get across the group of boats that tack out of that straight set yeah yeah Oh, I just saw a, another patch of weed that the Italians went past, and it's a good reminder that uh, sometimes... Oh, there's a big change of direction there as well. I'm not sure what that was. But you, can, you can see that splash of white water where they suddenly changed direction. So some really aggressive steering at times, and I can't tell if that's driven by the conditions or, or trying to avoid uh, small patches of weed. 
And look how dynamic the uh, the crew movement is. So much steering and so much coordinated body movement that has to go in line with that steering. Yeah, I mean, if you make a mistake with these boats um, on the downwind and and you get uh, you know you get too much heel, um, you know, if you lift a foil out of the water, you're done. So you know they've got to be so dynamic and so careful um, to make sure that they keep that stick up stick upright. I thought for a moment that Kurt Bay and Keskinen might be getting a piece of them from further down to Leward, but uh, it looks fairly safe for Italy at the moment. It depends where their ley line is as well. But Finland is not going slowly down this run. No, they're not. They are they are firing on all cylinders. They've they they jibed last, so and they were able to come up underneath a little bit hotter angle, a little bit faster speed, and make sure that they're ahead of the Argentinians and the Italians behind them. And uh, yeah, they're closing little bits of gap and going fast. They seem to be the consistently fastest boat, the team from Finland at the moment. So that's encouraging for them. And uh, they are keeping the, uh, they're holding the feet, sorry, the fire to the feet of the Italians on 26. But upwind, can they match them? Because Finland had Italy squared away behind them in the early stages of that first beat. And after that tack between both of them, as soon as they tacked, the advantage started to swing to Italy 26, and it just shows that the Italians appear to have an extra click of speed on the upwind legs. Yeah, Finland and, and Italy are uh, the only ones breaking average 19 knots on this downwind, so they're both firing on all cylinders going really, really fast down this run. Now coming down to the bottom gate, what is the decision? To me, it's not as clear as it was for the 49er races early on. What are they, what are they going to choose? They're going to choose a straightforward right-hand turn. So that's uh, no jibe required for that. Um, so that's going to have Italy going in, going in towards the shore on the right-hand side. Yeah, so we've got um, Italy 26, Finland and Argentina. The leaders all going out to the right right now. Um, they're rounding in some some right shift. Um, the pressure is still up, so they're firing it out to the right now. I think that af the athletes probably feel like they're back to a little bit of a drag race out to the right. Um, maybe they feel like it's a little bit more stable. There was definitely a little bit of a shift there on the first upwind. On the uh, the top right of the screen, it looks like there's more breeze on that side of the course. I don't I don't know if that's real, but it it looks like Italy 26 are in softer breeze where they are right now. And I just wonder if they're missing out on anything. Yeah, I can uh, check the speeds and see if anybody is going faster. Yeah, so uh, the Dutch have rounded the uh, the other gate. They're the, they were the first ones to round the other gate. And uh, they're going 14 knots, and the Italians are going 15.2. So Not um, much to indicate there's anything better on the other side of the course. No, no, not really. So we'll see. Um, the Dutch have just tacked. Um, so we'll see if, uh, if they look any better coming back across against uh, the other boats on and the right. A boat coming in slowly here. I'm not sure what's up, but it, it, does, it doesn't, doesn't look quite right. Just uh, getting the kite down now and about yeah. to round up. I don't know if it's the angle that we're seeing it from, but the, you, you can see the... Uh, the difference in handling of these boats further back down the fleet. Yeah, there's a big learning curve in this in this fleet right now, especially with the uh, the new rudder equipment. Um, and uh, and you know, again, the fleet's always regenerating with uh, younger sailors coming in. You know, the uh, foiling programs and the wasp programs are always you know um, bringing more and more younger athletes into these foiling classes. So. Um, there's going to be a big disparity in the uh, in the handling of these boats um, as you get back in the fleet. And you can see different uh, types of performance. The boat at the top of the picture foiling really nicely and in danger of sailing over the top of the boat to lure it if that doesn't get up on the foils. So we've seen one of the biggest right shifts of the day um, currently on the race course right now. So um, the boats that rounded that right gate um, just took a... Uh, they just made a huge gain, um, and we can see um, we've got the speeds of the of the boats up right now. You can see Tita and Banti are just flying 15 knots um, versus uh, you know this the, the um, 
12 knots. Oh, they must have just taken a tack because that's uh, fairly slow for, uh, or else they've got a big patch of weeds, the Swedes. Well, if we can get back to Teeter and Bounty, that would be great. I don't know if we have that option. There we go. That's the uh, the boats we were just looking at um, in graphic form. So that's two Chinese boats and the Americans that we were just looking at. But let's reconnect with the front of the fleet if we can and find out how things are playing out between the Italians and the Finnish team with Great Britain now up into third place. Yeah, so just to the right of the Aussies here, you can see the trails just disappearing. That's the leading group that have tacked in that massive righty. Um, and uh, Tita and Bandy have gone pretty far. They had such a big lead. It'll be interesting to see if they overstood. Um, they made so many gains not overstanding on the first, the, first, uh, uh, the first beat. Here we are. We can see some of the leaders um, in, this, in this group um, after they tack. The finish are tracking it in second. But I think the finish have done a nice job of picking a lane coming back. And uh, there's Tita and Banti, um, you know, uh, pretty high on the ley line, but uh, going really fast. Yeah, going really fast, but um, they've committed to that ley line early, and it looks like Finland's on a pretty good heading, looking like they're hoping for some kind of shift back to the left. Great Britain also tacked pretty much on the line of Italy 26 and up into third ahead of the Argentinians. But that could be one to watch, the battle between Great Britain and Argentina for third and fourth place. Yeah, so with that really big right shift, if there is a slow click back to the left, that's really going to favor the finish, um, especially on the, on the British having, um, having a little bit of uh, legs out to that left-hand side. Um, so we'll have to see two extra maneuvers Will that be costly for the for the finish, um, or and will they be able to to um, to make some moves on the, on the British? Yeah, if you were a laser, you'd definitely rather be where Finland is compared with Great Britain. But the tack loss of doing two extra tacks in a high speed boiling catamaran that's the thing that might tell against Kurt Bay and Keskinen. Yeah, exactly. And again, you can see uh, Tita and Banti are barely falling below 16 knots. They're, they've got, I think, they're pretty confident about their ley line call right now, and they are flying. Um, the rest of the boats aren't getting over 16 knots almost ever. So, um, you know, that just shows you the, 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 uh, the mode that these guys can get in that uh, everybody else is struggling to find. And that is the shot that everyone is keen to see at the moment. What makes this boat go so fast? And it always looks so steady. Well, not always, actually. Even these guys have their moments. But they are the, uh, the steadiest boat in the fleet and often the most windward heeled. They don't look super windward heeled at the moment, but I don't know if that's the angle that we're seeing them from. Yeah, I think they're pressing quite a bit right now because they're a little bit over 17.5. Yeah, so they're they're high on the ley line. They're coming down with speed, um, which is probably limiting their ability to um, to do that windward heel press. Um, but they are flying into the mark at 17 over 17 knots. The this uh, the finish to leeward of them are really trying to make bow out gains on the the British who are, again, trying to make the mark with, with Tita and Banti without, making, uh, without having an extra maneuver. So um, their speeds have been up above the, uh, the British, so we'll see how this plays out as they come into the mark. Let's see how steady they can keep it on this leg across to the purple spacer mark. It's really difficult to keep the boat flying steady. We see, we see a lot of splashdowns at this point in the race with uh, Banty concentrating, getting the first bit of the Jenica out. Will Rajit Tita be able to keep the boat on its foils all the way through the maneuver? So far, so good. And it looks like that was a clean hoist with no splashdowns. Yeah, that was really nice. Textbook one. Um, you know, I think they, they knew that we got the drone footage of the last one and they wanted to, they wanted to prove that they could do it. 
And looking back at that, I can't believe I was even worried about having to eat my hat. I mean, <laughs> looking back on that fairly mediocre start that they made and, and just how quickly they turned that around. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was impressive. And again, capitalizing on others' mistakes and, uh, you know, and then having a little bit of, well, a lot of bit of extra speed making you look smart too. So, you know, there's a couple of things going in there. But uh, just on your screen here, here's the Swedes making something happen with the British. Um, and again, this is different moding um, and, uh, and, and using a little bit of uh, tactical advantage to, uh, to put the heat on. They're going to be behind the British, but not by much. So this might be a little bit of a battle for the downwind. Yeah, but having said that, I mean, Kurt Bay and Kessingen, they were in second place, weren't they? So, I mean, for all, for all them playing the middle of the course, that, that has given the position away to Britain. Yeah, you're right, actually. I was thinking that the British were ahead on the, on the rounding. I think they, they just uh, they followed my advice to just bang a corner and not yeah. think too hard about it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but no, that is a, that's a change between second and third. So those extra tacks that we were concerned about uh, for Kurt Bay and Keskin, is, that's, that's worked against them. But it's still a bit of a gap back to Bissero and Frascari. The Italians in fourth place who are leading this next pack around just ahead of Argentina. And it looks like uh, Sweden are going to come round behind them. So Bissera and Frascari having a good day. Second in the first race of the day, fourth in this race. So uh, a good return to form for the Italians Bissero and Frascari in Ita 71. Yeah, so the, the British, to your point, the British actually... By uh, keeping it simple and min minimizing maneuvers, actually passed uh, three boats to move up to second. Um, so, uh, so they did a, a, a very good job of of passing um, the Italians and the Finnish. Okay, so that's that's how things are playing out at the moment with the top ten. Ugolini and Jubilee back in tenth, only going around the Wimber Mark now, just behind Waterhouse and Darmanin from Australia. So. Uh, pretty surprising after a really good start by Ugolini and Jubilee, but just uh, overstanding the ley line and, and um, not anticipating that big right-hand shift that happened on the first beat. So quite a gap back from 10th place Ugolini and Jubilee going for the jive and why not because uh, with that gap uh, they don't have too much to worry about behind them they might as well use the jive as an opportunity to go on the attack against australia 5 and sweden 14 create the split see what happens we've seen it work for other teams today we saw it work for netherlands one in the 49er um, going from 12th to 8th on the final run down to the finish for the leading 49er. There's a simultaneous jibe between Sweden and Australia, but it looks like Australia might get down over the top of Sweden. This might be Waterhouse and Darmanin's opportunity to overtake Jerud and Jonsson. But Jerud and Jonsson are up and running, and now it's a drag race between Australia and Sweden. And meanwhile, out on the far side, Italy 98, looking to make the best of that jibe away from the rest. And Vandermeer and Bauer, quite late to jibe the Dutch 505 compared with some of the others, but it looks like it might be working out quite nicely for them. Yeah, I mean, we saw that before with, um, uh, with I think, the Swedish actually coming in. Um, Oh, a bit oh. of a splash down there by the Italians just before the finish as yeah. they are about to take the race win of race 14, their 13th yeah. victory. Um, so you can see that wake where they did the jibe. A bit of a sloppy jibe, but does it matter? Because they have won by an absolute country mile. Um, any, any idea what the, the meter count is back to Gibson and Burnett? And so, oh, there we have it, 600 yeah. meters. Yeah, wow. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that's commanding lead. Um, especially seeing as they were fighting for every every inch on the first half of that upwind. Uh, so it's about a 17-kilometer racetrack, and 
So they are when you when you think six hundred meters, that's quite a high proportion of the racetrack, isn't it? The British have done a really nice job on this downwind of uh, sailing fast and a little bit lower than the finish, and they've made some distance on them. And I think they're going to be very happy with uh, you know clawing back from a fifth place. I think around the first the first beat um, to uh, to come in here with a uh, um, with a second place. Um, the Finnish have uh, had a little bit of work to keep their air clear on the Argentinians and the Italians be behind them, but uh, they'll have a solid third place there as well. Yeah, and the Brits are really in a battle in the overall standings with Finland. We'll look at that afterwards when, when this race is over. Um, but this is quite a key battle and, and, and an important turnaround in fortunes uh, for Great Britain um, looking to get ahead of Finland in the overall standings. So Gibson and Burnett... The Olympic silver medalists coming across the line behind the uh, Olympic gold medalists from Italy. And Kurt Bay and Keskinen looking safe for third place, but a few regrets for them not to have held on to second. And in the very early stages, probably leading the race as well before that charge by Italy 26. Yeah, and then you've got Becerio and um, Fascari coming right behind them with the white kite there. Um, and, uh, you know, they'll, they'll cross the line very close to the pin end in, uh, in fourth place with the Dutch, I think being able to squeeze a jibe in right ahead of Argentina, just at the line. That's a close finish by the Dutch and the Argentinians, but I think you got to hand it to the Dutch there. Yeah. Very good performance by the Dutch. Magdalani and Bosco currently lying in 10th overall and looking pretty secure to get into the medal race because there's actually quite a gap now between the top 10 and, and the, the points between 10th and 11th place. So Argentina is looking very likely that they're going to be competing in the, uh, the medal race tomorrow afternoon. And two Swedish boats finishing... Um Finishing 7th and 8th with uh, Italian 98 right behind them in ninth place. Squeezing in between um, squeezing in between the Auss Aussies, Waterhouse and, Dam and Darmian, I think, uh, losing a Which little bit on the, on the Italians. They did. So, so the, uh, the jibe by Ugolini and Jubilee uh, soon after the win with Mark has got them ahead of the Australians on that final downwind. So... It, it was a punt worth taking for Italy, and it's it's gained them a point back. He had yeah. a Waterhouse and Darman in. Every point counts in this in this regatta, and uh, so you know um, they're going to be at least happy the fact that they were able to to get that back. Now that wasn't a straightforward victory for Teeter and Bancy, even though they won by six hundred meters at the end. Um, I just wonder if uh, there's any stats that we can look at that uh, that sort of help us work out what was going right and what was going wrong for, for various teams in that one. I'll give you a, a little bit of time uh, to think about that. I'm just wondering if, we could, if we've got time for an interview uh, before the, the next race. So um, we'll see if we can tee something up before the next one. So, um, yeah, just looking at the, at the stats, um, you know, in the, in the last race when Tita and Banty uh, won the start, basically, and then had their pick of the lane, you know, they sailed fast and they sailed a little bit of extra distance in order to sail fast. In this one, they were the fastest around the race course um, and they sailed a little bit less distance. And that, I think, all had to do with that ley line call. And so you can see that um, uh, the Finnish and the Italian, uh, Italy 71 um, and the Dutch all sailed quite a bit of extra distance than um, the British and, and, uh, and Tita and Banti. So... Um, but Tita and Banti's top uh, average speed over the race course, 16.63. Um, you know, the next boat that comes close is actually um, Swedish, Sweden 14 at 16.28. They sailed a lot of extra distance to get that speed, um, and they were in seventh place. So, you know, all of the top five, um, none of them barely broke six, 16 knots, whereas they were over you know, um, over 16.5. So big speed difference for them. Now, one of the Swedish teams that's uh, had some pretty good scores from time to time, uh, we saw them just seventh in that race, is uh, Svensson and Dakhammer. And uh, we got an interview with them earlier on this week. Let's hear from them. 
Welcome back to the 2022 Worlds and the NACRA 17 class. We just finished up day three, and I'm with Ida and Marcus from Sweden. And you guys had a pretty good day today, right? Even though it was kind of light? Uh, we had a, we had a, actually a quite tricky day in two first races. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't manage to get out on the left side where most of the pressure was. So uh, struggling in starts, but then the last race we managed to get a good clear start and get out there. So uh, it's pretty nice. Awesome. And one of the reasons why I want to talk to you was about that uh, third race of the day. And on the upwind leg, the one thing that I noticed, there was a camera angle between you guys and Ailey 26, uh, Roji and Kata. And where you were leading that pair, there was, a, there was a long stretch where you were on starboard, foiling upwind, hammer down, everyone's going about the same speed. Then when you tacked, I just noticed that when the boat's flying a hull, you're pointing like 20, 30 degrees higher than the other person. And then when you put the hull down and start trying to foil, you go straight back down to that other person. So Marcus, maybe just tell me about that kind of exchange and what everyone was trying to do on that beat. Uh, yeah, so we had actually lost the uh, foiling just before the tack. And so hence after that, we go and in, roll into the tack, try to block the Italians so they, because they are coming fully foiling as we tack, try to block them. I think we did what we could, but then it takes a while to adjust the uh, settings on the boat before we can go up on the force again. Gotcha. So to get really technical, if you're foiling into the tack, it's easier to foil out of the tack? Well, you carry more speed through. Mm -hmm. So then you're at a higher speed after, and then you're more likely to foil again earlier on the next tack. Are we, uh, as observers, are we being too simple to think that, you know, it's all about when to foil and when not to foil on a day like today? Oh, uh, it is pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you get a pressure and you get foiling and you just go so much faster. So it's, uh, it's all about the, the speed and the pressure, so. Cool, and let's work this way a little bit. And to um, just help learn a little bit on that side of things, downwind, um, what your, one of your teammates, Emil, was telling us that sometimes you can look downwind and then look forward for the next puff. Was that the case today a little bit? Um, I mean, today was quite tricky on the downwind. Sometimes you could have the pressures coming in from behind, mm -hmm. so you really needed to have your eyes outside the boat. Mm -hmm. And yeah, hopefully you spot the next pressure. But when you're up and foiling, then you start to look forward? Yeah. That's cool. <laughs> I gave you a yes, no question. <laughs> Looking for some elaboration. <laughs> no, yeah, no worries. That's my fault. <laughs> anyway, well, great. And I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you, you know, it's, you're taking it one day at a time. Yeah, yeah. It's sort of a long regatta, but we're halfway through the regatta right now. Um, so, you know, you can take away a lot of things from today, but tomorrow's going to be another day. Mm. Um, the conditions are really changeable right now because we're in between weather systems. So um, what's the plan for uh, tonight and tomorrow morning? Are you going to be spending a lot of time debriefing tonight? Uh, there's going to be some debriefing, I'm sure. <laughs> Just checking the boat and then get some rest, I think. And then... Have a nice dinner, yeah. a good breakfast, <laughs> come down here to the club and be ready for the day. And if you were at home, it'd be a sauna? <laughs> potentially, potentially. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much, Ida and Marcus, and we'll keep watching you. And thanks for educating us as well. So, great. Well, thanks. Keep on watching. We're still in the boat park today, and we'll, you'll see us tomorrow as well throughout the week. Have an awesome day. Thanks very much, Chris. Now, let's take a look at the leaderboard after the race that we just saw. That was race 14. And it was another victory for Tita and Banti. And so they're now on a perfect 13 points, um, discarding that 20th from a couple of days ago. Ugolini and Jubilee, they uh, had a bit of a slip by their standards, getting a ninth. Uh, that opens the door for Kurt Bay and Keskin and Gimson and Burnett to have a go at the second string Italians. And look how important that overtake by Gimson and Burnett was on Kurt Bay and Keskinen because there is now just a point between Finland and Great Britain for the bronze medal position. And then there's a bit of a gap back to Waterhouse and Darmanin from Australia in fifth with Bissero and Frascari having a good day and closing the gap as they now sit in sixth. Jeroen Jonsson from Sweden in seventh, Wilkinson Dawson from New Zealand in eighth, Van der Meer and Bauer. Uh, from the Netherlands in ninth and Argentina's Magellani and Bosco in 10th and pretty secure in 10th because it's quite a big gap back to the boat in 11th. So that's how things are shaping up. We got one more race this afternoon. 
Lisa, we've got another race in the morning and then we've got the medal race. So obviously uh, th th nothing's going to take this away from Tita and Banty, but do you think <coughs> that Ugolini and Jubilee um, are under threat for the silver medal? Yeah, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to turn really interesting here, I think. I think this next race is going to be um, pretty telling. Um, the breeze is starting to slowly die down a little bit. We've seen it down to 10 knots, comes back up to 12, 13, but then it's kind of dying down again. So it's going to start to get, there's going to be patches. So we're going to start to see boats really being able to hold height, um, make moves in pressure. And those pressure differences, I think, are going to be a, a bigger play. Um, I think it's still going to be a right-hand race course, but if you can be in the pressure getting across, it's going to make a bigger deal. So I think Gibson and Burnett are, you know, I think they're they're probably really happy that they're, because uh, they've got modes, I think, on height that other boats don't have. And I think that will really play into their hand going into this next, this next race and possibly into the race tomorrow, which is supposed to be a little bit earlier. It may be a little bit lighter. So, you know, um, it, this isn't going to be a runaway for, uh, I don't think, for um, for second or third. I think we're going to see that the points get a little bit tighter, and uh, I think it's going to be really interesting for those medals. Great. Okay. Um, meanwhile, as we wait for the start of race 15 to get underway, Chris got an interview with Tita and Banty, uh, the team of the hour. So let's hear from them. Welcome back to the 2022 Worlds and the NACRA 17 class. We are on day three, or just finished up day three, and it was a tricky day today. I wasn't too sure if everyone was foiling all the way around the course today on the NACRA 17, but what I really wanted to talk to you about is on the upwind legs we saw with Ida and Marcus falling off the foils going into the attack, and it took them a long time, and you wound up passing them um, coming back up onto the foil. So, Katerina, how important is it uh, to just stay foiling going into the attack versus you know, in, in these conditions? Um, in every condition, uh, as much as you can foil, uh, as much you go fast, as much you, uh, you keep on distance, no? you, you go. So it's really uh, a critical point and a really important point to, to get on foil as soon as possible and to keep foiling as much as possible. Right, so like, a, like kind of a hyper focus, you know, even like if you're thinking about tacking, still focus on staying foiling yeah, the whole time. I think is one of the most important thing in a foiling boat. Yeah. And today, was it just a day where you just, like Ida said, she goes, well, it was as simple as, you know, if you decide to foil or not, that decision was the most important part of the day. Uh, was it, it wasn't a day where you can foil all the way around the course, was it? Uh, it was not really a decision, hard decision. I mean, you just, when you have wind, you can go on the foils. If not, you have to, to stay displacement. So it's more... The, the, the hardest part is to find a win, to find a good pressure and go on the foils. That's, that's the, the hard part of today. Awesome. And for both of you, the last question is, you guys are investing a lot of time into the boat. Since the last time I've seen you, you've been probably put in <laughs> even many more days. But how important is it to spend time away from each other in between regattas? Do you, do you work on that too? Is it important? I mean, away from each other, I'm, I'm, you mean that everyone is uh, his life? Her, his and her life his own yes. training, his own training. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I think uh, you should find a balance in everything uh, what you work for your team I think there is not like a receipt for everyone I think uh, there is the right receipt for your team so uh, you just find the right balance for you and what it works for your team. So uh, um, we spend a lot of time together. We spend time also by our own. And uh, I think in these years we find uh, our balance. Awesome. Yeah, it shows you're like hungry to sail together and do your own thing. I know you have a film and a book, so that might take up some of your time. I'm waiting to see your film and your book. <laughs> but, um, but thank you for explaining us those little details. Um, we still got a lot more racing left. So what do you look forward to for the rest of the week? Uh, we hope we're going to have good win, maybe a bit stable, more stable than today. And yeah, looking forward to go fast. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, thank you so Kata, much. Raji. Thank you. And thank you uh, so much. keep watching the boat park and we'll see you at the studio. Right, thanks very much, Chris. And so that's Tita and Banty, who look like they have more than one hand. I would say three out of four hands on the uh, the trophy by yeah, now. They're yeah, grabbing a hold of it hard. <laughs> really, really hard to see that going any other way right now. Um, and in fact, I, I don't know if we could do the uh, 
the maths on that, but maybe they could even win with two races spare. Anyway, we, we can come back to that. More importantly, um, the conditions definitely changed uh, from the first NACRA race to the second NACRA race. The, the, it's not as nailed on as it was with the 49er racing we saw earlier in the afternoon about just banging the right-hand corner. Something Something's changing. Yeah, so um, it is, you know, as we mentioned before, it is getting later. It's 5 o'clock right now, um, just after. And uh, we're starting to see more variability. We're starting to see bigger shifts. Um, we, we would expect that they would go uh, further to the right. But then you'll see clicks back to the left, sometimes with pressure too. And we did see that um, in the middle of the race there as well. So, you know, it's about um, keeping your eyes up, trying to have... Um, uh, trying to have your your bow in pressure, but you've got to minimize your uh, your maneuvers, and the the pressure is getting lighter. So um, so we've seen die uh, just in the last minutes. I've seen my first nine knots. So we haven't seen anything under under uh, double digits all day, and now it's starting to die down. So the pressure differences are going to get um, bigger as this race goes, and so are the uh, so are the shifts. So this is going to I think play into the hands of some of the boats that don't necessarily have the straight line speed, but have a little bit more of that light air molding. Now, a team that we haven't mentioned at all during the NACRA races today um, so far is Sarah Newbury and David Liebenberg. Now, we spoke a lot about them a couple of days ago in the, in the funky, fluky stuff. Do you think we could see the American team come back into play if the wind continues to drop? Yeah, I mean, they seem to have a little bit of mojo when it gets a little bit lighter. And, uh, and you know, they're, I think they're pretty good at sniffing out the breeze and uh, getting, their, getting their boat in pressure and, and, and comfortable using it um, when they do. So I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't count them out um, this later in the day. And then again, tomorrow is going to be a very different day. Um, you know, the forecast right now has it for uh, a northeast gradient and, uh, and that's supposed to stay kind of all day with like light cloud cover. And uh, so, and you know, somewhere in six to 10 knots. So that's going to lead into their hand as well. So, you know, I don't know what the point spread is, but um, I know it's a lot, but you know, it's not over until it's over. Have we used up our sunshine quota for 2022? Uh, uh, do we have sunshine tomorrow? Uh, we've, we might have some peeking through, but it, I think there's going to be quite a substantial cloud cover. So I wouldn't think that the, that the heating that we've seen is going to... Um, it's, it's a light gradient, unfortunately. It would be nice if it was a little bit stronger, um, but I think that gradient's going to hold all day. Okay, so that means that it, it's not going to be this sort of stable sea breeze stuff that some of the front runners like to rely on. Um, well, they never admit that, of course. I mean, they say they're ready for anything and they're, and they're ready for any kind of battle. But we did see the fragility of Adil van Anhalt and um, Annette Dutz the other day in the 49er FX. They had a terrible time of it. And uh, fortunately for them, the Swedes weren't much better. So the, the front two in the 49er FX, um, they, they look vulnerable, for example, in those conditions. What about the, the NACRA? Who do you think is vulnerable in those conditions? Yeah, well, you know, I think the Italian teams have an edge in, in, in the, the, the straight line speed. Tito and Banti, I don't think they really have to worry about it based on the score, score line. Um, but uh, Ugolini and Gubile, I think they're going to, you know, they've got to be careful about, uh, about their moding and their positioning. Um, you know, it's going to be tricky, though, because you can't watch everybody. And, you know, it's going to come down to who is it that's actually leveraging away from me and not. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I think there's a few teams out there that are probably pretty happy that the next two races might be a little bit different. While we wait for the next race to get underway, that's going to be our last race that we talk about this afternoon, the NACRA 17s. Um, just want to uh, go back a little bit in history and find out about an amazing racing yacht of its era. It's Blue Nose. So um, uh, Chris is going to be uh, talking to Captain Watson in a short space of time, but just very quickly in 15 or 20 seconds, just uh, give us a background to this boat. Yeah, so the Blue Nose was built in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia, my hometown, in 1921, and it was built as a working schooner, uh, but the working schooner, schooners were built to be fast so that they could race out to the fishing grounds and race back in as quickly as they could with their catch. Okay, so over to Chris, who speaks to Captain Watson now. Awesome, we are on day four of the 2022 NACRA 17 49er and 49er FX Worlds. 
And what a treat we have this morning. It's luckily a nice calm morning. We have the Blue Nose 2 schooner. If you look, it's all over the place around here. It's uh, on the license plate for Nova Scotia. And we are here with Captain Watson. Nice to meet you, Captain Watson. Good morning, how are you this morning? I'm awesome. So, you know, to a lot of these sailors, they're not gonna see this until they rock up this morning. They're so hyper-focused on this world championship. But I know they're all like really great sailors at heart and they're gonna love seeing this. So tell us a little bit about the Blue Nose and why it's here. So Blue Nose 2 is a, an ambassador vessel for the province of Nova Scotia and we're a replica vessel of a 1921 fishing schooner and in those days they were racing best American, best Canadian fishing schooner and the original Blue Nose won the trophy in 1921 and never lost it until the last race in 1938. Awesome and these, this is a replica and these schooners, um, they were used to race to go fishing too probably but this one was more of a racing schooner? Oh, this was actually a fishing schooner. She spent most of her time fishing. Um, so there would be international races from time to time, sometimes four years between races. But she uh, she bested her American competitors every chance that she got. Awesome. Well, it's such an impressive boat. And, you know, in Canada, we know a lot about the junior training schemes in the country. Um, but what kind of training is done on the Blue Nose 2? This is all on-the-job training. So we take young people from across Nova Scotia and some from across Canada. Um, and they come with zero experience. And we teach them how to do bright work and how to paint and how to set topsails aloft and steer and be at sea at night and we teach them the whole thing. Cool and what does that do for a young person going forward? Some people can look at this and say you know oh, the future is these fast boats or, or fast super yachts or something like that. What does it do for a young person to get training on the Blue Nose too? I, I think you know the future is fast yachts and <laughs> fast boats um, but it, you know it's work ethic, it's self-confidence, it's the ability to stand and talk to people you don't know. It's the ability to tackle something that you've never done before and have a successful outcome. Awesome. Well, I think that share, these, your crew shares a lot of the same values as the Olympic sailors do, too. So um, we hope we get to see you and the crew on shore. And for now, thanks for bringing the beautiful scenery and inspiration. You're welcome. Thanks for coming out to see us. Awesome. And then we'll just go back to the studio and watch the rest of the racing for day four. Chris, thank you very much for that, and thanks to Captain Watson, and what an amazing boat, and uh, it had an incredible record. It was pretty much as successful in its day as uh, Teeter and Banty in the next 17. Yeah, not losing a race. I think they actually, uh, they actually didn't lose any races. So um, better than Teeter yeah. and Banty. <laughs> right, so we got four minutes to the start of our last race of the afternoon. Uh, this is going to be race 14 of the NACRA 17s and it does look significantly lighter. I wonder if we're getting to marginal foiling where we've got different types of mode. Maybe uh, low rider displacement mode might be an option. That's yeah, I mean, we're, we're get, it's sometimes dipping under 10 knots. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure if we're quite there yet, but we're getting very close. And it's, it's only going to keep on dropping, isn't it, at this stage of the afternoon? Yeah. Five, quarter past five. Yeah, I mean, you would expect that we will get we will get some hits of the old sea breeze, um, and it will probably come a little bit in waves. Um, so people who can get their nose in, in the pressure um, and use that to minimize their risk, I think, are going to look really good in this race. Uh, but you're going to have to be looking way up the race course to see if something's actually coming down and from what side it's coming down. Um, I can see the, uh, you know, in uh, in the SAP analytics, we can see that the uh, that um, the direction of the breeze is starting to get a lot more unstable. So there's going to be, it's going to feel like there's a lot of shifts, but you don't want to be getting swirly. You want to be going for the big, the big swings. Um, and obviously in this, in this fleet, you definitely want to be minimizing, minimizing your, your uh, maneuvers. But as we heard from Tita and Banty earlier in Chris's interview, maybe the most important thing is finding the, the biggest gust, the highest strength of wind, almost regardless of wind direction. It, it, would you agree or is that going too far? Yeah, I mean, especially if it's marginal, uh, marginal foiling, you know, anybody who's in more pressure is, I think pressure is going to be king out here. So, you know, we, you, I think you would see right now, two minutes and 30, people are doing their last stand-ups. They're really looking far up to see if there's any pressure differences up there that are going to make a significant advantage from one side to the other on this race course. In terms of the bias on the line and, and the other considerations in terms of where you start on the line, what's your thoughts? Yeah, so right now we're in a little bit of what I would say is a little bit of a right phase, but we've got a port bias line. So um, I think the uh, um, 
as the breeze is swinging, swinging right, um, the, lawn, the, the whole course is a little bit set up for, for that old breeze. So we have a little bit of course skew to the left. Um, so that's going to favor the people who are sitting over there. Um, you can see them right now setting up for that, um, that port, uh, port approach um, and port tax start on right at the port line because it is favored over there. So, you know, um, probably one of the early leaders out of here is going to be um, starting, getting the best start at the, uh, at the pin and able to cross the most boats possible and, and, and uh, poke out from that port line. There's not many boats left here at the committee boat end of the line. It's a it's a U flag flying, so let's that's just coming down now. So the U flag means you cannot afford to be over early, otherwise you're disqualified. So that's why we see quite a lot of distance. The uh, the NACRA 17s hold back from the line quite a lot more than the 49ers that we saw earlier. Seems like they need a bit more runway for the best start. I just see Ugolini and Jubilee. Italy 98 amongst the gaggler boats here at the committee boat. But most of the front runners, most of the top 10 seem to be going for middle to pin end kind of starts with 25 seconds to go and still a real big sag in the middle of the line. Yeah, interestingly, uh, Tita and Banti are one of the boats that are a little bit closer to the pin. They're, they're in the mix, um, sorry, just down by the committee boat. Um, and they're on... They're on starboard tack, the lowest starboard tack boat there at the committee. Five seconds to go. Some boats really close to the line at the far end. Zero, and I think it was a clear run. Who will be able to start cleanly on port tack? There's someone having a go at it from the middle of the line, and it looks like they're going to get away with it. Yeah, there was a huge port bias on that line, and anybody who started on port um, anywhere close to the mid to upper end of the line has, has a significant advantage right now. Um, we're reading, you know, we're reading right before the start, we were reading almost um, 100 meters of, of bias on that line. So that was a, that was a big difference. Um, the breezes clicked back right a little bit as, uh, as they sail over. So um, we'll see how that goes. Looks like there's some nice pressure there in the middle of the race course. And uh, who is that that's coming across um, in the middle? Yeah, let's try and identify them because whoever they are, there's there's three or four boats that are doing really nicely on port tack and uh, very big angle differences. As usual, the boats closest to picture seem to be on quite a lower heading. So Brazil is the most obvious example. And the further to the middle of the course you go, the better the angle. Yeah, so those boats that are in the middle, we've got, let me just, I'm just getting oriented here. Um, but uh, not surprising, the Chinese are in the mix on this uh, in this in this um, uh, early race because I think they were doing well when the when the breeze got a little bit um, up and down. Um, the angles are are changing a lot for these boats right now because there's a lot of pressure and and shift differences. Um, I think the Brazilians have s sailed a little bit out of the pressure here. Um, and That's what it looks like, doesn't it? And, yeah. and they're, they're lacking angle because of that. But it seems to be getting a little bit better for them. I don't know. It, it's, it's not as bad for the Brazilians as I thought it would be. Yeah, so you can see that there is, there is pressure, more pressure in the middle of the line. And that's that left pressure that we were talking about. Um, but the angle is probably going to start to get better and better um, just because you would expect the breeze to go a little bit further right um, by the end of the day. But... Pressure is king in these boats, and because the speeds are so different, if you're in more pressure, you can get on top of other boats and, uh, and, and really get bow even with them so that when you tack back, even if you've gave, given up a little bit of leverage, you're still going to be ahead. Sweden 14, also looking very good at the moment. Yeah, so we've got um, French 51. Um, we've got the Italians. Um, uh, Bracero and, Fr and Frascari, they're, they're tracking as first right now, and they're, they're, they're in a nice commanding position in that they're underneath the French flag. They're um, in, in, the most in that pressure in the middle of the race course, leading out to the, to the right. Um, it might be hat-eating time here. <laughs> I, I'm not going to jinx it, but um, we saw... Um, 
We saw Italian, the Italian uh, leaders of the regatta start on starboard, and they weren't really able to make anybody tack. They were low, and they were a little bit um, off the line. Then they had to go um, for quite a ways over to the left before they tacked. And uh, they're not looking like they're in a great lane um, coming back. You can see them there behind, behind the, well behind the British. And uh, so we'll have to see what happens as boats start to make their way out, out of this right-hand corner. Yeah, I don't really understand the thinking with that approach. I, d I don't really see what they had to gain from starting at the pin end on starboard. Uh, com committee end? The committee end? I yeah. thought it was the pin end. A little bit closer to the committee, but they didn't really make anybody tack. And, uh, and, and I think it was... Uh, I think it was it was really an error in um, in execution there for sure. Um, they weren't on the line and uh, and they let people go across on port, which is really costly on this race course. Well, Italians don't make me eat a hat. Yeah. Um, I can't afford it, and uh, my it's not good for my digestion. But I'm I'm sure that uh, they can pull something back. It's going to be a fascinating race to see how. Ita 26 comes back from this. They, they looked dodgy in the early stages of the previous race, and they went on to win that one by 600 metres. But at the moment, it's another Italian team, Bissero and Frascari, that are making the running as they tack on to starboard across the front of GBR 21, Gibson Burnett. Yeah, so it seems like they don't want to um, make the same mistake they did last time by overstanding that ley line. Um, they're leading back out of the right this time. Um, you know, if we get... a and it's, they're in a little bit of, 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 of left from where we have seen. So there's, they have a little bit of room, if we get more right, that they will be pulled up to the mark and up to the ley line. Um, so I think this is a nice move by Italy, Italy uh, 71 to keep a little bit in the bank. And you can see here, classic move by uh, our Italian leaders. They undertacked, and this is exactly what they did in the first, the first uh, race. Um, to get themselves back into the race, not to sail over into that right corner too far, and to give themselves a little bit of room to actually make some gains. And it looks like the heading of Italy 26 is actually pretty good. And um, Bissero and Frascari falling down somewhat into the line of Italy 26. So things, again, seem to be changing quite quickly. Yeah, and we can't see in the drone footage if, if there is still uh, a little bit of pressure in the middle of the race course or what the pressure actually looks like. But um, here we go. Thank you very much. Um, and here's the British, and they're basically on the ley line. So they're going to be trying to go as fast as possible and trying to limit the distance. You can see the Italians just underneath their sail, and they're going to be trying to get as fast forward on those Italians as they possibly can. So in low riding mode at the moment, this is, this is classic old school um, upwind sailing by Gibson and Burnett, not trying to get the boat foiling. Yeah, and they're so close to the ley line that if they, um, if they come off this mode um, and they don't get foiling, it's gonna be really, it's gonna be, it's gonna cost them an extra maneuver. Oh, here they're gonna go try. They, they heard the commentary. Yeah. And they realize they're, bit, they're on camera and it's about time they showed what this boat can do. And look at the quick transformation from low riding mode with the windward float up above the water. And now they've got both, both floats above the water. And how much harder they have to work the boat as well. So physically much more demanding to keep the boat hydrofoiling like this. Yeah, and you can see they just went from, uh, from, low drag, from high drag to low drag on their sails. They were pulling on other controls, you know... Um, when they're, when they're not foiling, they've, they've got to have a lot of power in their sails. And then as soon as they start foiling, they want to reduce all the drag they can. And uh, the, um, the Italians just, on the, just below them, they were both foiling at that moment. So they had to get up on the foil as, foils in order to, uh, in order to keep, keep in the game with the two Italian boats. So with the benefit of hindsight, uh, these sort of micro moments in a race, I wonder when, uh, if the Brits are sort of telling themselves they should have got into foiling mode a little bit earlier. Yeah, they may, they may have, and you know, they're not making the mark anyway, so they're going to have to have just the same amount of maneuvers as the Italians, and the Italians are looking pretty smart right now, leading out, giving themselves a little bit of extra move to, um, to get into some left pressure and then take that back to the mark. And the Brits on a bit of a downward turn there at the moment, so it looks like they're hitting some kind of header 
in third place. And meanwhile, it's almost neck and neck between the front two Italians now, Bissero and Frescari, and the fast closing Tita and Banti. And both Italian teams now tacking on to starboard for their final approach to the Wimbledon mark for the first time. And it's an Italy 1-2 with Bissero and Frescari leading Tita and Banti in towards the mark. But it, actually, it still doesn't look that straightforward making the women mark from where they are. It looks like there is a bit of a left-hand shift, which surely Gibson and Burnett will be tacking into fairly soon. Yeah, and I think that's that's what they were going for, you know? Like, they they lost a little bit on, on not getting on the foils and uh, being a little bit high um, on that on that on the right side there early on but i think again we kind of expected this a little bit of pressure left and shift right and if pressure's king i think you want to have your options open over there bistro and frescari just going past the whim of mark continuing on an upwind course towards the purple spacer mark and this is the critical moment when you can lose focus and um easy to drop off the foils as you've got a lot else to think about just getting the kite out to the bowsprit. Now Mael Frescari runs in, kneels down, gets that Jenica hoisted. And a bit of low riding going on there, but uh, pretty smooth by the Italians to get up and running and leading downwind to the bottom of the course towards the gate. And it's second round, it's Tita and Banti after that horrendous start. They are already up into second place with Gimson and Burnett going round about three boat lengths behind. Yeah, so you could really see, um, oh, there's a bad touchdown by the British there just, just as they left the screen. Um, so you can see really, really good teams, you know, um, are still having trouble while they're moving around, while they're doing, uh, you know, doing their maneuvers, takes a while for the crews to get in and hoist those kites. And the skipper's doing everything possible they can to keep that boat locked in and tracking really well. And it's, uh, I think, Australia going around in fourth place, followed by Ugolini and Jubilee. So uh, good rounding by the Australians, followed by the Italians. So that's... Uh, uh, Ugolini and Jubilee just going round. Bit of a slow hoist for them. Is this an opportunity for America to sail over the top, followed by Besson and Ancien from France and uh, one of the Swedish boats? Big gaps already. Look at the gap between the rest and the, the front three. Yeah, and it looks like this, the, the sailors are sailing into a little bit of a pressure line over there where the, where the Italians jibed. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we see a big train out to get their nose into that pressure and then take that back to the mark. Um, you know, not surprising to see the Americans in the hunt this time um, because we're in that mode that they seem to uh, to have some wheels in. And uh, let's see if they can make make some tac tactical decisions to put them back in the hunt for uh, for a top five. So up at the front, it's Italy 71, Bissero and Frascari maintaining the lead. Italy 26, looking to see if they can get another race win, but they've got some work to do to get ahead of their teammates. So far, so good, though, for Tita and Bounty after a fairly poor start. A really good recovery. That's two races in a row where we've seen the Italians recover from mediocre starts to be able to get their way into the uh, the front pack by the Wimbledon mark. Yeah, and uh, our race leaders right now are sailing really fast on this run. They're the only team to break um, an average of 17 knots. So they're, they're uh, you know, 0.5 knots faster than, the, uh, than their Italian teammates. Um, so they're sailing really well on this run. That's a great shot of them. You can see the crews moving forward, moving back, really trying to press on that windward wing, get the bow down. They're physically pushing the bow down to keep the boat tracking, and you can see the boat reacting to their weight movement. Yeah. Oh, maybe a, a bit little bit too much down. there. <laughs> so incredible dynamic movement from Mael Frascari, trying to keep the boat on track. Chris, you've spoken to these Italians uh, quite a bit over the last few days. 
Um, how much are the Italians working together as a team? How, how much working in rivalry? Well, that's, that's a lot of people's questions. I saw the uh, Swedish skipper talking to Gigi Ugolini, and the first question they asked, they were joking around together, and they're like, okay, how much do you guys share? How much tuning did you guys do? Well, you know, why are your teammates so fast? And he's like, well, we go out and we practice together, but, um, you know, we share as much as we can, you know, so really kind of a, a flat answer. They'd like to know more, too. Everybody wants to go faster. Um, but the reality is with these teams is just, just being around each other, just the way they carry each other, the way they work on boat prep. Uh, you can see them all working on the boat early, early in the, in the day, work doing all the same things. So, oh, wow. um, it, you know, there is some osmosis going on there. Great rounding by the Italians we were just talking about. Their boat barely slowed down as they did that maneuver and went around the went around the the um, went around the the, the, the lower mark. gate. That yeah. was gorgeous. Uh, but they are now in low riding mode. It looks like they're trying to get it up into foiling mode fairly soon. And it's the big question for all these teams: where, when is the crossover point in these variable conditions? Well, well, their yeah. teammates are have already switched right behind <laughs> them, <laughs> and there they go. So uh, they were a little bit slower, but you know they they stayed a little bit high high mode. So they're they're in a little bit of control there because the other Italians are going to have to sail through their bad air in order to get by them. I think the thing that you saw there was that there's a lot of line pulling to go between modes. So once they got the lines pulled in to where they thought they should be, they started to sail flat, get that weather hull close to the water. It didn't work, and they saw their teammates already up. Then you saw a Mayal go right back in, pull a couple more lines, lay back out again, and then they started to lift the leeward hull. So it's a little bit of trial and error uh, for everyone in these conditions. Great observation, Chris. Yeah, it, it looks like they're almost having to look at their teammates to work out what to do rather than think it through for themselves. They're just that one step behind their teammates at this stage of the Olympic cycle. That's Ugolini and Jubilee going around the left-hand side, I think. Um, and then just enormous gaps back to the rest of the fleet already. We were looking at the points right now, just seeing the split for the gold fleet. And there's a big gap, you know, the 10, you know, or, or sorry, for the uh, medal race. Uh, for 10th place, I mean, it's, it's double-digit points uh, behind. So it's not super close. There's definitely a gap. And that really has to do with performance. I mean, all these sailors are excellent sailors in their own right. And it's like what Darren Bundock said today. Um, you know, some people have it figured out, but it's, uh, it's a pretty broad spectrum in the, in the four-point foiling. Here's a pretty key cross. The, the Brits uh, rounded the, uh, the right-hand gate and looks like they've made up, some, made up some distance on the Italians and uh, they're not out of the game yet. No, that, that's very well observed. And, but, but also, look how low Italy 26 is prepared to sail to get foiling. But it, it looks like they've now pulled distance on... Italy 71. We've we've got Pissarro and Frescari listed as the uh, still as the leaders up this second windward leg, but I think Tita and Banti are probably quite happy with the way that they're going right now. I'm curious to see how you know the way you know this the tracker judges how you get there because if you are VMGing better to the mark, but you're like way low and your position on the course is really far away. Maybe, I don't know if it estimates that you're going to be going three knots faster than the other person on the way back. <laughs> yeah, the new calculations for the algorithm to have to deal with. Now, will Italy 71 tack on top of Italy 26? No, they don't. So they leave Tita and Banti clear to sail out to the left-hand side. Uh, whenever we can get back to drone shots, that's what I would love to see. So um, just putting, putting that there for the studio, when, whenever the drone can get back up in the air, that's what we want to get back to. Yeah, because I think the pressure is definitely going up and down here, and we've got a little bit of a split in uh, where people think that pressure is going to come because um, I believe, based on the speeds that we're seeing here um, on the SAP analytics, that a lot of them are not foiling right now. And uh, I think the boats that are going to be able to get up fully on the foil um, and pressure differences are, uh, yeah, Tita and Banti are the only ones that have been able to get up on the foil. There we go with the speeds. And so they've been, they went over to some left pressure. Ooh, and there is... Um, that's our leaders. That's our race leaders right now. Very light winds for them. And I, I wonder, I mean, uh, angle-wise, they look good. But, I mean, 
Mario Frascari's lying on the front of the trampoline. Yeah, and it's, just as we came back to the drone, Tita and Banti, um, they, they did attack. But they're in that left pressure, and now they're going back down, bow down, trying to get back up on the foil. And this is where I wonder, can you get too greedy trying to get up on the foil? Should you just not accept that you need to old school tornado sail these boats in this kind of condition? Well, this is why. You can see right here, Italy 71, how painful it is to go into that chop um, when, you're, when you've got both hulls in the water. It is getting light out there. Well, one thing you have to think about is, uh, uh, unlike old school tornadoes, is all of these appendages with their angles on the dagger boards and the additional uh, elevators on the rudders, it is so much more drag than you can ever imagine on a boat because percentage-wise, it's a lot. They may look skinny and fast and all fared and, and polished, but it's a lot of drag. So when we think about that uh, high mode and slow mode, um, it's, it's not necessarily as efficient as you think. It's really, really slow on a foiling boat to not foil. And so much so, the details in even just the tuning and offsets of the rudders uh, on Gimson and Burnett, they spent most of the regatta at the Europeans just calibrating their rudders. They were really slow just because they were just a little bit off in terms of their alignment. So, And that, that'll really make a huge difference in the light air. It makes a big difference in, in once you're foiling, too. But it's, things are a lot more draggy than you think. And uh, sorting out all those alignments until they're millimeter perfect is potentially the difference of hundreds of meters on the race course. These boats are so sensitive to the finest details of tune and, and to uh, the finish of the foils, making sure they're really highly polished at all times. But this is, a, this is an old school tactical boat race between these yeah. three teams right now, the two Italians against the British. Do you feel more at home, Andy? I, I do a little bit. I feel a little bit relieved for Gimson and Burnett that I, I give them a higher chance of being able to beat the Italians when no one's foiling. Yeah, and they're really tacking up this right side. Uh, it's actually almost dead center in the middle of the race course. Nobody's really wanting to, to, uh, to leverage out to one side or the other. Um, it's really hard to tell from the drone footage, but they may be in a little bit of a shaft of pressure that they're not really willing to sail out of. And they're just, you know, because you can see they're just tacking right up the center of the race course, almost dead run line. Well, like we were talking about with the foiling, you, you can foil and go fast to get to the puff. Right here, they're not falling, so they're going slow. But the other thing is, is the percentage of speed loss is so much smaller. So tacking is a lot less painful or uh, expensive. So now, you know, you can't sail right to the puff, but you can actually tack and maneuver yourself to get lined up with whatever's closest to you. Yeah. So the boats are really close together here. So I wonder if we're going to see um, one Italian slamming on the other. No, they've let them go. Uh, doing Maybe a loose not. cover, yeah. doing, doing a loose cover. So wanting to herd Italy 26 in the same direction without wanting to bounce them away in a different direction. Or, or maybe they felt they didn't have the distance to be able to do a hard yeah. cover anyway. Yeah, but I mean, this is almost a, a hard reset here. Like They look like they just rabbit started. So, uh, you know, I mean, any little bit of left pressure is going go to the, gonna go to the Brits and any little bit of right pressure is going to go to uh, Frasaro and Frascari and... Tito and Banti are a little bit caught in the middle right now. Yeah, if the breeze picks up, they can foil their way out of the sandwich. But uh, in, in these low riding conditions, I'm not sure that Tito and Banti have any kind of boat speed edge. Lisa, I have a question for you. In these conditions, you know, this is obviously very difficult conditions uh, for these boats because there's such a big speed differential when you're up on the foils and not. Um, but, you know, emotionally and uh, psychologically, when you know you drop into a mode like this, light air, some people hate it, like with a passion. I know Dave Perry wrote a, an article about those lovely light air days, but that was really just trying to convince himself to like light air. Um, what's your, what was your approach in these conditions? Well, I mean, you know, I am a product of the, uh, of, of the China Quad, so... Um, you know, and this is where I grew up, so I love the breeze. And uh, growing up sailing here, you know, I was very good light air, uh, heavy air sailor, and I was not very good at light air. Um, but I had to learn how to love it. And by the time we got to China, um, you know, and it's just, it's time in the boat, and it's making your weaknesses a strength. And it's just really about training and about how you approach, um, you know, your process. More aggressive defense this time by Italy 71. Bissero and Frascari tacking more on the face of Italy 26. 
So it's starting to get personal. Uh, also getting a little bit breezy, uh, breezier, Lisa. Yeah, so the breeze has kicked up just a little bit here, but we're still we're still at around eight knots. Um, it's, I don't think it's quite foiling yet, um, but they are in a left phase, and I, I really think the Italians wanted the um, sorry uh, Rosario and Frascari wanted to uh, to make the the their their teammates have to tack out of phase right now because they're in a left um, in in a left shift. Um, you know, it's gonna. It would have been really costly had they had to had to tack, and they're actually sitting in some bad air just to stay in phase. Both boats are pulling away from the British, though. It looks like Gimson Burnett uh, missed the best of that new breeze, and uh, so the Italians between them have pulled some distance. And uh, coming into play from the uh, the right hand side, left of your screen, it looks like Besson and Ancion from France might be starting to have a sniff of third place from Gibson and Burnett. Yeah, they're definitely making some moves. And then the, the Australians are actually um, in the hunt as well. Um, looks like they're going to have a cross on the French um, behind this Italian group here. So um, interesting. Um, and here they come. Because we've been tacking up the center of the race course, here is the, the windward mark. It, I believe it is a change mark. There's no, uh, um, I don't think that there is a, uh, is a, an a offset, spacer, mark. A spacer yeah. mark. So we'll see what happens here. It's hard for us to tell here um, whether or not we've seen a change mark at the bottom of the race course. Um, but Italy 71, now as they're going, coming into their final approach, not uh, worried about leaving the other ones over to the left, um, trying to min minimize maneuvers at this point. Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's all going pretty well for Bicero and Frescari. I think Tita and Banti are running out of runway in this race. Yeah, and they've just tacked on the hip of a boat that really likes to sail high. So it'll be interesting to see uh, how, how their approach is coming into the mark with the Brits. Yeah, I'm, I'm not convinced by Tita and Banti's tactics yet, but we, we are <laughs> able to see them pull rabbits out of hats on quite a regular basis. Speaking of hats... Yes. <laughs> it must have been on my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it isn't a change mark. It's, uh, yeah, so we haven't shortened the course um, we're still uh, we're still up to the to the same mark that we were at before. So Visa and Frescari safely round the Wimber mark for the final time, just getting to that spacer, and with a good gap on the rest of the fleet. But that's a really really tight offset there. They didn't really have to bear off once they tacked on the starboard. So maybe that's indicative of maybe a left shift, and maybe we're going to see just a lot of starboard tack, no jiving at, on this run. Yeah, so we have all the way up this beat, we've seen that left come in, which is, you know, they've been trying to play the difference between that left pressure um, and, and, and sailing up that, that uh, mid to left side of the race course. If you saw Mayel doing those long pulls to get one of the blades to go in the right direction, you know, there's, there's on spools, there's a lot of line to pull. So the second Italian boat, Tita and Banti, do stay ahead of Gimson and Burnett. It's pretty close between those two, so... Uh, but um, the Italians are going to have to pull off a good hoist to stay ahead of the Brits. So this is the Olympic and silver gold medalists from last year going around together. And the, they're just leaving your screen was the Australians, Little and Brown, tacking around the mark. Um, so they've made their way into fourth place just ahead of the French. I don't know what the numbers are here, but the fleet is really spread out. And that is the tough thing with really fast boats, because really fast boats and light air go really slow. <laughs> so once they, um, once they get going, uh, the, the deltas are so huge, so it's really tough for the boats behind. But that said, you know, big gains can be made. So those boats behind can find their little vein of pressure, line themselves up correctly. They could probably pass four or five boats in a very short period of time. And the jibe set can be a powerful move uh, with fast asymmetric boats like this, and we've seen that work a few times today. Kind of saddens me to see the finish just a little further back there. Um, they're really du duking out, trying to hold third place overall. Uh, we know that we technically should be having one more fleet race in the morning before the medal race, but you know, I, I don't think um, Axeli and Sinem on the Finnish boat are thinking you know, relaxed and saying, oh, this race doesn't matter. 
Yes. Absolutely no. So you can see the boats right now extending away into that into the left, and it does look like, um, based on the speeds, that there that there is some left pressure over there. So you can see Basario and, and and Fascari going faster and faster as they get down into that into that left and that left pressure. And Bissero and Frascari, they've had a second and a fourth. They look like they're heading for a race win in, the, in this race today. This potentially moves them up into fifth. They've had a really, really good day, and we're starting to see the best of this Italian team again. Let's remember that Bissero and Frascari and Tita and Banti traded world championships not long, not three years ago. And, you know, when it came to the qualifying for Tokyo, the qualifying system for them was just keep racing, we'll let you know who goes. So it was really, uh, you know, really a serious battle at every international regatta, every world championships for those two boats. So even though we haven't seen it uh, too, Bissari and, Frascari, Bissari and Frascari too much in the very top of the fleet, it's really awesome to see them up there right now. They felt a little beaten down a little bit over the last two years, and uh, it's nice to see them hit their stride. Maybe we're onto something here. Yeah, and you know, uh, I think the British are going to have a pretty happy coach. We mentioned Ian Percy earlier, but um, they have done a very good job today being consistent, keeping in the top five, keeping in the top three, really. And, um, you know, they're making moves to, uh, to secure themselves with a medal around their neck by the end of this regatta. Yeah, it looks that way. And in fact, the, the front three um, account for all the world championship titles of, of recent times. So the last time... Well, in fact, the only time that Tita and Banti have won the world title was in 2018. 2019, it went to Bissero Frascari. And then the last two in 2020 and 2021 have gone to Gibson and Burnett. So the, the front three performers are also uh, the, all the world title holders of the last four years. You know, you mentioned Ian Percy with that team with John and Anna. And, you know, he's obviously a double Olympic medalist, at least, I think. Um, and, you know, he when I was talking to him, you know, the first world championships I met him for, thi for this class, he's like, hey, I'm not a high-performance catamaran sailor, even though I have sailed in the America's Cup with Artemis Racing. He's a very techie kind of guy. But what John and Anna told me is that he's very much a psychological coach. He's, he's that person who's been there, been under these pressures. They can lean on him to get that kind of advice. So, you know, so coaches go back and forth. Like you, Lisa, you're a coach. Coaches go back and forth in terms of their strengths and weaknesses. And Ian's, one of Ian's really superpowers is really just keeping people calm. Yeah, yeah. He's, uh, you know, he's, he's somebody who, you know, he's had some great highs, but he's also had some pretty big lows as well. So you learn a lot from those moments, and then he's able to translate that over into his athletes. This is Bissero and Frescari wow. coming in towards the finish, just going past the Leward Gates, going into a jibe. That's the committee boat just to their left. That marks one end of the line. Splash down on the jibe, but it doesn't matter. No one's going to take this race win off them. So that's their first race win of the event and a, an important psychological step for them finally taking a race win off Tita and Banti at this regatta. Yeah, and especially seeing as they were leading a race earlier today and then they weren't able to translate, so this was really nice for them to be able to uh, end the day and win the race to the dock. Yeah, and just a quick little note for everyone. They, they, these boats are going two to two and a half times the speed of the wind yeah. at times on this downwind leg. So uh, with that awesome drone footage, uh, Bissar and Frascari, I mean, who doesn't want to be ripping on one of these things? If that doesn't make you excited about sailing, well, you just got to pick up another sport. <laughs> <laughs> so Tita and Banti, they lose a race. They come second. Anyone else would be happy with that. I know you're looking at me. You're thinking, what kind of hat? The bigger the hat, the better. <laughs> and he's gonna be Anybody going to be in Stetson? <laughs> A Mountie, of le a Mountie hat. Leather or, or plastic, yeah. what are you going to get for yeah, me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Gibson and Burnett across the line in third place. So. Yeah, I'd say one of the, uh, you know, one of the performances of the day when they need it. Um, you know, they did not have a good start to this regatta. What's and going whoa! on there? What happened there? That Someone was, capsized. That was the Australians. Uh, the Australians were in fourth place. Can we home in on that? Can we zoom in on that if possible? Oh, that was a big mistake on one of their on their jive right into the finish. And that was going to be their best score of the regatta. Yeah. I'm pretty sure of that. And well, oh, that's too bad. So I mean, they've only got yeah. 
They had a fourth. Oh, no. Well, what, they've only had one score inside the top ten. Yeah. That was going to be a fourth place. So communication error or something there, but that's really too bad for the Australians. But we don't get to see this too often, so let's see how fast. Let, check this out. We don't, we don't see too often someone do a, cap, you know, do a capsize and write it and see what the consequences are with this awesome drone footage. Ugolini, Ugolini and Jubilee, really, they, they're so good that they jived, and we thought they were going to run right into them, but they knew exactly what their <laughs> exit angle was going to be once they got out on the wire. And they came within like one meter of them, but they knew exactly what they were doing because they didn't want to give up any more distance. So let's just, so they're trying to make sure that the kite is all the way in so, um, so that they have, um, they're able to right this boat. So what happens here is that the mast is pointing into the wind. So they're actually using the wind to help bring the boat up. There's a lot of a momentum that they have to overcome in order to get the boat up. And there they go. They got the boat up and they are right back into racing, trying to get this boat back in. And uh, let's see how many boats they did lose. I think they might have only lost two. That's how far apart this racing was. So let's get the broader context if we can. That's great. Back onto that. So this is Australia looking to limit the damage as they get the boat back up and running. And let's see if they can stay inside the top 10. It means Ugolini and Jubilee finished in fourth. Kurt Van Keskinen back up to fifth. Although it's still close between them and the French. It could be Besson and Ancien just get across. Have they jived a little bit too early? It's going to be super close between oh, the Finns yeah. and the French. And I think the French have the legs. The Finns, they need to head up the boat, surely. The Finns need to point the boat up. They haven't got any air in the spinnaker. They're just drifting across the line. But I think yeah. they take sixth. Svensson and Dak Hammer in seventh. And Little and Brown, can they hold on to eighth? Or Riley and Gibbs? No, I think the Australians will get eighth. So at least they get another top ten finish. But oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. That, that was a fourth that was there for the taking. And... So it's uh, a little unfortunate for the Australians, but a very, very fast recovery, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, that was, uh, you know, th that was costly. But thankfully for them, the fleet was quite spread out. So they were able to, uh, to, get, it, to get it up quickly and minimize the damage. Yeah, if that had happened in a 15-knot uh, race where the boats were going 20 knots, uh, they would have lost almost half the fleet. <laughs> At least, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so... Got the back half of the fleet still bringing it up across the line. Um, while this is happening, let, let's just, Lisa, look back on what we've seen today. We saw the 49ers earlier today, and we saw... In fact, no, I better let you get on with the data analysis, because that's going to be fun to look at. I'm going to... Did you, Chris, have you had a chance to see the 49ers today? You've uh, been out in the boat park, so... No yep. problem if you haven't. Yeah, no, 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 absolutely. I, I think uh, one uh, big story is we did an interview with the Fantella brothers, Shimmy and Mihoville, and they were they were set up to just have a banner day. You know, the Seabreeze was strong when the 49er Gold Fleet was racing for the whole time, and they came out hard, and the, they were in the top three in the first race of the day, and halfway through the race, they hit a bunch of weed, and I talked to them, and Mihoville was so disappointed, they literally had to stop the boat he had to stick his leg in the water and push the weeds off both appendages. So, yeah. So just to, uh, to take a look at the uh, the data from this race, um, not surprising. The two Italian teams were the fastest around the race course. Um, Frisaro and Frascari, that downwind speed, I think, really helped them. They were almost uh, 13 knots average, but um, the British have shown that. Uh, Sailing a little bit slower, but a lot less distance keeps you in the hunt. So it was the top three in that race that now hold the top three positions in the overall standings. There's Gimson and Burnett from Great Britain displaced Kurt Bay and Keskinen for third place overall. Ugolini and Jubilee, well, they profited from that capsize by the Australians to take fourth in that race, even though we didn't have much to say about them. That still leaves them fairly comfortably in second overall, Tita and Banty, okay, a bit of a slip from them. But looking back at their start, it was a terrible start. And um, to get back to, to second is pretty impressive, although they did probably have their opportunities to get back to first, didn't they, Lisa? Yeah, they really did. I mean, they almost did the same thing that they did when they had uh, when they were in, in the mix in, that, uh, in the first race, 
where they just picked a really opportune time to get back in phase and to get to 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 take their time to get out of the right hand side of the race course without getting caught sailing too much extra distance. You know, when you're when you're behind that lead group, it's so easy just to start hipping up and hipping up and hipping up and you can end up putting in a lot of extra miles. And they it seems like TJ and Manti, you know, they've got the experience and they just refuse to do that. So they'll take a tougher lane to make their way back into the middle of the race course and then choose from there when to go back out. Okay, so uh, we've got one day of racing to go. We're going to have a final race of the uh, the Gold Fleet for the 49er men and for the series of NACRA 17 races that we're watching. Um, and uh, so the schedule for that um, on Sunday, sorry, on Monday, is one fleet race at 10 a.m. local time and then medal races at 2 p.m. And remember... Wherever you're watching, however you're watching, um, just keep on liking and subscribing. If you haven't already done those things, uh, just tell your friends. Tomorrow is the big showdown for the 49er, 49er FX and NACRA 17 World Championships here on beautiful St. Margaret's Bay in Nova Scotia. Uh, very quickly, in 15 seconds, Chris, uh, what's your highlight of the day? Something you want to remind us of that happened today? Well, my highlight of the day was watching, and I started to say the the Croatians, the um, the Fantella brothers. They they were set up to have just the most awesome day. They caught some re weed in the first race of the day. They came back to get a top top five finish, and they came back to win to win a race, to win the last race. And I talked to them. They were pretty relaxed. They said, you know, that race they wound up twentieth or something like that. That they caught the weed. I looked at them, and Shimmy was like. You know, we looked at each other. We said, we just have to let this go. I mean, that could have been something that set them back and uh, kicked them out. They were in second place going into today, and there were three races today. So it was it just I love watching athletes with good attitudes, learning from them, seeing how they manage, you know, adversity, and then coming through it. And to win that last race, they just kind of made it happen. Uh, it was awesome to watch them on the screen, so we actually were able to watch them. And, uh, and they're just chill. You know, I saw them in Denmark. They lost their rig, and... Um, and they were just easy going, and they didn't achieve their goals. But um, it's nice to watch great athletes perform. Chris, thank you very much. Lisa, your highlight of the day. Well, you know, I'm a Nova Scotian. This is where I'm from, and I think, you know, one of the things that I'm really enjoying is the fact that the community and, uh, you know, all the local sailors are able to watch the racing from the shore. So we didn't really see it today, but the FX course was really close to Queensland Beach. There was a gaggle of people out there. It was a beautiful beach day. And uh, racers, non-racers, everybody was able to take in some amazing racing just from the shore, which I think is incredible. And it, you can't really do that in many places in the world. Well, we've had such a warm welcome here. It's going to be sad to wave goodbye to Nova Scotia. But we've got one more day of action to bring you. Uh, when, and I want to say thank you to my co-commentators today, Chris Musler, Lisa Ross. I'm Andy Rice. We can't wait to bring you the final day's action tomorrow. We'll see you then.